Welcome back to my Manwa Recap channel. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. Don't forget to leave a comment with your feedback. Subscribe now and enjoy the recap. The protagonist thought that last night there was a party in honor of his retirement. For people clink glasses. The main character thought that he only had a B rank, so not many people gathered. He adds that several friends came, they gave him gifts, and they drank. He and his three guests are sitting at the table and talking. He thought that the money he had accumulated over 20 years of hard work and the property registered in his name was with him. The paper book with notes sparkles. A blue sky with clouds rises against the backdrop of city buildings. The protagonist thought that all that remained was to spend his last days in peace. He opens his eyes and says that, however, this is not that reality. He lifts his torso off the bed with a chair and backpack next to him. He holds his head and says that he woke up in the student dormitory where he lived 20 years ago. He turns on the phone and asks what year it is, and then, looking at the phone, is surprised that it is 2018. He throws the phone at the wall and shouts that this must be a joke. He spreads his arms to the sides and shouts asking why he returned at this time, because he had just begun a carefree life. No later than three years later. The main character holds his head and asks why this happened. He looks up and shouts asking what he did wrong. He noticed the watch on his hand and said to wait. He looks at his watch and says it's the watch June Cole gave him, then wonders why he's still wearing it. He remembers how a gray-haired man asked him if he knew how rare they were. He adds that there are rumors that this is a relic of the legendary magician of the Byron continent, Tijitala. The main character, looking at his watch, wonders if the watch has returned him, because last night before going to bed he twisted and studied it. He hears someone knocking on his door and shoutingly asking why he is making noise and then demanding that he come out. The main character put his hand on his belt and sighed, and then thought that exactly there lived a fool next to him, who was the son of the owner of this hostel, so he pretends that he is also in charge here. He remembers lying in bed, covering his head with a pillow, and thinking that every night he hosts karaoke parties and drinking parties. He thought that after this he was coming to shake money from him, while he was not yet fully awake, and then he remembered how the man in a leather jacket standing in front of him was holding money in his hands. The man behind the door screamingly asks the protagonist if he will really pretend that he is not there, and then says that he will break down the door. The main character made an angry expression on his face, and says that just the thought of him makes him angry. He opens the door, and the neighbor asks the protagonist what took him so long. He smiles at the protagonist, and the villain asks him if he finds it funny. The main character thought that this scoundrel wears pretty high-quality clothes, his jacket is made of monster skin. The villain puts his hand to the back of his head and tells the protagonist that he is making so much noise that it is psychologically difficult for him to tolerate it. He turns his pupils to the side and tells the main character that he was already thinking about calling the police, but he wouldn't want to ruin the life of such a young guy. He adds that he will turn a blind eye to his behavior if he gives him money as compensation. He reaches out to the watch and says that this watch costs exactly as much as needed. The protagonist made a wary look. He hit the villain's hand. He raises his hand at the scoundrel. He hits the villain on the head. The villain with the bruise on his nose is pushed back. The main character grabs the villain by the head. He hits it on his knee. He asks him why a huge man like him continues to rob the weak. The villain falls to the ground. The protagonist puts on his jacket and says that this is not enough revenge for everything that he took from him, but so be it. He will spare him. He put on a leather jacket. The scoundrel trembles and says that this is more than enough. The main character puts on a backpack and says that he is moving out of here. He walks down the street and thought that at first it was not clear to him why he was returned to 2018, but it was at that time that he woke up when an accident occurred at a construction site. He adds that then he injured his knee, which caused him pain throughout his life, and it's nice that it's gone now. Streams of blue energy emanate from the protagonist, and he thought it was time to wake up. He adds that he has controlled mana for 20 years, so it will not be difficult. Blue lines appear on the main character. The protagonist looks at his hand, clenched into a fist, and thought that he was eating poorly and lacked muscle mass. He wonders how it was possible to go to work with such a body. He holds his stomach and says that he would like to have a snack first. He looks at the construction site and says that no matter how much he looks, there is continuous construction everywhere. He looks at the excavator, the protagonist with a serious expression on his face, thought that it was clear why no one noticed how the small gate opened, because of the sudden appearance of monsters, many people died here. The main character made a surprised expression on his face, because someone was shouting loudly. He sees a portal appear in the middle of the street, from which townspeople are running and shouting that monsters have appeared 
and they need to call the police. The main character thought that the gate had suddenly opened. A wild speckled red dog jumps out of the gate. A monster with sharp fangs lives in a pack. The gray-haired man puts his hand on the protagonist's shoulder and says that he should run away from here. A brown-haired man with concern on his face shouts whether Soha is here and says that he, her dad, is here. The protagonist takes off his backpack and sighs, thinking that he has returned to a disgusting moment in time. He sees people running from the construction site and wonders where to get weapons. He saw the tire iron and thought it was over there. He quickly grabs the crowbar, makes a jump, and then runs towards the gate. He pays attention to the girl's scream. Three wild dogs surrounded a girl who was calling for her dad. One of the monsters jumped on the girl. The main character grabs the girl by the collar and takes her back. He stands in front of the monsters and tells the little girl behind him to run to her father. Two dogs run towards the main character. He quickly moves towards enemies. He attacks the dog with a crowbar. He hit one of the dogs in the face. The protagonist takes the crowbar in two hands. He makes a low kick. He hit the bottom of the monster. He gripped his tire iron tightly. The main character hits the dog on the head. He screams loudly with a menacing expression on his face. He hits the dog, after which it is pushed far back. The main character stopped because of the rumbling in his stomach. He stands in front of the monsters and says that he is hungry, and then wonders why there are so many of them. The monsters are surprised when the protagonist begins to speak. The main character with an appetite on his face tells the monsters that they are so plump and look delicious. The monsters made frightened expressions on their faces. The protagonist thought that he remembered that he had eaten their meat, which was delicious. He remembers a pot with lots of vegetables and meat. Menu. Stew with speckled red wild dog meat. The main character squeezes the crowbar in his hand and thought that great. Hunger will help deal with them faster. The main character makes wide attacks in motion and hits two wolves. He thought that although he was 20 years younger, at this age he did not have such good abilities as at 40. The monster jumped on the protagonist, and he thought that his knees didn't hurt at all. He jumped and ended up behind the dog. The main character kicks a wild dog in the head. He is running away from another dog. The dog tries to bite the main character, but the protagonist dodges, and then he thought that there was no end to them and one nail puller could not cope with them all. The main character clenches a watch in his fist. He makes a clock strike on the head of a wild dog. He looks at the watch and thought that it was a very durable watch. Being surrounded by dogs, he wonders how many of them are left and assumes that there are about 10. The police appear behind the protagonist and ask him to act on their instructions. The main character gritted his teeth and said that finally. He discovers that the sleeve of his jacket is torn. With a frustrated expression on his face, he says that it tore the first time he wore it. The policeman approaches the protagonist from behind and asks for his forgiveness. The policeman holds a pen and notebook in his hands with a smile on his face and then thanks the protagonist for saving those people. He asks the main character if he can tell him his name and place of work so that they can send him a reward. He introduces himself as Lim Dae-in and says that he has not yet been employed anywhere. The policeman writes down the protagonist's name. The main character puts his hand to his neck and with a smile on his face tells the policeman that he has not yet been registered as a Superman either. He woke up only a couple of hours ago. He takes the policeman's notebook and pen and then asks if there is another way to get the reward and then offers to tell him your number and Ivan. The policeman thanks the main character for his assistance. The joyful protagonist tells him that he will go because things are waiting. The policeman puts his hand forward and shouts to the fleeing protagonist to wait because he still has to question him. The protagonist runs and thinks that the name A and D number are enough to contact him. A man and a girl with phones exclaim that they have found a new awakened one and he is about 20. The protagonist is holding onto the strap of his backpack with a small smile on his face. Someone is typing a message on the phone. The waiter tells the protagonist that this is his beef soup. On the table, there is a bowl of soup, a plate of vegetables, and a small saucer with a dish. The main character scoops the soup into a spoon and eats it. He put the spoon in his mouth and said with a satisfied expression that it was delicious. He sees his phone vibrate and wonders if someone is already calling, and then notices that it happened promptly. He takes the phone and thinks that now everyone is trying to hire superhumans, and then adds that they also saw how good he is despite his recent awakening. He sees that 98 messages were sent to him and thought that if it is now 2018, then two years have passed since the appearance of the previous gate. He imagines a dark image of a soldier with an assault rifle and thought that it was then that superhumans with mana and special skills began to replace the police and army and the guilds came to power. He imagines a dark image of an officer saluting. He thought that every time a new Superman appears, 
everyone starts fighting for him. He imagines many hands reaching out to a muscular man, with money pouring into them. The main character, with a spoon in his teeth, scrolls through messages on his phone and thought that at such a time he returned. He adds that they will fill his entire phone with messages. The protagonist thought that there are now many superhuman criminals, and a plan of action in the event of monsters appearing has not yet been developed because some of the six disasters are already approaching. The protagonist closes his eyes and thinks that he has no choice. He shows three fingers and says that he will use his knowledge of the future to retire in just three years and he will make sure that it goes great. The phone vibrates on the table. The main character with a smile on his face thought that the messages did not stop coming. A brown-haired man approaches the protagonist from behind and asks him if he is Dayeen. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, turns his head and tells the man that yes, it is him, and then asks him who he is. A brown-haired man in business attire hands the protagonist an envelope and introduces himself as Kim gil Su, manager of the ruling family's guild. He tells the protagonist that after watching the video where he defeated the monsters, he immediately wanted to meet him. A dark car drives along the road. Someone in a female voice shouts to the protagonist that if he has not yet signed a contract with anyone, then he should stop. A black-haired girl walks into a cafe. She asks the protagonist with a smile if he is Dayeen, the star from the Monster Fight video, and then tells him that he looks even more amazing in real life. Another man appears in front of the girl, interrupts her, and tells the protagonist that he is from the Warriors Guild. He presses his hand to his chest and begins to say what, but he is interrupted by the woman behind him who greets the main character. A lot of people gathered around the protagonist. One of them shouts to the main character what he will get if he joins the guild. The other shouts to the other recruiters that he came first. Another person shouts that they have a friendly atmosphere and they are all like family members. The protagonist, in a menacing voice, tells the others to be quiet, and then with a serious expression on his face says that one more word, and he will not join anyone for any money. The main character combines his hands. The main character asks the people near him, Firstly, if it would be better for them to talk in another place. The main character sits at a large table. He drinks from a cup and tells the recruiters that he won't take up much of their time. He asks them how big a signing bonus they can offer. The black-haired girl is drinking tea, and Gil Su is holding the elbow of his other hand with his right hand. He raises his right hand at shoulder level and tells Day Ian that there are clauses in the contract that cannot be disclosed, and then asks him why he doesn't listen to them one by one. The main character sticks a fork into a piece of cake and asks Gil Su if he is from the ruling family's guild, and he answers yes. The guild manager closes his eyes and says that their guild is prestigious and has a year and a half of traditions. The main character replies that he wishes him to get home safely. Gil Su's expression shows confusion. The chief informs him that he does not plan to enter into a contract with them. He wonders why he would join a guild with such poor management, and besides, it will soon merge with another. The main character eats a piece of cake and asks how long he should wait for the next offer. The brown-haired man behind Gil Su shouts that they are offering the protagonist one billion won. The brown-haired girl raises her index finger and shouts that they are offering 1.1 billion. A man in a red t-shirt screams and offers 1.2 billion. One of the recruiters shouts that he consulted with their executive director and they are ready to give 1.3 billion won. Another recruiter shouts that their executive director agrees to 1.5 billion. The protagonist drinks a drink from a cup and thought it would be interesting to see how much the black hounds would offer. He adds that he was with them before returning in time. The black-haired girl shouts and says that she is offering two billion. She puts the cup on the table and says that they have the best salary, benefits, and tasks for obtaining items. She adds that their conditions are the most favorable. A black-haired girl with a smile on her face tells the protagonist that he will never be treated like this anywhere else. White House Guild Manager Beck Univai. The White House Guild was founded recently, but in three years it will become one of the top three in Korea. A symbol appears with two swords and a shield with a lion on it. The protagonist, with a pleased expression on his face, thought that perhaps this was the reason for their harsh approach. The main character tells all the recruiters besides Univai to leave and then says that they can leave their business cards with him just in case. Concern can be seen on the faces of the other recruiters but the black-haired girl sits with a serene expression on her face. The main character and the girl from the White House were left alone. Univai closes her eyes with a joyful expression on her face and tells the protagonist that on the way here, she watched the video of his fight several times. She adds that his skills are impressive, but just yesterday, he was an ordinary person. Dae-in, with a small smile on his face, 
was surprised at what an elegant way this was to show that she had inquired about him. The girl places a paper envelope on the table and tells the protagonist that she is sure that he is either a genius or has received characteristics that give him an advantage in battle. An image of blue roses appears behind her, and she tells the protagonist that they would like to cultivate his talent for the future White House. The main character took the documents out of the envelope and thought that in his previous life, he could not even think about such an offer. He asked the girl if she would mind if he adds a few conditions. The girl closes her eyes and agrees. She watches warily as the character writes something on paper. There is bewilderment on her face. She smiled and covered her mouth with her hand and then tells the protagonist that he is a big joker. The main character replies that this is not a joke. The girl points her finger at the document and reads what is written there about a four-day working week, the timely end of the working day, and the right to refuse tasks that take a long time to complete. She says with an angry expression that this is definitely a joke. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, replies that these are his conditions. Univai props up his chin with his hand and asks the main character how he gets so much self-confidence. The main character tells the girl that she will not regret it if they sign a contract. The girl suddenly gets up from her chair. She tells the protagonist with a smile on her face that she will reconsider the conditions again and will come to him in a couple of days. She winks at the main character and asks if he wouldn't mind meeting next time not for coffee, but for a drink. The main character rests his cheek with his hand and follows the leaving girl with his gaze. With a serene expression on his face, he thought that these would not get through to him and then adds that she thinks that he does not know that her father is the head of the guild. He gets up from his chair and says that he will go register as a superman. The girl asks the protagonist if he wants to register right now. Sunlight falls on a multi-story building. Disaster Management Center, Korea Branch. The girl tells the protagonist that the person responsible for this is absent now, and she is new here and cannot cope on her own. There is a sign at the door that says that the Superhuman Support Service is located there. The main character, with concern on his face, informs the worker sitting in front of him that he is in a hurry, and then asks her if he can still come up with something. The employee, with an anxious expression on her face, tells the protagonist that she will try to contact her boss. Dayin, with a smile on his face, thought that it was great that he would help her, because he needed to quickly settle everything here and leave. The worker greets her interlocutor on the phone and tells him that a young man has arrived who wants to register. As a superman, and he is in a hurry. She points the main character in the direction with her hand and asks if he has any special skills. The protagonist replies that he uses physical strength, but he has no skills. He thought it was a lie. He thought with a stern expression that now no one believes in the existence of magic, so they can only find out about his abilities if he shows them himself. But in this life, he will not do this. The girl tells the protagonist that they will start with a text in which they need to lift the barbell. The main character approaches the barbell and asks if he needs to lift it. He grabs the bar with his hand, after which blue lines appear on his hand. He lifts the barbell above him with one hand. A worker with a tense face tells the protagonist that he really is a superman and then thought that there were 200 kilograms there. The main character turns his head to the girl and asks her if she didn't believe him, and she apologizes and offers to continue. The girl puts a document on the table and tells the main character that here is his temporary superman certificate, and he responds with gratitude. The worker sitting at the table tells the protagonist that they will contact him when the official certificate is ready. The main character replies that he understands, and then wishes the girl a good day. Someone calls the worker Chi Hyun and asks her if she is here. The girl gets up from her chair and exclaims that this is the head. The main character approaches the brown-haired man and thought that it was better to bypass him. The brown-haired man is wearing glasses and holding his hand in his pocket. The protagonist thought that this was Ju San Wook from the Superhuman Support Service. Nothing good could be expected from him. The head looks at the restless protagonist, who thought that he would try never to come here again. The man with glasses turns his head forward and asks the worker if this was a new Superman. The girl replies that it was Mr. Day In, whom she told him about on the phone. The man with glasses turns his head back a little and notices that it is the super novice. Pollution Control Zone the protagonist is in a fenced area with many ruins of houses. Streams of wind circulate around the protagonist, and he thought that this zone was closed, destroyed, and abandoned because of monsters, but everything will change when the spatial gate opens. He imagines two planets colliding and thinks that the continent of Gai is a fantasy world where swords and magic exist. He adds that in a year his spatial gates will open on Earth, and humanity will become acquainted with a new civilization. The protagonist approaches the tent and says that in Korea only one will open here, in the control zone. 
He clenches his hand into a fist and with a joyful expression on his face imagines a lot of money and then says that as soon as he gets paid the bonus for signing the contract, he needs to buy this place. He adds that when the gate opens, he will become rich. The protagonist opens his backpack and says that he will now sort out his things and go hunt monsters. Someone shouts at the protagonist that he must leave or die. The main character made a wary expression on his face. Someone shouts to the protagonist that she warned him and then tells him that if he takes even a step closer, he will be finished. The protagonist climbs into the tent and wonders if this is the language of the guy inhabitants. Dark red streams of smoke flowed around him. He made a wary expression on his face. He thought that he would use a special skill, gets off the tent, and blue energy begins to envelop him. The protagonist uses the hiding skill, and when his body becomes transparent, he climbs over the fence. He thought that by merging with the environment, he could hide his presence. He adds that it was because of this skill that he was sent on dangerous missions of reconnaissance, espionage, and secret assassination. The main character thought that he would not fall for this again and heard someone shouting not to approach her. He moves quickly from place to place. With a serious expression on his face, he wonders if someone is stalking her and then adds that he needs to check what is happening. The red-haired girl shouts to the three men in front of her that she warned them. She forms a fireball in front of her and shouts to the villains that they asked for it. A black-haired man in a vest screams and asks if this is superpower and then exclaims that it's amazing. The red-haired girl became worried and the fireball began to disappear. The scoundrel in the vest shouts that they will pay for it as much as they ask. The protagonist watches from above and thinks that the girl speaks the guy language and uses its superpowers, and then wonders if she is a refugee. He adds that, of all people, she was unlucky enough to stumble upon slave traders. The villain in the vest extends his tattooed hand to the girl and tells her to give up and come to them, and then asks if she will agree if they buy her food. The protagonist became wary when he saw the man's tattoo. He imagined a tattoo in the form of a sword wrapped around a snake and thought that this was worn by members of the Red Viper criminal group. He rests his chin and wonders if they are also involved in the slave trade. The protagonist goes down and thought that he had some mana left, so he would stop using the clothes for now. He adds that it's been a while since he's seen any residents from Guy, and then wonders if it's worth saving the girl. He takes out a small knife. He makes a dash towards enemies. The main character pierced the back of a man in a vest with a knife. He forms a blue magic circle with his free hand. He cut the neck of a man in a brown shirt who was calling for his brother. Dayin quickly moves towards the villain in the white bandana and inflicts a fatal cut on him. The red-haired girl trembles and covers her mouth with her hand. She looks at the protagonist, who has closed his eyes and coughs. The main character looks at the girl and asks her from the guy continent, and then says that he has a question. The girl opens her eyes wide and asks the protagonist if he can speak their language. The main character sheathes his knife, and the girl's stomach growls. With a nervous expression on his face, he asks the girl if she likes meat. The girl with a happy expression on her face removes the crumbs from her mouth and thanks the protagonist for saving her. She adds that she promises that she will repay her one day. A drop of sweat runs down the protagonist's cheek and asks the girl how many servings she can eat. The girl with a surprised expression asks the main character what he means. The main character asks the girl if she was the only one who crossed the dimension gates. The girl made a tense expression on her face. She responds positively to the protagonist's words. The protagonist moves his hand to the side and asks the girl where she was before and where her home is. The girl with a dissatisfied expression on her face tells the protagonist that she doesn't want to tell. The main character asks her how old she is, and she replies that she won't tell. The protagonist questions the girl, and she answers each question with silence. He sits in front of the girl and thinks that in the end he didn't learn anything. The red-haired girl asks the protagonist to help her. He opens his mouth wide and tells the protagonist that he knows nothing about this place, cannot talk to anyone, and has almost no strength left. The girl forms a flame over her palms and says that she knows how to use fire, but it doesn't work out well. With an alarmed expression on her face, she looks at her hands, the flame above which has disappeared. The protagonist crosses his arms and answers the girl that he is busy because it is difficult to work as a nanny. He adds that he must have a reason to care about her. The girl was upset after his words. The protagonist with a stern expression on his face tells the girl that he is giving her a month, exactly how long she can live here. He tells her that he will teach her their language and give her basic knowledge. The red-haired girl opened her mouth in surprise. The main character informs her that in return she will take care of everyday life and carry out his instructions. 
The girl was delighted and asked the protagonist if she really could stay here. The main character, looking at her, thought that this was already bothering him. He tells her that he said, nothing will be for nothing, and then tells her to wash the dishes. The red-haired girl holds the dishes in her hands and agrees. She clenches her hand into a fist and exclaims that her name is Lily and she hopes that they will get along. With confusion on her face, she asks the protagonist where to wash the dishes. The protagonist points his finger in the right direction and says what is over there. He wonders why her name seems familiar to him. He thought with concern on his face about Lily using fire and then added that it couldn't be. The protagonist imagines an adult red-haired woman with a fireball above her hand and thought that the monster that will burn half of Seoul in 10 years has hair the color of flames and the ability to control fire. He adds that this fire, which is one of the six plagues, the protagonist with a thoughtful look thought that the girl was very similar to her. They were literally like two peas in a pod. He thought that as far as he knew, the fire which was kidnapped as a child by a criminal organization and raised from her to be the one who would cause a disaster. A joyful red-haired girl hums a melody. The main character thought that perhaps he would be able to stop one of the six disasters. The protagonist walks with a girl through the market, and she asks him where they are. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, tells the girl that they are at the market and then adds that he will prepare a special lunch for her today. Lily's expression became joyful after the main character's words. The protagonist asks the seller at the meat counter if he has carnivore fillets, and he replies that of course he has plenty. Dayin thought that after the opening of the first spatial gate, a food crisis began and people switched to monster meat. He imagines a butchered monster, a flower, and a monster with one eye and wings. He thought that now supply exceeds demand because no one has yet realized its usefulness, which lies in the richness of meat and mana. He adds that in the future he will not be able to live without it. The main character imagines two fried pieces of meat, red feathers and green turquoise eggs. The girl's stomach growls, and the seller gives the protagonist more meat than he bought. The main character holds bags of food in his hands with a small smile and thought that her appearance evoked sympathy from everyone, so they were given too much. The red-haired girl also carries one package. The protagonist tells Lily that she needs to buy clothes and then asks her to choose something from what is there. The girl looks at the clothes on the hangers and asks the protagonist if it was really possible. She saw a white and red dress and exclaims that she wants it. The protagonist looked at the girl with a stern look. The red-haired girl is wearing a sports jacket and pants in red and white colors. The protagonist closes his eyes and says that in such clothes, it's just right to walk around the landfill. The girl stands behind the protagonist with many identical costumes and bags that the protagonist bought for her. The protagonist says that today's dinner is Dae Yin's signature dish, enriched with mana. Dark steam emanates from the pan with food. A red-haired girl, with a surprised look on her face, asks the protagonist if they will eat it. The protagonist replies that healthy food always looks like this. A red-haired girl with wide, open eyes says that it smells very good. The main character puts a box of chicken on the table and says that he took it for later, but thinks that they can eat it now. The girl reaches out to the box and asks if it is a chicken. She took a bite from the chicken leg. She chews with a happy expression on her face and then exclaims that this is delicious. She clenches her hand into a fist and asks the main character how it could be so tasty and then adds that from now on she will only eat chicken. Dayin, with an angry expression tells the girl to eat the rest too. Otherwise he will throw her into the soup too. Lily, with horror on her face, shouts back that there is no need to do this. The protagonist eats the soup and calls the girl picky and then adds that it is quite edible. He thought that no, just a little more and he could die. He adds that if he had not returned to the past, he would now be ordering delicacies in a restaurant. The protagonist eats soup with a dissatisfied expression on his face. Lily says her tongue is numb. There are leftovers of food on the table. The main character tells the girl that she will talk after she eats everything. The protagonist tells the tired girl to wash the dishes and sit down to read a book, and then asks not to bother him. The girl agrees. The protagonist meditates with his eyes closed. He imagines the image of a person who has a flaming ball inside, from which blue streams of energy emanate. He thought that this was the great sea of mind technique. It increased magical power and allowed him to use it more deftly. The protagonist is enveloped in crackling blue energy, and he thought that he had trained this technique before returning, and then adds that the mana is growing faster than expected. He thought that in the past, no matter how much effort he put in, there was no such effect, and then he wondered if it was because of proper nutrition. 
He imagined swirling orange energy and thought he could feel his dantion increasing in size. The main character gritted his teeth with tension on his face and thought that if he continued to eat food rich in mana and master the mind technique, he would become even stronger than last time. Lily watches from around the corner of the protagonist, who with a serious expression on his face thought it was time to finish and wonders why his stomach is already growling. A girl with a joyful expression on her face asks the protagonist if he is hungry and if he wants chicken. The protagonist turns his head back and smiles. A girl sits near a plate of soup and shouts that she hates this food. The protagonist eats soup from his plate with tension on his face. Two days later, the protagonist clenches his hand into a fist and is enveloped in blue energy. He thought that this was an amazing result in such a short time, and then adds that with the current level, you can even go on a treasure hunt. The protagonist's phone begins to vibrate. He answers the call and tells the other person that he is listening. Univi holds the phone to her ear and tells the main character that she is a little disappointed because she thought that he would call first. She asks if he doesn't care how she is doing. The main character thought that he had already forgotten about the guild, and then with a serious expression on his face, he told the girl that he had business to do and then asked her how the contract was being renegotiated. She wants to say information about this, but stops and remains silent with worry on her face. The main character tells her that judging by her silence, some difficulties have arisen. The girl replies that she managed to convince their leader, and then says that he will hire the protagonist if he proves that he is capable. The protagonist with a watchful gaze asks the girl if they really want to conduct testing. The girl apologizes to the protagonist and tells him that she thinks this is ridiculous, and then adds that if he waits a couple more days, she can come up with something. The main character, with a smile on his face, answers that he agrees, and the girl was surprised at this answer. The protagonist adds that there is one condition, however. Guild Headquarters White House. Sunlight falls on a multi-story building. A black-haired girl asks the protagonist who this cute little girl is. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, tells her that the girl's name is Lily and that she is her half-sister. Yoon Havai leans over a little with a smile on his face and greets the red-haired girl. The protagonist says that she lived abroad, so she speaks Korean poorly. He adds that he will have to take her with him everywhere for a while due to unforeseen circumstances. A wide-eyed, red-haired girl asks the protagonist who this black-haired girl is, and then remarks that she is so beautiful. The protagonist replies that she will give them money. Lily imagines that a lot of money is the same as a lot of chicken resulting in her facial expression expressing admiration. She thought the black-haired girl was a very good person. Yoon Havai straightens his back and tells the protagonist that he need not worry because their guild does not interfere in the personal lives of its members. The protagonist replies that this is nice. A man with a mustache and beard made a joyful expression on his face and greets the protagonist and then introduces himself. Head of the White House Guild, Baek Chan Sung. He shakes the protagonist's hand and tells him that they were supposed to visit him first, but things got in the way, and then says that he hopes for his understanding. The protagonist replies that everything is fine. He will consider that he came here on an excursion. The head of the guild stands next to the protagonist and says that he was told that he added a new condition to double the amount specified in the contract if he passes the test. He asks him if this means that he agrees to go through with it. Golden streams of energy emanate from it. He bows to the main character and asks him if he is really worth so much money. The protagonist became worried and thought that he was sure that the head of the guild did not know either martial arts or magic and was still able to create overwhelming energy thanks to his mana. He adds that a monster is a monster in any case. And if another Superman were in his place, he would not say a word. The protagonist begins to be enveloped in blue energy and he thought that, however, this time he would not be intimidated by such things. Lily looks at the protagonist with concern on her face, and he tells the head of the guild that he understands everything. He tells Chan Song with a serious expression that he will prove his worth to him. The head of the guild opened his eyes wide after the words of the protagonist. He turns to Univai and asks her to rewrite the contract. She wants to say something about the previous conditions, but she is interrupted. The head of the guild with a serious expression on his face says that they will triple the amount originally assigned and will also add a condition that he will receive 20 billion won if he passes the test and signs the contract. The protagonist, with a smug expression on his face, thought that initially he was offered 2 billion, so the triple amount is 6 billion, and then asks if he really wants to give him 20 more if he passes the test. He calls the guild leader a hot-tempered person, and then adds that he is ready to start the test right now. White House Underground Training Ground The main character stands opposite a man with blonde hair. 
Yunhui informs the protagonist that the test will be considered passed if he defeats three members of their guild. She adds that since this is not a real fight, they should try not to hurt each other. She informs the protagonist that this is his first opponent. His name is Huan Jan Hyuk, a blonde man ho. LDS his hands in his pockets. The main character holds the watch in his hand like brass knuckles and tells the black-haired girl that these watches will be more than enough. Yunvi asks the main character what weapon he will take. The blonde man wrinkles his face and wonders if the protagonist chose a watch. The angry man thought that he woke up not long ago, but wants to fight for hours, and then mentally calls him a scoundrel. The guild leader tells the two combatants that they can begin the fight. Jan Hyuk puts his sword in front of him and tells the protagonist that he will cripple him. The main character looks at the enemy with a wary look and wonders what's wrong with him. He thought that he had only read about this guy in a magazine. The blonde man makes a dash towards the protagonist. The main character thought that his opponent's skill was speed, and then added that he had the ability to become faster the more he moved without a break. The blonde guy makes a jump, and the protagonist, standing in a fighting stance, thought that he needed to be defeated quickly before he became even faster. Jan Hyuk runs around the protagonist. The protagonist with a stern look says that he expected him to attack directly, but no. Several spectators watch the battle from above. One of them tells the others to watch how Jan Hyuk got up to speed, and then adds that it is quite difficult to defeat the member of the First Association. Some of them say that this is the end. Another viewer says that at least he is brave. Chan Sung and Yoon Vi watch the battle with nervous expressions on their faces. The blonde man tells the protagonist that he will finish him off. He swings at the protagonist from behind. The protagonist watches the enemy with a wary face. He thought that the one who let his guard down was the easiest to defeat, and then punched the blonde man in the face. He looks at his falling opponent with a serious expression and thought that he should not have attacked him, because his speed also works against him. Joyful Lily clenches her hand into a fist and shouts that this is a victory. The black-haired girl covers her mouth with her hand and thought that the protagonist managed it in one blow. The protagonist with a smile on his face asks who is next. The guild leader puts his hand forward in front of the protagonist and tells him that he is amazing. The main character asks him if everything is okay with Jan Hyuk. Chan Sung replies that his life is not in danger and the doctors will take care of him. He adds that after a couple of days of rest he will recover. A blonde man lies in bed. The guild leader, with a joyful expression on his face, tells the protagonist that it is good that he restrained his power. The protagonist, with a smile on his face, asked the man if it really seemed like that to him. He thought that if he had not controlled the force, his head would have flown off his shoulders, which did not go unnoticed. The protagonist looks at the audience and thought that now he is definitely guaranteed six billion under the contract. He adds that he already meets their requirements. With a happy expression on his face, he asked the audience if he could have fun until the end of the test. Lily, with a nervous expression on her face, asked the protagonist why he is smiling like a fool. The angry protagonist replies that in battle, you need to remain in control. The second sparring location is the training ground in the artificial forest. Yun Vi stands between two men and says that in the White House, there are two associations of six teams, each with five people. She informs them that their next opponent is the head of the sixth team of the first association. A symbol appears with two swords and a shield with a lion on it. A black-haired man with plate pauldrons and gloves puts his hand forward and introduces himself as Yoon Dae-hoon, and then says that he hopes for a good fight. The White House's main tank is the buffalo, Yoon Dae-hoon. The protagonist with a wary look remembered that he saw his rival among the spectators and thought that this guy was one of those from whom the desire to kill him came. He gets into a fighting stance and exclaims that he is ready. The tank takes his sword out of its sheath. The bell began to ring. The main character makes a dash towards the tank. He swings his fist at his opponent. He makes a strike, but the tank blocks the attack with a shield. He dodges the tank's slashing attack. Daehoon clutches the shield tightly and thought that this was his chance. He puts his shield forward and thought that if he throws the shield, he might lose. The main character ends up behind his opponent. He swings at the tank using the Falcon Claw skill. The opponent repels the attack with his shield and wonders if he really studied martial arts before awakening. He swings his sword at the main character. The protagonist slipped under the opponent's attack. He turns his back to the tank. He pushed his opponent away with his back. Daehoon wrinkled his face. The impact pushed him into a tree. The protagonist looks at his opponent and mentally curses. He thought that his physical endurance was no joke. The tank gets to his feet and tells the protagonist that he is quite strong. 
The protagonist with a wary look thought that he planned to hide his abilities until the last enemy, but this old fox wants him to show him everything. He looks at the smiling guild leader. Daehoon dusts himself off and tells the protagonist that he will ask him to join his team, and then adds that he thinks they will work well together. The main character with a stern look asks who decides this. Tank points his sword towards the head and says that he is the winner, and then asks the head if this is true. Chan Song closes his eyes and answers yes. The main character turns his pupils aside and tells the tank that then he will become the head of the team if he defeats them. Someone from the audience above asks what the protagonist said. Another viewer says that this is some kind of nonsense. Another viewer says it's too much of a gamble. The protagonist looks at the audience. He informs the head of the guild that he will create his own team and recruit people there, and then says that they will carry out tasks independently. He thought that at first he wanted to gradually lead to this after demonstrating his abilities, but why wait if he would already defeat the already existing head? The head of the guild agrees with the protagonist with a serious look. His face is covered by a shadow, and he tells the protagonist that if he loses, however, he will have the signing bonus and double the duration of the contract. The main character agrees to the conditions of the guild head. The tank puts his hand on his belt and asks the protagonist if he is sure that he will defeat him. Daehoon with a malicious smile asks the protagonist if he likes Yoon Vi, and then tells him that he wants to kill him because she shows interest in him. He asks the protagonist if he really thinks that winning will give him the right to act arrogantly towards him. Daehoon will become a very controversial character in the near future. He will have to go through all kinds of humiliation and eventually be expelled from the guild. The protagonist tells him that it would be better if he at least tidied up his room and remembers his room with many photographs of a black-haired girl on the wall. Tank asks the protagonist what he said. The protagonist calls the tank a pervert, and he gets angry and shouts at the protagonist to shut his mouth. The head of the guild, the black-haired girl, and Lily watch what is happening in bewilderment. Orange streams of energy emanate from Daehoon, and he shouts to the protagonist that he will show what his future commander is made of. The protagonist thought that this is the buffalo mode, which is activated when he loses his temper. He adds that it increases his mana and physical performance. The tank suddenly starts running towards the main character. He almost reached the protagonist. Blue energy circulates around the protagonist's hand due to his use of the Great Sea of Mind technique. Daehoon shouts at the protagonist with a menacing expression on his face. The main character moves his hand back and uses lightning fist and then advises his opponent to block it with his shield. With his strong blow, he broke the opponent's shield into two parts, after which he pushes off and breaks several trees. The guild master and the black-haired girl watch the battle with surprise on their faces. Chan Sung says that the newcomer really beat Dae Hong. The defeated tank lies unconscious under a tree. The protagonist sits on the ground and says that his body hurts, and then laments how difficult it is to make money. He looks at his trembling hand and thought that his body is still weak, and he can't believe that he lost so much strength after just one strike with his lightning fist. With his eyes closed, he sits in the butterfly pose and is enveloped in streams of blue energy. He thought that he needed to recover with the technique of the mind, and his strength would be useful in the next sparring. He opens his eyes. Univai congratulates the protagonist with a smile on his face, calling him the head of the seventh team. The main character, with a pleased expression on his face, says that this sounds good. He gets up from his seat and thought that according to the contract, defeating two opponents adds another billion to him. So now he can aim for all twenty. He asked the black-haired girl who his last opponent is. Lily, with concern on her face, thought that there would really be another fight. The guild leader straightens his shirt and tells the protagonist that he didn't think he would defeat Commander Dae Hong. He clenches his hand into a fist and says that he has no choice. He will have to fight the last battle himself. The black-haired girl A. Indeed, the main character look at the head of the guild with worry in their faces. The protagonist thought that he really had to fight this monster. The main character, with a serene expression on his face, says that he gives up. The surprised guild leader asks the protagonist why he did this. He puts his hand on the protagonist's shoulder and says that he will give him 20 billion for 5 minutes of battle, and then offers 3 billion for every 3 minutes. The protagonist, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, says that he cannot fight anymore. The black-haired girl with a gloomy smile says that it's time to finally sign the contract. Chan Sung and the protagonist look at her with nervous expressions. A notification appears, which says that the protagonist is provided with a bonus to the signing bonus, one billion, the provision of better treatment, the provision of the position of head of the seventh team. Dae Yin's contract is signed. The black-haired girl tells the protagonist that these conditions are really good. 
On the table, there is a contract with the signatures of the head of the guild and the protagonist. Dayin tells the girl that he hopes they will work together. The girl sits at the desk in front of the protagonist with the girl and asks the main character how he plans to recruit people for the team. The main character answers that gradually and then asks if he can already sign contracts with others. The girl answers yes and asks with whom. The protagonist puts his hand on the red-haired girl's chair and answers the manager. What's wrong with someone who is not a member of any guild and is very talented? He says that he means Lily, after which the girl opens her eyes wide. She looks at the protagonist and asks what he needs. The protagonist asks her to create as big a flame as she can. The girl with a serious expression on her face says that she is hungry. The main character tells her that he will buy three chickens. The girl made a wary expression on her face. She got up from her chair and shouts to the protagonist to remember what he promised her. She raises her hands up and creates a large and bright flame, screaming about three chickens. Univai covers his mouth with his hand and asks the protagonist if his little sister is also a superhuman. The protagonist replies that yes, that's why he wants to take her on his team. He thought that the fire does not burn things, which means she has perfect control of the ability, which is surprising because he has only been training her for a couple of days. The girl's flame is near the ceiling and window, but does not burn them. The protagonist thought that in her past life, she became a disaster for a reason. He holds a document in his hand and invites the black-haired girl to discuss payment for the Lily contract, and then adds that they will start with three billion. A red-haired girl with a gloomy expression asks the protagonist what about the chicken. She holds two chicken legs in her hands and eats them. Lily, member of the 7th White House team. Payment under the contract is five billion one. Sunlight falls on a huge office building. The White House owns this building. His large company has enough full-time workers to staff the training rooms, living quarters, control rooms, and more. Univai asks the protagonist and the girl walking along the corridor with her if they were surprised by the ultra-modern equipment of the guild. The protagonist replies that he is not one of those who can be surprised. He thought that the equipment was old compared to what he saw in the future. The protagonist, along with the others, enters the warehouse and says that this place is impressive. There are many weapons located on tables and display cases around. Univai points to the display cases and says that there is a workshop for developing equipment, and if they need anything, they will fulfill the order in a week. The main character, with his hands in his pockets, replies that he has someone to give orders to, but he will grab a couple of things from here. The main character picked up two knives and thought that this would be enough for the first time, and then says that he will use these blades for now. He attaches the sheathed knives to his belt and asks the black-haired girl if they are finished with the inspection. The girl turns to the protagonist and replies that since this is her first day, it will end after meeting with the head. The head of the guild enters the room, raises his hand, and exclaims that this is where the protagonist is. He sighs and says that there was an urgent message from the control center. He adds that all the teams are on missions now so he is in a difficult position. He apologizes to the protagonist for asking him about this on the first day, and then asks him if he could go on a mission. The main character, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, thought that he hoped to leave work early today. The guild leader says what they would have done if the matter was not so urgent, but the protagonist with an angry expression on his face interrupts him and asks where he should go. The protagonist is driving along the road in a car, and a black-haired girl asks him if he got there and how the situation is there. The main character says that the portal is 10 meters above the ground and huge slugs come out of it in large numbers. Many green slugs crawled out of the portal. One of the people shouts to the others not to get into the slime. Another person screams and asks what this sticky thing is. The slime got on the hand of the blonde man and on the hand of the guy with the shield. The protagonist with the girl stands near the car and says that it seems that most of the monsters have already been dealt with and then asks if they should really intervene. Univai tells the protagonist that they need a sample of these new monsters, so he needs to bring at least three and try to preserve their original appearance as much as possible. The main character put his hand to his ear with a communication device and replies that he understood everything, and then thought that in the future these monsters will be avoided. Lily got scared and put her hands together. Huge, smelly slugs. The slug has a mouth with many sharp teeth. The protagonist thought that they were weak but they explode on collision and splash out stinking mucus. A red-haired girl with a tense face is indignant at the stench here and asks if they really need to fight them. The protagonist replies that he blocked his sense of smell with mana and then asks the girl if he can teach her how to do this. The girl opens her eyes wide and asks the protagonist if he really did it with mana. The main character raises the index finger on his right hand and says that it's unlikely to work the first time, but with practice there won't be any problems. Lily. 
with a joyful expression on her face, raises her hands and exclaims that it worked and she doesn't feel anything anymore. The protagonist, looking at her, thought that he didn't even have time to explain and calls her a talented girl. With a serious expression on his face, he tells the girl to stand here and he will quickly catch them and they will go back. Lily replies with a smile on her face that she understands everything. The protagonist thought that it seemed that no one was able to get a good sample because slugs explode even from a small amount of mana and attacks without mana have no effect on them. People with shovels and bags are trying to collect mucus. The main character pushes off the ground with his foot and thought it was time to catch samples. He sees a slug on a tree. He kicks the tree. The slime falls from the tree onto the protagonist, who moves his hand back. The protagonist took a fighting stance. He used the Tai Chi skill, after which the slug spins in a stream of air. It spins very quickly around its axis. The slime falls to the ground. The main character puts it in a bag and says that one is ready. Lily asks the protagonist how he did it, and then asks him to teach him. The protagonist, with an angry expression on his face, replies that he will teach for a hundred billion. The upset, red-haired girl does not agree with the protagonist because they can buy so many chickens. The main character thought that she wanted to waste all his money. The main character tells Univai via the protagonist's communicator that the samples have been collected. They have all three of them. And then adds that they will hand them over to the collection team and finish their work for today. The black-haired girl with a surprised expression on her face asks if they have already done it. The girl tells the protagonist that this was their first task and then asks if they were nervous and if they have any questions. The protagonist touches the communicator and replies that there was nothing to worry about because when they arrived, the others had already figured out almost everything. Lily notices someone approaching them. The black-haired girl replies that she understands everything and tells them to look around a little. Someone turns to the protagonist. He asks him if he is from the White House, and he turns back. Three men approach the protagonist. The guy in the black and red shirt tells the protagonist that he hasn't seen him before, and then asks him if he's new. The protagonist replies that it is. One of the guys says he heard that they hired a new guy. He informs the protagonist that judging by his shoulder bandage, he is a commander. The protagonist is wearing a bandage with the letters WH on his arm. One of the guys asks if they really don't have enough people, since they put a newbie in command. A green-haired man in a black and red shirt smiles and asks the protagonist if the move he used is his ability. Black Hound Guild, Captain of the 15 Chan Sukhyun. The protagonist thought that this was his former boss and they had not seen each other for a long time. With a stern look, he tells him to stop talking and then asks him what he needs. The green-haired guy says that those terrible slimes are always exploding and they were unable to collect normal samples. Lily holds a bag in her hands with a worried expression on her face. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, asks the guy if he wants the protagonist to share and then immediately says that he will refuse. The green-haired man made a dissatisfied expression on his face and asked the protagonist how old he is, since he talks to him so familiarly. A large man in dark clothes stands in front of him and tells Suk Hyun to limit himself to words. This is the head of the third team of the Warrior Guild. A guy with hair tied and a ponytail puts his hand forward in front of the protagonist and tells him not to be so harsh with his comrades, and then says that he should think for himself because they will have to meet often on the battlefield so it is better to help each other become better. This is the head of the fifth team of the ruling family guild. Univai stands up and shouts at the protagonist not to give in to them, and then adds that she will file a formal complaint with the head. The protagonist squeezes the bag in his hand and thought that he had already been through this more than once, and if he didn't share, they would try to take the bag by force. He throws the bag on the floor and tells the villains to take it. One of the villains tells the protagonist that it would be better if he did this right away. The main character smiles a little. On sits on the bag. Sitting on the sack, he tells the scoundrels that let them take it if they can. An angry man in dark clothes asks the protagonist what he said. The guy with his hair tied in a ponytail says he was trying to negotiate. Suk Hyun clenches his hand into a fist and asks the protagonist if he really wants to figure it out differently. The main character tells Lily behind him to set everything on fire when he gives the signal to get them excited. The red-haired girl opens her eyes wide and asks the protagonist if she should burn them. The protagonist, with a nervous expression on her face, replies that no, because later there will be a lot of problems, so she should only set fire to the ground. He thought that he would not let her become a disaster. The green-haired man points his fist at the protagonist and yells at him to get up so he can teach him a lesson. A lot of crackling energy gathers around the portal. The green-haired man shouts and asks what's wrong with the portal. Slime comes out of the portal, 
A man in dark clothes notices that this slug is big. Sukhyun orders everyone to prepare to fight. Many people are running down the street. A huge slime with many tentacles and a shell landed on the ground, and many armed people ran straight towards it. The guy in the white shirt shouts to the protagonist that if he gets hit, it's his own fault. The main character gets up from his seat, takes the bag, and replies that he understands. He tells Lily that they will go take the bags to the car, and the girl agrees with a joyful expression on her face. A man in a green finger attacks the tentacle and screams asking why they are not cutting. A man with a shield blocked the attack and shouted asking where he got so much power. One of the tentacles grabbed the guy in the green jacket. The guy in the gray shirt commands to cut off the tentacles first. The black-haired girl tells the protagonist through a communicator that he must go fight. Lily puts the bags in the car. Univai tells the protagonist that just one hit is enough for them to claim the loot. The main character smiles and tells the girl not to worry. He turns around and says that they will never defeat him like this. The monster hits the ground with its tentacle. One of the people near him shouts to the tanks to deal with the tentacles first, and then adds that his mucus dissolves shields. Sukhyun holds his hand and shouts for the tanks to retreat and prepare to attack from afar. Tanks run away from the slime. One of them shouts that he is not like those little slugs. The protagonist sits on the trunk with his arms crossed and says that until they all leave. Lily asks how long they will look at it. Someone yells at the guy with the stone hands to run faster. He staggers and apologizes. Blackhound Guild, Wang Gu Ho, nickname Wimp, a guy in a black shirt and with a damaged sword shouts that all his weapons are corroded. The blonde guy shouts that this slug is crawling here. The commander commands the combatants to retreat. Participants in the battle run away from the monster. Gu Ho, who has almost reached the tentacles, asks to take him too. Sukhyun calls him a fool and commands him to use his abilities to escape. The man with the stone hands was enveloped by a tentacle. The monster brings the guy to its mouth, and he asks to help him. The protagonist asks the other participants in the battle how they can call themselves his comrades. He cuts the monster's tentacle. The monster screams loudly in pain. Guho falls to the ground behind the main character and thanks him. The protagonist looks at him and tells him that this is not how he should use his powers. He adds that if he wants to know how to do it right, he should find him after the fight. The hands of the brown-haired guy cease to be stone, and he looks at the protagonist with surprise on his face. The main character with a stern look tells Lily that they are starting, and the girl behind him clenches her hand into a fist and agrees with him. A bright flame appears, and one of the fighters watching what is happening shouts and asks where so much fire suddenly came from. A drone flies in the sky above the fire. The black-haired girl tells the protagonist to look at other superhumans and not act rashly. She adds that the support team will arrive in five minutes, so you should wait for them to fight together. The main character stands quietly near the fire and says that in five minutes help will come to the others, so it's better to take all the loot for yourself. The black-haired girl reports that because of the fire it is difficult for the drone to get closer, it needs to be taken further away. A huge slime monster moves behind the wall of fire. Yunvai, with a worried expression on his face, shouts that they don't care about all the loot because it's too dangerous. The main character presses his fingers to the communicator and tells the girl not to worry, because he will defeat him and return unharmed. The girl replies that she doesn't want the protagonist to get hurt. The main character thought that this was an unusually brutal monster, so there is an entry about it in an illustrated book. He remembers a book with information about this monster called the Stinking Snail King. The protagonist thought it was important to remember the strategy for defeating monsters in case of an emergency. The main character thought that fire was his weakness, because it definitely slowed down after they lit it. The Slime King heads towards the protagonist and the girl. The protagonist pushes off the ground and tells Lily to cover him. The girl spreads her arms to the sides, forming a flame above herself, and answers the protagonist with consent. The tentacles rush towards the protagonist, and he thought that they were growing back. The enemy quickly recovered. He adds that he will need the help of the red-haired girl. The main character cuts the enemy's tentacles and runs to his right, and then commands the girl to act now. Many flames are directed forward from behind Lily. The monster's tentacles light up. The protagonist runs further and tells the girl to continue. The red-haired girl sighs with a content expression on her face. Many severed tentacles lie on the ground. The protagonist imagines the slime king with his tentacles cut off and thinks that when most of the tentacles are cut off, he will hide in a shell to recover. He imagines a monster hiding in the sink. The protagonist approaches the sink where the monster is hiding and thought that the book says that he even blocks the passage. 
The girl approaches the protagonist and asks him if the monster is closed and what they will do. The protagonist takes out a sharp metal object and says that they will use what they took from the car. He imagines a monster's shell and thought that it was incredibly strong, so he had to aim at different places. He concentrates the blue energy in his hands and places the end of the pointed object against the sink. He sticks his weapon right into the sink. He swings a dagger and is about to strike, and Lily, watching what was happening, thought that she was bored. One of the participants in the battle looks at the fire and asks what they are doing there. Guho remembered how the protagonist told him that he shouldn't use his powers in the right way, and then wonders if he was telling the truth. The tired protagonist sighs. He hammered a lot of metal pins into the sink and says it's time to move on to the last stage. There were a lot of cracks left on the sink, and the protagonist thought that the nails were driven in. Now he needs to aim at the center. He adds that the strongest blow he is currently capable of is the great sea of mind technique. The protagonist concentrates blue energy in his fist and swings it at the sink. More bright, crackling energy appears around the fist. He used the lightning fist technique. He hit the shell. He wrinkled his face in pain. Electricity circulates between the metal nails. The monster's shell breaks. The protagonist and the monster fall to the ground. He thought that during the test, he thought that using this technique twice would be overkill, but his body is so weak that he cannot perform any normally. Lily runs up to the prone protagonist and asks him if he is okay. With a frightened expression on her face, she asks the protagonist if he was electrocuted. The protagonist grits his teeth and tells the girl that she should help him. She helps him get up, and he says that he thinks they overpowered him. Lily asks the protagonist if it is possible to remove the firewall, and he replies that he needs to hold it a little longer because they tried very hard, so they need to take all the loot for themselves. The protagonist puts the chopped tentacle into a bag held by the girl and informs her that its meat is very soft and rich in nutrients. Lily asks if this is true with a joyful expression on her face. She closes her eyes and exclaims that a chicken snail is waiting for her. The protagonist with a grim smile clutches a knife in his hand and thought that this was the ideal ingredient for a nutritious mana stew. He says that this is enough, after which he is surprised when they contact him via communicator. The person from the communicator asks the protagonist how he is and then adds that this is the captain of the second team, Wu Hyuk, and he was informed about his situation, so now they will come to help. The protagonist anxiously shouts at them to wait and informs them that they should come in when he removes the firewall. He begins to quickly cut the monster and thought that he had not yet taken the most important thing. The commander of the second team asks the protagonist if it's not difficult for the two of them to resist the slug, and then says that he heard that today is his first day at work, so he shouldn't overdo it. The protagonist grabs the slime and tells Lily that it can remove the fire. The fiery wall, near which several fighters were standing, disappears. A brown-haired man in a black shirt with a dissatisfied expression on his face points to the protagonist and asks him if he defeated him himself. The protagonist, with a smug expression on his face, replies that he fought to the death, but fortunately, he was lucky. The head of the fifth team from the ruling guild with a nervous expression on his face says that this is some kind of nonsense. Suk Hyun, eyes wide open, asks how the main character managed to do what all of them could not do. The protagonist shakes and clutches his shoulder then asks Wu Hyuk if he can leave the cleaning up to them. He replies that the protagonist need not worry and go home. He adds that if the protagonist is seriously injured, then it is better for him to return to headquarters, where he will be treated. The protagonist remembers how a black-haired girl with an angry expression on her face told him that if he was wounded, he would know what would happen. The main character, with anxiety on his face, replies that he will rest first. A red-haired girl with an upset expression on her face says that she wants to sleep and eat. The protagonist tells her that she also worked hard today. Street lights illuminate the night street. The protagonist offers Lily to eat to her heart's content. There's a lot of chicken in boxes on the table. The red-haired girl looks at her with appetite and exclaims that this is not a dream. She raises her hands with chicken legs and exclaims that she wants to go catch snails again. The main character drinks a drink from a glass. He knocks his glass on the table, curses and says that such taste is worth living for. The red-haired girl was fixated on the protagonist's curse, and when she took a bite of the chicken, she thought that he says it every time he eats. The girl swears in exactly the same way as the protagonist, after which he spits the drink out of his mouth and thinks that it's not for nothing that they say that you need to control your speech in front of children. The main character wipes his face and tells the girl that this is a bad word, so she should not use it. Lily asks the protagonist why she can't, because he's using it. The protagonist replies that, however, she cannot say it. 
The girl asks the protagonist why he says bad words when he eats chicken. Many buildings around are overgrown with vegetation. The protagonist is meditating while sitting on the ground and thought that he had been using the great sea of mind technique for a long time, but it continued to kill him, although what else could be expected after yesterday's drinking? With a skeptical expression on his face, he thought that this technique would rather work as an emergency aid. There was no need to get drunk. He turns on his smartphone and wonders how many calls he has received this morning. The black-haired girl screams and asks the protagonist why he didn't answer her. The main character takes his head away from the phone. He tells her that his muscles hurt so much that he still just slept. He overworked yesterday. Yun Vai, with a worried expression on his face, apologizes to the protagonist and then asks him if he is feeling better yet. The protagonist gets up from his seat and answers that he doesn't really and then asks the girl if he wanted something. The black-haired girl tells the protagonist that she plans to actively recruit people for his team, so she would like to hear his opinion. The protagonist thought that it would take a lot of people to lead the team. He imagines a scheme in which he will need a film crew, a medical team, and a technical support team. He thought that groups were needed to film, support, and provide medical assistance, and also an operator who would contact everyone from the control room. He imagines a winking Univai against the backdrop of a control room with an operator and thought that he even needed secretaries, on whose shoulders the responsibility would fall to develop schedules for groups and deal with paperwork. The protagonist, with a stern expression on his face, thought that these people would influence the effectiveness of the team, and then asked the black-haired girl to choose them according to her taste. He adds that she has a good understanding of people. The girl smiles a little after the protagonist's words. She closes her eyes and replies that so be it. After all, she hired him, and then adds that if he doesn't mind, then let them call him after lunch. The protagonist, with a nervous expression on his face, says that he would like to take one person with him. He adds that this is Gu Ho from the Black Hound Guild. He imagines a man in a green jacket with drops of sweat running down his cheek. He asks the girl to contact him. The head of the White House Guild invites the protagonist to take three days off. The protagonist looks at the chapter through a video link on a smartphone and tells him that he is just a little tired. The head of the guild clenches his hand into a fist and answers the protagonist that Yoon Havai told him everything, and then adds that he is unlikely to be able to go on the mission until they gather the whole team. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, thought that he wouldn't mind not going to work for a couple of days. The head of the guild informs the protagonist that he can rest and don't be so tense next time because he is the future of their guild. He adds that when the protagonist gets better, he proposes to fight together, but the protagonist interrupts him. The main character takes his head away from the phone and asks the red-haired girl if she is hungry, and then thanks the head and tells him that he will have a good rest. Cheerful Lily asks the protagonist if they will eat chicken. The main character with a gloomy smile replies that he will cook something more delicious. He imagines red feathers and thought that unlike the previous dish, this one is made from fresh and tasty ingredients. He imagines round vegetables and thought that these foods had a soft texture. He imagines green monster meat and thought he even added a snail heart. An image of green energy emanating from a green ball appeared in his head, and he thought that this was a special healthy dish of manna. The main character wishes the red-haired girl a bon appetit. He calls the dish hellish snail, meat soup, and scoops a portion from the pan, and then says that the color is strange, but it is healthy food. Lily looks away and says that yesterday she ate a lot of chicken and was not yet hungry. The protagonist asks the girl if this is true, and then adds that it's a shame. He chews and says that it is very tasty and rich. Lily behind the protagonist asks him if this is true. He asks the girl if it's okay if he eats her portion too. The girl stops the protagonist and shouts that no, she will eat it herself. The main character with a stern look tells the girl that she said she didn't want to. The girl looks at the protagonist warily. The girl lowers her head and says that yesterday she was so happy. And the protagonist takes the plate from the table and tells the girl not to make a drama. Because the world is full of delicious food. Lily, with an upset expression on her face, tells the protagonist that she won't trust him anymore. The main character tells her that they are having fried pork belly for dinner. The girl looks at the protagonist and asks him what pork belly is like. The main character replies that it costs more than chicken. The girl rests her chin and her cheeks are red. She tells the protagonist that this is something you can live for. The protagonist, who is actually the culprit, wonders from whom she learned to say such nonsense. The main character gets up from his seat and stretches his arm, and then tells the girl that in order to eat delicious food, she needs to improve her digestion. He adds that she needs to follow him, because they will go hunting for treasure. The girl follows the protagonist and asks what he means. 
The monsters that survived the opening of the first gate chose places to live. Many birds fly against the background of the red sky. Some of them, orcs united into a tribe. A muscular orc with a shoulder pad holds a sword in H. His hand. There is a relic from another dimension on their territory. Many orcs with clubs in their hands stand near the orc statue. The surroundings of the orc's possessions. The main character watches them with binoculars and says that she is probably in that stone statue. He thought that, however, before returning in time, the expedition team found and took her. But this time he would get ahead of them. He removes the binoculars from his eyes and thought that there were about 200 orcs in the tribe. He adds that thanks to the central crystal, his body was restored. But there are still too many of them for him alone. The main character gets up from his seat and tells the red-haired girl that he will get in there. And she will light the fire when he gives the signal. A girl with a misunderstanding on her face asks the protagonist what kind of signal this is. The main character points his finger at the right place and tells his partner that if the torch on the other side goes out, she needs to set fire to the entrance. The girl looks at the protagonist with a questioning look. He adds that this matter is not difficult, and if she is distracted and does not see the signal, she can forget about the relic. Lily smiles and agrees. The protagonist uses concealment, after which he becomes transparent, and then approaches the orc's domain. A translucent red-haired girl watches the protagonist. A red-haired girl watches the protagonist from a hill. The main character passes by two guards and thought that among them there is no one who could detect him, unless a stronger enemy appears. Many orcs are standing around the statue. The protagonist thought that the statue was guarded by ten orcs. He takes out a dagger and thought that he could handle them alone. The tip of the dagger shines brightly. The protagonist sees an orc in chains with tattoos and thought that it was the leader of the tribe, a mutant orc. He remembers an orc who tore his clothes and thought that he had demonstrated incredible monstrous strength during the attack of the expedition team. He takes a small stone from the floor and thought that this was a dangerous opponent and it was better to do it as planned. The protagonist threw a stone into the brazier. The frying pan fell to the floor. Lily watches what is happening and thought that this was a signal. Two orcs look around. The orc chieftain points his sword forward and growls, after which many orcs run in that direction. The protagonist with a stern look thought that he would take advantage of the situation to quickly destroy the statue. The orc leader moves very quickly throughout his domain. He appeared behind the main character, who was surprised and thought that the orc had smelled him. The orc put his foot forward and made a cutting attack, and the main character runs away and notices that this orc is strong. He runs with a tense expression on his face and thought that he should retreat. Ordinary orcs put out the fire with buckets of water, and the orc leader pursues the protagonist. The main character made a nervous expression on his face and thought that it was useless to hide now. Lily asked the protagonist if he was noticed. The main character turns his head to the girl and tells her to run away too. He and the red-haired girl talk to each other as the night sky rises above them. They are sitting near a destroyed cart. The protagonist scratches the back of his head and thought that they had not been running for long, but were already exhausted. The red-haired girl opens her eyes wide and says that she knows this place. The main character asks the girl if she was here. She points to the cave near them and tells the protagonist that yes, she came out of there when she passed through the gate. Lily, with a melancholic expression on her face, says that there were those strange guys who tried to catch her, so she ran away. The prosonist thought that she was talking about the people from the Red Kite. He imagines a sword wrapped around a snake and wonders if this is their refuge and who would have thought that they settled next to a tribe of orcs. The main character put his hand on Lily's head and then with his eyes closed and a smile on his face. He thought that this could be used correctly. He opens his eyes and invites the girl to come inside. The girl asks if this is necessary because she doesn't want to go there. The main character turns to her. He points his thumb at the vegetation and tells her to then hide in those bushes and sit quietly, and then asks her to contact him if anything happens. A girl with a walkie-talkie in her hand runs towards the bushes. The protagonist goes inside the cave. He uses concealment, and then becomes translucent. He passes by a man sitting against the wall with a rifle and thought that the red snake was not a small group. He walks along the earthen path and thought that judging by the guards, this is indeed their secret hideout, and then wonders why they decided to settle next to the orcs. The main character sees men in hoods and masks working in a chemical laboratory with many glass containers. He wonders what they are doing. One of the masked men is holding a bag of white powder in his hands, which the protagonist noticed. The protagonist watches them with a wary look and thought that it could be a snake. Snake is a drug created from plants from another world. In the past, many people have become victims of addiction, 
They went crazy and eventually died. For men are fighting, pushing and reaching for a bag of white powder with red smoke emanating from it. The police spent years investigating, but to no avail. The protagonist wonders who would have known that they were hiding in such a place. A man in a black cap and body armor shouts to the masked men in front of him to hurry up, because if they don't fulfill the quota by tomorrow, they're finished. The main character walked past three guards at the entrance, and a man in masks and hoods is walking next to him. He thought that there were a hundred armed members of the Red Viper group and about 30 drug creators. The protagonist looks at the many bags of white powder in the boxes and thought that there was about 50 kilograms of snake. He adds that he doesn't know how much it is in money, but it's definitely more than several trillion won. One man shouts and asks another man what this fool has done, and then asks him if he is laughing at him. A man in a black cap tells a man informal where that demand has increased in recent days and they are running low on supplies. He adds that another fool died yesterday, so the production rate has slowed down. A man in business clothes shouts to him that they told him to hire more workers. The man in the cap apologizes and tells his interlocutor that they try to take those who, even if they die, will not drag them to the bottom. The main character got angry and thought that they were caught and called them vile creatures. Two men in bulletproof vests became wary. The light went out in the room. One of the guards asks what the hell is going on, and the other one screams and asks what's going on. Another guard shouts that he doesn't see anything and asks to turn on the light. One of their guards asks if they really have an uninvited guest. Another member of the organization shouts that the snake is missing. The translucent protagonist carries a box with a kite while members of the organization run around the room. One of the members of the organization notices that the tracks lead outside. A crescent moon rises in the sky. The main character asks Lily where she is. A red-haired girl crawls out of the bushes and asks the protagonist if he is finished. The main character replies that this is just the beginning. He adds that they will be playing catch-up, so she needs to prepare. A red-haired girl with a smile on her face asks the protagonist what kind of catch-up this is. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, replies that many people will run after them. He adds that you just need to not let them catch them. The protagonist carries Lily in a box, and she tells him that it sounds fun. The main character replies that it is dangerous, so she should not make sounds and hide. A man with a machine gun runs out of the cave and shouts that the intruder is here and orders to seize him. The protagonist turns his head a little and says that here are the catchers, and then asks Lily to hide inside the box. He smiles and tells the armed members that he will take the box, and then thanks them. One of the armed men orders to kill the protagonist, after which three people begin to shoot at the main character, who easily dodges the bullets. The main character sighs and thought great, they are running after him. One of the soldiers shouts and asks why they don't hit him. Their commander yells at his subordinates to take aim before firing and then calls them fools. The protagonist came to the orcs with a smug expression on his face. He says that he sees familiar faces. The orc leader shouts loudly and points his sword towards the protagonist, after which his subordinates run towards the protagonist. For machine gunners look at what is happening ahead with concern on their faces. The protagonist tilts the box and tells the red-haired girl to get out, after which she agrees. Dane put his foot forward. He throws the kite box high into the sky. The soldiers shout that he is crazy. Orcs watch a box flying in the sky. The box falls to the floor, after which the powder crumbles. The gray-haired soldier looks at the commander and asks what they will do. The man in the cap commands his subordinates to kill the monsters and take the snake. He adds that later they will deal with this scoundrel. The protagonist sighs and says that it's time to get out of here and uses the hiding skill. The man in the cap commands to kill the orcs and not let them come closer. People are armed. Ed with machine guns begin to shoot at the orcs. The orc chieftain runs, creating a loud noise. The soldier's commander asks his subordinates what they are doing and then commands them to shoot. The orc leader screams and holds the sword behind his back with his hand. One of the soldiers shouts that the bullets cannot penetrate him. The commander orders his soldiers to finish off this gray-haired man first. The orc chief makes a wide attack and cuts one of the soldiers. The commander cursed immediately after this. Lily stands with the protagonist on a hill and asks him when everything will be over, and then adds that she wants to eat. The main character replies that it is not always easy to complete a task. With a serious expression on his face, he looks down and says that the wait won't be long and then asks if it's worth organizing a cleanup now. A man in a cap lies on the ground near the orc chieftain and trembles, and then asks him for mercy. The orc hits the man in the cap. He raises his fist up and shouts menacingly. 
he scrunches face in pain. The protagonist tells the orc leader that he is doing well. He pierced the orc with a dagger in the back and tells him that he dealt with the villains well. He takes out his dagger from the orc's case, after which he sits down on the ground. The protagonist thought that the leader was dead, so the others would not be a hindrance. The rest of the orcs watch what is happening and tremble. The main character thought that they would follow him one after another. The orcs run away from the main character in fear. The protagonist hits the statue with a hammer. The statue cracked from another blow from the protagonist. He thought that the required item had been found. An information window appears, where it says that this is a guardian bracelet. An image of two sparkling bracelets appears in the protagonist's head. He thought that this artifact helps to heal and improve the condition of its wearer. And by consuming mana, he can activate a protective spell. He adds that the effect is enhanced if both bracelets are worn. The main character looks at the bracelet on his hand and thought that it had shrunk to his size. He adds that the mana just spent was restored, as stated in the description. Lily asks the main character if this is a treasure. The main character turns to the girl and replies that yes, this is it, and then asks her to come over. He touches the girl's hand, and a bracelet appears on her. The girl is surprised and asks the protagonist why he did this. The main character replies that he has a protective spell, and then adds that a simple person will not be able to see it. Lily, with reddened cheeks, looks at the sparkling bracelet and asks the protagonist if this is true, and then adds that they have the same bracelets. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, tells the red-haired girl to stop talking, and then asks her to just accept him. Lily looks at her bracelet with a joyful expression on her face, and the protagonist takes out an orc skin and thought that the red-haired girl was still weak. He adds that thanks to the bracelet, he will be able to track her location, which will be useful in case of danger, and then tells her that they will have dinner a little later, because he still needs to return to the cave. The red-haired girl is perplexed, and then asks the protagonist why they are there. The main character shifts his pupils in her direction and tells her that he will explain later. He points his finger at the orc settlement and asks Lily to burn everything there to the ground. The girl asks the protagonist if they will go eat then. The protagonist answers that no, but promises that there will be something tasty. The red-haired girl concentrates the flame over her hands and answers the protagonist with consent. The orc settlement is on fire. Lily puts her hands forward with a menacing expression on her face and shouts that she wants delicious food. The protagonist, with a worried expression on his face, thought that if he starved her, something might come of it. One of the soldiers shouts that an intruder has appeared. Two men shoot with machine guns at the protagonist. A man with brown hair commands to kill the main character. The protagonist puts his hand in front of him and uses the shield skill, which creates a blue barrier in front of him and Lily. He tells the red-haired girl that this barrier is created by the bracelet. He turns his head to the girl and tells her that once she frees herself, she can make it in any shape. The red-haired girl uses the shield skill and an orange barrier is created in front of her. She tells the protagonist to simply hit them with the shield, after which she points the shield forward and hits the two soldiers with it. The protagonist watches what is happening and thought that Lily was talented. The black-haired soldier bows to the protagonist and asks to spare him and then adds that he will tell everything about their group. The main character smiles maliciously and replies that he is not interested, and then asks where the safe is. An hour later, the cave behind the protagonist and the red-haired girl explodes, but the protagonist creates a barrier to cover them. Dayne smiles a little and thought that this was a good secret place, because in addition to money, he received a lot of items. The protagonist turns around and tells his partner that if she has finished blowing everything up, the shield can be removed. The girl asks what if they run away. The main character replies that she doesn't have to worry because they have nowhere to run. The Lily Dome barrier shelters the soldiers. The protagonist thought that there were about 35 Red Viper members and drug manufacturers left. He adds that he will not kill them and will not let them go so easily since they participated in the creation of the snake. The protagonist calls the black-haired soldier a red bean rice cake and then asks him to follow him. The soldier points a finger at himself and asks if we were talking about him. A soldier with a bruise on his mouth asks the protagonist why it was called Red Bean Rice Cake. The protagonist, with an angry expression on his face, tells the soldier that it is because he looks like him, and then tells him that Lily will lead him to the tent. The girl looks at the protagonist with a puzzled look. The main character informs the rest of the soldiers that they will go to the security post and surrender. One of them asks the protagonist if he really won't let them go. Another says they didn't know anything. The protagonist tells them to remain silent and then asked them if they think they were doing something legal. He became angry and his eyes turned red. He tells the frightened soldiers that if they didn't know, 
Then he offers to beat them up so that they find out. One of the soldiers replies that they will surrender. Two guards stand in front of many surrendered soldiers. The first guard asks what this nonsense is, and the second asks whether there are really so many people in the restricted area. The first guard learns about the kite factory and is shocked by this information. The main character looks out from behind a bush and thought that these soldiers would be taken to the police, and they would probably report him and Lily. He adds that he only hopes that the person does not take their testimony seriously. He imagines the image of a muscular man with green streams of energy circulating around him, and then he thought that this is the Titan Kim Suho, with whom he needs to establish a connection in this life. The main character jumped away from the container and thought that the girl did a good job today. She should buy something tasty. Meanwhile, Lily and the red bean rice cake arrived at the tent. An angry girl hits the ground with her hands and feet and shouts that she is very hungry. The black-haired soldier looks at her with a worried expression. With a desperate expression on his face, he says that he doesn't understand what she's saying. The red-haired girl screams that she is hungry. With a dissatisfied expression on her face, she tells the protagonist that he promised her food that tastes like chicken. The protagonist sighs and says that it's delicious. The girl grabs the bag and screams, asking the protagonist if these are his slugs again. The protagonist turns to red bean rice cake. The black-haired guy asks for it to be given to him, and then smiles and begins to grill the meat. The soldier takes a piece of meat with metal tongs. The protagonist imagines two pork cooked to perfection. Then he thought about how they, along with roasted garlic and seasonal green olives, were wrapped in a salad with sesame seeds and a piece of lettuce so they could be eaten in one bite. Lily, with a happy expression on her face, exclaims that this is incredible and delicious. The protagonist, with a worried look on his face, tells the red-haired girl that food is falling out of her mouth and then tells her to chew and then speak. The girl exclaims that the longer she chews, the better the taste. The main character thought that four days passed quickly and it was time to work hard. He adds that over the past time, he has bought land next to his tent with money received from the guild under a contract. The gray-haired man tells the protagonist that the land is certainly cheap, but is he sure that he wants to buy 10,000 payong? The protagonist signs the document and replies that you never know what will happen in the future. He lies on a hammock and says that living in a tent is boring, and the black-haired guy heard these words. Dain thought that the rice and bean pie he brought, thinking that he would be useful, started building a log house. The soldier carries a log and tells the protagonist to entrust it to him. He presses his hand to his chest and says that within three years he will be engaged I. In construction, cooking, cleaning, and other things, all the work is on him. He adds that the protagonist gave him a chance to start over, so from now on he will live by honest work. The main character takes the chopsticks in his hand and answers the soldier that yes, and then tells him to work hard for the next three years. Lily smiles and raises her palm up and then calls the black-haired guy an excellent cook and tells him that she adores him. The soldier cries and agrees with the protagonist. He sits on his knees and holds his head in his hands. The protagonist thought that rice cake was also a eunuch. He adds that he hit him at certain points in the bloodstream so that he could not escape. He adds that as long as martial arts are not available to him, he will not be able to fix this. The main character hammers a nail into a log, and the protagonist thought that he planned to use him as labor for three years and then give him some money and let him go. Guild Headquarters White House The black-haired girl winks at the protagonist and tells him that she will be a temporary assistant to the seventh team. She says that the protagonist's team is new, so they need an experienced person, and then asks the protagonist if he agrees with this. The protagonist puts his hand forward and asks the girl if she is sure that she will stay temporarily, and will she really put someone in her place. The girl replies that of course, because she is busy. She hands the protagonist a book, and tells him that his official assignment will begin tomorrow, and today he just needs to remember everything that is written in these documents. The protagonist, with a shocked expression on his face, thought that he should have rested more in those three days. The document contains a description of the task to destroy the gate, which is called the Labyrinth of Fallen Spirits. Location Soul, Type B, Underground. The main character asks if this is a task to destroy the gate. He says that in his contract, there is a clause that he will not take on tasks that take a lot of time and asks if this is true. Yun Havai, with a joyful expression on his face, tells the protagonist that it came to them from the government a couple of days ago, and four guilds are participating in it. She adds that the government estimates the cleanup will take two days, and then reveals that the protagonist's team is the only one with space on the schedule. The main character sighs and thought that the government's calculations should not be trusted. Monster gates are divided into two types. A-type slime appears from the gate 
and then the gate closes. Such gates close after monsters emerge from them, which can be easily killed. B-type and orange gate appears. These gates do not disappear after monsters have come out of them, which in principle may not come out. In this case, someone must go inside, kill the monsters, and destroy the core in order to return. On the way to the large gate, there are many torches. This task is called a task to destroy the gate. The protagonist holds documents in his hand and thought that he recognized this place. He imagines many chains and thought that this was one of the most catastrophic gates that appeared after the first. Labyrinth of Fallen Spirits Near the stairs, there are many huge spikes. The main character thought that before going back in time, he was an instructor and always mentioned this place for its notorious fame. He closed his eyes a little and thought that if he had taken part in this task then, he would have died. Yun Vi tells the protagonist that he recently had a clash with another guild and then asks him if he wants her to transfer the task to someone else. The main character sighs and replies that the seventh team will deal with him. The girl tells the protagonist that no matter what happens, you need to remain calm and not lose your composure. The protagonist sighs and agrees with the girl, and then asks her if she thinks he'll throw a tantrum or something. Sunlight falls on blue and white buildings. The black-haired girl closes her eyes and answers the protagonist that yes, he is capable of this. Dayin looks out the window and thought that to clear this gate, he would need a strong tank. He adds that since hiring Gu Ho took longer than expected due to the termination fee, he will have to go pick him up himself. A black car is driving along the road. A blonde driver in formal attire bows to the protagonist and tells him to take care of himself. The main character with a serious expression on his face tells the driver that there is no need to do this in the future. He adds that he is grateful to him for driving him around. The driver straightens his back and, with open eyes, agrees with the protagonist. Yoon Hvai, with a joyful expression on his face, tells the protagonist that he has now proven himself to be cool. Lily opens her eyes wide when she sees a large building in front of her. The protagonist tells Yoon Hvai that they need to get down to business. He thought that it was uncomfortable and strange for him to be around honest and kind people, and then he thought that he preferred to be in the company of aggressive and rude worm. As an example, he cites the guys from the Black Hound Guild with whom he worked in a past life. A black-haired man in a red jacket puts his hand forward and tells the protagonist that he is glad to meet you and then introduces himself as Kim Hyun, they from the Black Hound Guild. He introduces the brown-haired man behind him as Gu Ho and the man next to him as his team captain Suk Hyun. The protagonist shakes Hyundai's hand and tells him that he is also glad to meet you, and then informs him that his name is Dayin. He adds that he has heard about him. Six negotiators are sitting at a table. Lily eats sweets. The man in the red jacket crosses his arms and asks the protagonist if he wants to take Guho with him. He looks at the protagonist drinking a drink from his mug and tells him that, however, he is their valuable employee. The protagonist thought that Hyun, they was the guild master's younger cousin and the one who did all the dirty work. He thought with a wary look that he might set outrageous conditions for the cancellation of the contract. Yoon Havai clenches his hand into a fist and tells Hyun they that they understand their position on this issue. But five billion for terminating the contract is too much. The man replies that there are not five billion there at all, and it looks like they haven't been told yet. He says with an ominous expression that Gu Ho renewed his contract with them this morning. He reports that according to the new conditions, the cost of termination is ten billion. Univai was shocked by this information. Hyun they adds that if they pay this amount, they will give them Mr. Gu Ho. The protagonist gets up from his chair and thought that he was deliberately provoking them so that they would start arguing. He adds that secret filming is probably underway. He tells Univai that they need to leave. The protagonist thought that she was the daughter of the head of the guild and was easy to manipulate. The girl with a nervous expression wants to object, but Hyun they interrupts her. He hugs Gu Ho and asks the people in front of him if they're already leaving, and then adds that Dae In himself asked to give it away, but it seems that he doesn't need it that much. The villain tells the protagonist group that if they change their minds, they should let him know. On the table are plates of sweets that Lily ate. Hyun they says it looks like the girl liked the cake, so they better take her to the hospital. He adds that the cake is long expired. The girl looks at Hyun, they with a puzzled expression. The protagonist slaps the man in the face and calls him a scoundrel. Suk Hyun raises his fist and shouts, asking the protagonist if he has gone crazy. The main character makes several attacks on him. He looks his enemy in the face with an angry look and swung his leg. He hits Suk Hyun, who then pushes away and breaks down the door. One of the two guards runs into the room with a knife and shouts, asking what is happening. The protagonist tells the guards that if they want to attack him, they should think again, 
and then ask them if they are sure that Suk Hyun is stronger. The angry protagonist says that's enough nonsense, and then asks to call him the head of the guild. He thought that since they so wanted him to fall for the provocation, then let them get what they wanted. One of the guards calls the captain. Yoon Hvai, with a small smile on his face, puts his hands together and shouts to the protagonist that even if he is angry, there is no need to treat them like that. The protagonist asks if he or she looks pleased. Lily, with a misunderstanding on her face, asks the protagonist why he beat those who gave her the cake. The main character replies that she has nothing to worry about, just that next time she should not eat what strangers give. The girl with a calm expression on her face looks at the protagonist and is silent. Dane tells her that from now on he will ask Rice Cake to stop her, and the girl agrees. The main character thought that they probably lied about the cake, since everything was fine with her, but that doesn't matter now. He approaches Gu Ho and addresses him. With a furious expression on his face, he tells the guy that he will talk to him later, after which he trembles with fear. The protagonist and Lily were surprised because they felt an ominous aura nearby. Someone entered the room, and the protagonist thought that judging by the murderous energy, the head of the guild was coming here. Demon King Kim, they Jean. A man with red eyes in a coat entered the room. Streams of red energy emanate from it. The protagonist thought that this man was one of the first awakened ones. He gives off a lot of dark red aura and asks the protagonist if he call. Ed him, and then says that he is waiting for an explanation. The main character thought that this man was acting as if he did not know what was happening here, although he himself was watching through the cameras. He waved his hand, getting rid of the aura nearby, and tells the head of the guild that he will explain everything, but the rest must leave. Yoon Hvai turns to the protagonist with concern. They Jean tells the protagonist that he is a loyal comrade, and then says that it is good if he is ready to take full responsibility. The protagonist closed his eyes and put his hand forward, and then tells Lily to follow his aunt and wait for him at the headquarters. A wide-eyed girl asks the protagonist if she can burn this place to the ground. The main character pulls her cheek and with an angry expression tells her not to be stupid because if she plays with fire without his permission, then she will never get fried chicken again. Lily exclaims that she doesn't want this. Dayin sits at the table opposite the head of the guild and asks him what they need from him. Dejean takes something out from under his coat and tells the protagonist that he will ask directly. He asks the protagonist if he would like to work for him. The main character puts his hands together and with a serious expression on his face, asks the head of the guild in response if they want him to defect to them, and then says that for this he will have to pay a huge amount of money to terminate the contract. They Jean, with a grim smile, tells the protagonist that he is not asking him to leave the guild. He moves his hand to the side and tells the protagonist that he can work for the White House, and then says that he will just need to give him information from time to time. The protagonist asks the guild leader if he wants him to spy. They Jean tells the protagonist that he promises the payment will be generous, and then informs him that he should read the contract himself because the offer is simply excellent. The protagonist holds the document in his hand and asks the head of the guild what will happen if he refuses. They Jean moves both hands to the sides and is enveloped in a dark red aura, and then he tells the protagonist that then he will have to pay for what he did here. He adds that if he suddenly goes too far, the main character may end up missing an arm or two. An angry Chan Sung shouts that They Jean is a scoundrel and asks him to return Day In to him. He, with a spear in his hand, shouts towards the building and shouts to the villain that if he does not do this in 10 seconds, he will break in, and then asks They Jean if he can hear him. He begins the report, but the protagonist interrupts him, asking what he is doing. The guild leader turns around and tells the protagonist that Yun Havai said that he was locked there. He remembers how she said with a nervous expression what the guys from the Black Hound did. The protagonist asks if this is true, and then says that he offered them his sincere apology, and they accepted it. He holds the packages in his hands with a smile on his face, and says that it seems that they were won over by his sincerity. He thought that they even gave him a gift. The protagonist asks the guild master with a smug smile, before he continues to allow it to be noted that his relationship with his daughter-in-law is quite close. He asks him if anything will happen if this becomes known to the public. The protagonist moves his hand to the side and tells they Jean that the nature of his relationship with his younger brother's wife, and if this is permissible, he could investigate himself. The guild leader gritted his teeth and asked the protagonist how he knew about this. The protagonist tells him that if he wants to keep the secret, he should consider his offer. They Jean is shaking with an angry expression on his face, and the protagonist says that firstly, Gu Ho should be released without paying tax for terminating the contract, and the amount for his silence is written here. The main character thought that before he went back in time, Dae Jean had an affair with his younger brother's wife for decades. He adds that in the end they were caught, 
the younger brother and his wife tragically committed suicide, and the head of the guild left the service due to shock. The protagonist thought that they Jean would probably want to, so he remained silent, no matter the cost. Chan Sung sits on the sofa and shouts to the protagonist and Lily, who were sitting on another sofa, that this scoundrel is cunning, he would never just let them go. He asked them to be honest, and then he will deal with them personally. Sitting on another sofa, Yun Vi asks the head if it's true that this is not his goal. The head of the guild put his hand to the back of his head and wants to say what he meant, but the girl interrupts him and with a dissatisfied expression on her face says that he should be grateful that nothing happened. The main character looks at Lily and thought that today she is being quieter than usual. He smiles and asks the girl if she is convinced and then pats her on the head and tells her that he said that it is not necessary to solve all problems with fire. The girl with a dissatisfied expression on her face says that she is hungry. Yoon Vi, with a smile on his face, tells the protagonist that the situation is not the most favorable and she must be in shock. The main character asks her if this is true. With a joyful expression on his face, he asks Lily if she would mind having chicken for dinner. He thinks that he left her aside and adds that if the guild had been their priority, they would not have come to the rescue. He imagined images of Chan Sung and Yoon Havai and thought that his joining the White House turned out to be a very smart decision. Gu Ho with a backpack on his back greets the protagonist, and he tells him that he has arrived early. The brown-haired guy bows to the protagonist and apologizes for what happened yesterday, and then reveals that Hyun they begged him to renew his contract. The protagonist points to a chair and tells the guy to sit there. He tells him that they sorted out the documents yesterday, and from that day on he is the tank of their team and then asks to call in commander. Gu Ho, with concern on his face, tells the commander that he is obeying him. The protagonist hands a glass of drink to the tank. Gu Ho drinks from a glass, and the protagonist, looking at him, thought that Gu Ho grew up in an orphanage. He is an introvert and cold in communicating with people, which is why the black hound treated him like a weakling. He adds that he died when the first disaster happened. Gu Ho asks the protagonist why such a serious commander like him chose such an untalented tank like him. The main character with a serious expression on his face tells the guy that this is because he needs him. Gu Ho closes his eyes and his hands turn to stone and then he says that he tells the protagonist what he should tell him in case he didn't know what his specialty was. The main character touches Gu Ho's shoulder and tells him to freeze and the guy replies that he obeys. The protagonist imagines a huge stone giant called the Moving Fortress Min Cole. He thought that in 10 years, Gu Ho would become a supernatural hero who was respected by everyone. He thought that Min Cole was a petrification specialist like Gu Ho, and then adds that he saw a piece of stone that Min Cole created when he was still a novice. He knocks on the chest of the tank and thought that Gu Ho's body is much stronger and now, having checked it personally, he is finally convinced of this. The protagonist, with a smile on his face, points his finger at the guy and thought that his ability to petrify was superior to Min Cole's ability. He tells Gu Ho that one year, or even six months, and he will become the top tank of Seoul. Surprised, Gu Ho exclaims that this cannot happen. The protagonist closes his eyes and tells the guy that he called himself a mediocre tank and therefore he will give him the talent that he denies. Gu Ho imagines the protagonist in a toga, holding his hand forward with a smile on his face. Rice cake appears behind the tank with a ladle, which informs the protagonist that what he asked for is ready. Gu Ho presses his fist to his chest. He is touched by the protagonist's words. The main character informs the soldier that he is on time, and then asks him to bring everything here. On the table is a purple soup made from the monster's organs and inner core. The protagonist says that there are three plates for each and insists that they eat everything. Gu Ho is scared. Rice Cake is surprised and wonders if he needs to eat too, and a shocked Lily says that she will refuse. The main character says that they will prepare to go to the labyrinth of fallen spirits for four days. The white lion roars loudly. Two days later, the location of the monster hunting mission. The main character waves his daggers in front of the white lion. Gu Ho behind him covers himself with his hands. The protagonist points his finger at the guy and shouts at him that he is a tank and he needs to stop being afraid. Gu Ho replies that he is sorry, and the protagonist replies that if he is sorry, then he should protect them properly. The tank agrees with the protagonist and makes a dash towards the white lion. The main character raises his daggers up and shouts to Gu Ho to come as close as possible and immobilize him. His hands turn to stone. The protagonist thought that for two days, Gu Ho ate three bowls of manorich soup along with five dishes for training. The tank grabbed the white lion, and the protagonist thought that the result of training to enhance petrification was not yet ready. The white lion strikes the tank's back and roars. 
Gu Ho clenched his teeth and exclaimed that he was in pain. The main character tells the guy to hold out for another minute, and, if he fails, he will eat six bowls of manna-rich soup. Frightened, Gu Ho shouts that he doesn't want to do this. The protagonist thought that the peculiarity of petrification is that the more a person breaks, the stronger he becomes, so Gu Ho must be broken. He adds that it has been scientifically proven that this method is suitable for training. The protagonist turns his head to Lily and tells her that it is now her turn. The girl turns around and with an angry expression on her face, tells the protagonist that she is not going to do this because she has to eat disgusting food every day and he does not buy her chicken. The main character says that today there will be chicken for dinner and Lily, with an appetite on her face, creates a fiery clot of energy and shouts to Guho to leave because he might get hurt. A powerful flame is directed towards the monster. The defeated white lion lies in front of Gu Ho. The protagonist sighs and tells Lily that she turned him into a piece of coal, so she won't be able to take a sample. And since she can't control the fire, then she won't see the chicken. The girl, with a shocked expression on her face, replies that she doesn't want this. Gu Ho stands behind them and thought it was amazing she defeated that monster with one blow. Lily exclaims that Hogu tried his best and offers the protagonist some chicken to eat. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, asks her why she calls him Hogu. Lily tells him that he was the first to call him that. The protagonist asks if this is true, and then rests his chin and asks the dispatcher to check the location of the other monsters. He thought that eight one-horned white lions had come out of the gate 20 minutes ago. They needed to fight one more to get the sample. The controller replies that the target is seven hours away from them, and it is moving. The protagonist instantly jumps up and replies that he accepted the information. The dispatcher tells the protagonist that the Warrior's Guild is closer to him than he is, so she thinks that he will not make it. The voice of the protagonist comes from the White House blip on the radar, asking what the difference in distance is. Nearby is a mark with a Warrior Guild bowl. The dispatcher tells the protagonist that he is two kilometers away, and they are a kilometer away. The main character tells Lily that he will run ahead and let them follow him as quickly as possible and then asks her to take care of Hogu. The girl tells the protagonist that he called him Hogu again. The protagonist thought that this was already a habit. He speeds up and smoke appears behind him. Blue streams of energy circulate near the main character and he thought that he was also training with the others and eating food rich in mana. He adds that he has not reached the level that was before the revival, but has progressed significantly. Several men run towards the white lion. The protagonist runs past a black man and says that this monster is his. The surprised man asks what happened now. He commands his partners to prepare magic, hurry up, and attack him. The main character looks back and thought that if they hit first, there would be problems with dividing the spoils. He used the crescent moon body shadow technique. He makes a long and fast jump towards the enemy. He swings a dagger at the monster. He hits the monster. He holds his back and says that he feels discomfort in it. The warriors watching him say that this is impossible, and is he really a superman with acceleration? Otherwise, he would not be so fast. The main character reports via communicator that the hunt is over. The black-haired girl dispatcher replies that, however, the map shows that he has just arrived. The protagonist replies that it doesn't matter and asks the girl if there is anyone else nearby. And the dispatcher replies that yes, in the south. Lily, with a smug expression on her face, asks the protagonist if she fried him properly this time and if there will be chicken for dinner today. The protagonist tells the girl that yes, a sample can be collected from him. The dispatcher reports that there are no more monsters, the gates have been destroyed, and the situation has returned to normal. The protagonist puts his hand to his cheek and tells Gu Ho and Lily that they are finished, and then adds that their seventh team did a great job. Two silver-haired men walk towards the protagonist, a long-haired man with glasses and a guy in an orange jacket. The man with glasses calls the protagonist the commander and asks him if he is wounded. Support squad, head of the Chion IL Nam medical team. The main character replies that he is fine, only Lily needs to bandage his hand. A guy in an orange sweater with a smile on his face tells the protagonist that he is finished with the video and asks him to take a look. Support squad, head of the film crew Chion Inam. The protagonist looks at the tablet that the guy shows him and says that it looks like a scene from a movie. Behind the protagonist stands a blue-haired guy with goggles on his forehead who asks him to raise his hands. Support squad, head of technical support team Chion Sola. The protagonist imagines the image of a smiling Yun Havai and thought that she hired the three Chion twins to support the seventh team and each of them is famous and works in their own field. He adds that how she did it remains a secret. 
The protagonist turns to the other three team members and tells them that they haven't been working together for long, so he hasn't learned their names yet and they shouldn't be offended. He then reveals that he knows how difficult it is to cooperate with superhumans. He adds that when he returns from the upcoming trip to the dungeon, he will definitely reward them additionally and give them time off. The main character smiles and tells his team members to take care of him from now on. Enam closes his eyes and smiles, and then tells the protagonist that he is the best, and he filmed his speech. Sol Ah covers his face with his hand and asks the protagonist if this is true. The main character thought that when he returned from the labyrinth of fallen spirits, the guild would need to reward him. A crack appears on the white background. He adds that, of course, he must endure a proportionate amount of trouble, but without going into detail yet. The protagonist driver sits behind the wheel and asks him, sitting in the back seat, that he seems to be popular. The main character closes his eyes and says that he knows what it's like to serve and then thought that before he was the one who followed orders. He imagines a hand controlling him with strings like a puppet and then thought that he left the guild because he was tired of it but the people on his team wouldn't have to feel the same way. Guild Headquarters White House. Univai closed his eyes and smiles, and then tells the commander that he knows how to communicate with people and asks him if he is accidentally living his life for the second time. The protagonist, with a serene expression on her face, replies that she needs to stop joking and should get down to business, and then says that she said that they have a lot to discuss. The girl handed the main character a tablet board with documents and tells him that this is a list of items that he will need. She adds that the special equipment they ordered from the workshop will be ready in two days. The main character replies that he is glad to hear and calls Yoon Havai the responsible assistant of the seventh team. He thought that they had little time, but she prepared everything perfectly. The protagonist turns the document to the next page. Yoon Havai asks the protagonist if this is the person he was interested in. She adds that she expected it to be difficult to find information because she had nothing but a name, but on the internet she came across a video of objects he made. The main character looks at a photograph of a black-haired guy next to his mother playing with a typewriter and says that yes, it's him. He thought that this is the only Superman in Korea with a specialization in the field of manufacturing. This is Jang Young Shin. The protagonist puts the tablet on the table and asks the girl where he is and then wonders if it's worth going to him now. Lily, dressed in a beret and a shirt with a yellow bow, tells the protagonist not to forget that he needs four servings of boneless chicken and large french fries. The protagonist walks down the street with her and replies that it's good, he will keep his promise, and she needs to convey everything exactly as he taught her. Lily agrees with the protagonist with a joyful expression on her face. The main character and her go into the hairdresser, where they are greeted. Dayeen tells the brown-haired girl who cuts his hair that they have a lot of toys here. The girl replies that her son likes to do different things. Lily sits on the couch and says that she is bored, and the protagonist tells her to sit quietly. The girl asks what it is, and then remarks that it is so cute. The protagonist, who has already had his hair done, with a worried look on his face, tells Lily not to touch anything, otherwise she will break it. The girl hugs a toy chicken in her hands and exclaims that this is the same chicken that she likes so much. The brown-haired girl says that her son made this toy, and they can take it if they like it. The protagonist apologizes, and then says that his little cousin is a real imp. The brown-haired girl smiles and replies that it's okay. They have a lot of toys. The main character asks her how old her son is. The woman replies that she is 13. The protagonist thought that young Shin, the son of a hair salon owner, had savant syndrome. The protagonist remembers a photograph of a boy and his mother, and then thinks that savant syndrome is a rare condition in which individuals with developmental disability ES have outstanding abilities in one or more areas of knowledge. The main character thought that because of this, his social skill is very low and he does not particularly like to talk to people. He looks at himself in the mirror and thought that unlike other superhumans, he should bond with young Shin very naturally. He adds that firstly, you need to come here more often. The woman tells the protagonist that even now he is probably creating another thing in the closet. The protagonist asks if this is true and then says that he hopes they don't distract him with their loud conversations. Young Shin sits among books and tools, assembling some kind of device. The woman replies to the protagonist that this is nothing. He is so concentrated that he does not notice anything. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, thought that they were not communicating in a whisper, so he could hear them if he was a superman. He wonders if it's worth checking out now. Young Shin clutched the screwdriver in his hand. He leaves the room and asks his mother if everything is okay. The woman asks him why he suddenly came out on his own. The main character thought that since he came out immediately, he could sense mana. He adds that he is definitely a superman. 
Lily made a wary expression on her face and thought it was time, because it was time for the chicken plan. With a smile on her face, she pokes the chicken at Young Shin and asks him if he made it and how it turned out, and then says that it is incredibly cute. The boy, with concern on his face, asks the girl if she is curious, and she answers yes. Lily, with reddened cheeks, puts her hands together and with admiration on her face tells Young Shin that this is amazing and he is incredible. The boy's cheeks turn red and he says that there is nothing special here. Lily says that's cool, then says that she likes chickens and asks if he likes chickens. Young Shin replies that he prefers pizza. The main character looks at them and thought that Lily was still a little uncertain in speaking Korean, but she was trying. The black-haired boy says that he has a lot of different things and then asks if he can show them. There is bewilderment on the protagonist's face. Lily asks the boy if this is true, and then exclaims that it would be interesting to see. The hairdresser, with a surprised expression on his face, says that he cannot believe that young Shin spoke to someone. The protagonist thought that this little guy really fell in love with her. Lily sits opposite the black-haired boy in his room. The main character thought that they had got a guy who would create equipment for superhumans worth hundreds of billions. He imagines young Shin sticking his hand out in front of him, a robot behind him, and Lily exclaiming that there are four servings of boneless chicken waiting for her. The main character thought that Young Shin became a member of the guild immediately the next day and created uniforms for battles. A few days later, the main character in a white robe says that it's true, the skin of the Yuruk leader is perfect for the uniform, and then asks Lily how she likes the new clothes. A girl dressed in a green jacket and pants exclaims that the uniform is comfortable and beautiful. She is happy that she has chicken and pizza embroidered on her sleeves. She remembers how young Shin knitted a sweater, and while embroidering on it, he thought that Lily liked chicken, and he liked pizza. Guho approaches the protagonist about the uniform, and he says with a stern expression that he doesn't need it. He thought that he had done everything that could be done in a short time. Univai says that the support squad reported that they have completed preparations and need to move out immediately. The protagonist turns the group towards the group members and tells them it's time to go. Univai closes his eyes and smiles, and then asks the protagonist if he has a new style. She says it must be difficult to maintain the hairstyle. The protagonist with disheveled hair made a dissatisfied expression on his face, and thought that it was not surprising that there were no clients in the hairdresser. Univai shouts and asks someone what he is talking about, and what it means that the other guild entered first. A portal appears in the middle of the road. The man tells the girl that he let them in because they said the line had changed and he would be late. Yunvai shouts and asks the brown-haired guy what he said. The main character thought that four guilds would take part in a joint task. He imagined a White House tiger emblem of two swords and a shield, a warrior's guild bull emblem, a red shark guild shark emblem, and a black hound guild wolf emblem. He thought that at first glance, it was clear that these three guilds were trying to mock them. The protagonist closes his eyes and tells Yunvai and the brown-haired guy that their showdown won't change anything, and so they'll just go on as planned. The girl turns away with a nervous expression and says that even if they leave now, there is unlikely to be anything left there. She apologizes and then says that she should have been better prepared. The protagonist claps his hands and suggests not to get upset ahead of time, and then adds that who knows, maybe they will be able to find something better. There are traces of blood under the car. The protagonist says that they swept everything clean, and Sola replies that it's okay. It's a dungeon. Three cars are driving along the road two hours after entering the labyrinth of fallen spirits. The protagonist with a serious expression on his face thought that he was going to give them a lift, but they missed their chance. Behind him, Sol A thought with a smile on his face that rest was good. The main character thought that it didn't matter, they would meet again. An image of many circuits appears. The protagonist thought that at first the difficulty level of the labyrinth of fallen spirits was B, but it increased after several unsuccessful attempts to close the dungeon, which eventually became the worst. He became wary and told everyone to stop. He says that there is something there and then commands Gu Ho to stay here and protect the machines. The protagonist walks ahead of the stopped cars. In the dark passage, there are many cracks on the walls. The main character thought that the reason the dungeon is called the Labyrinth of Fallen Spirits is because it turns people who enter it into monsters. Sol A and Inam are confused by what they saw. Three zombies in red clothes are walking towards the protagonist's group. The main character thought that judging by the clothes, these could be members of the Red Shark. He looks at the long-haired dead man and thought that it looks like they were bitten by zombies because their fangs are sharp enough to break through the fighting uniform. He adds that this probably happened when they relaxed and let down their guard. He suggests that perhaps they have separated from the rest of the guild 
which is why there are not many of them. The protagonist stops and orders Gu Ho to go and show them the results of his training. Tank points a finger at himself and with concern on his face asks if he will really go alone. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, says that if they scratch them, they will be infected. Gu Ho says that then he can't be bitten either. The protagonist pushes him and tells him not to be a coward. Gu Ho raises his fist and runs towards the zombies, who are reaching out to him. His hands and part of his face turn to stone, and he says that he will try. The protagonist thought that his petrified state was better than during training. He tells him that he understands that he should not kill them. Gu Ho asks with a worried expression what to do then. The protagonist tells him that he must come up with it himself. The tank hits one of the zombies on the head. Gu Ho exclaims with a happy expression that he was able to hit. Lily sighs and says she's bored, then asks the protagonist if they can just burn them. The protagonist watches the battle and tells the girl that these people are not only civilians, but also members of another guild, so she should not think about killing them. He asks the support squad how they are doing. He, with a camera in his hands, exclaims that he is already recording everything. The protagonist says that they are using these materials to demand compensation, so he should film everything properly. Sol, ah, with sets of clothes in his hands, says that he has finished preparing repellent suits. The protagonist replies that they will quickly deal with the enemies and put them on. Il Nam, with a bag in his hand, reports that he brought the antidote that the main character entrusted to him. The protagonist replies that this is great because this is the main thing in such a dungeon. The protagonist's gaze looks stern. Gu Ho blocks the zombies that surrounded him. The main character thought that the members of the Red Shark support squad easily fell ill, but there were problems with the rest. Two zombies simultaneously strike the tank, which ends up gritting its teeth in pain. The protagonist thought that judging by the movements of these two zombies, they were superhumans. He hits one of the zombies on the back of the head with two fingers and says that he knocked out the first one. He quickly moves behind another zombie and hits him in the back of the head and then says that he knocked out the second one. He makes a few more hits and then counts the third and fourth zombies. Guho asks with a surprised expression how the protagonist does it so easily. Dayin, standing among the defeated enemies, counts the fifth zombie, looks around, and then asks if there is anyone else. He tells the group that everything is done now, they have done it. He closes his eyes and tells the tank to arrange them in a row. Guho AC accepts the protagonist's order with an admiring expression on his face. The protagonist imagined a bag with many jars of yellow liquid and thought that among the things he had prepared for going to the labyrinth of fallen spirits this time, there was an outstanding antidote against zombie poison. He imagines a wasp and thought that after being bitten by a zombie, a person has 10 minutes, and when the time is up, he will begin to behave inappropriately, and after another half an hour, the person will become a worker who protects the zombie hive. He imagines dark images of zombies. He pours liquid from a jar into one of the defeated zombies and thought that it could be accurately determined that more than half an hour had passed since their treatment. So even after drinking the antidote, they would continue to have problems with their minds for some time. The protagonist turns to Lily, Gu Ho, and Inam, and then tells them to step aside because he needs to concentrate. The protagonist, with an ominous smile, tells the frightened guys lying on the ground that he saved them and therefore they should help too. The protagonist with a syringe in his hand thought that those who have talent can concentrate on it and improve it, but with the increase in the survival rate, people like him should acquire several abilities. He adds that it was for this reason that in his past life he traveled through different dimensions. Continent of Gaia In front of the castle there is a bridge that is located over the river. Murim A large staircase leads to a building with a curved roof. Underworld Purple light falls on a building located among the rocks. A clock appears among many gears. Continent of Byron. The protagonist thought that he was able to survive thanks to the magical and martial arts he learned during his travels. He blew the whistle and thought that one of the things he picked up from there was a technique for controlling animals with low intelligence levels. The main character informs the members of the Red Shark Guild that from now on they will fight with them. He asked them if they understood. The recovered men smiled joyfully. The main character, with a small smile on his face, tells the guys that since they agree, they can start hunting zombie bees and listen to his orders. He commands them to go forward. Tired Gu Ho, in a closed yellow suit size. He shouts to the protagonist that he has caught the queen bees, but there are too many of them around. Behind him, three more people in suits are fighting, while he himself is carrying a box. The protagonist tells the tank that he is great. The main character looks at Lily and tells her to burn them so they can eat later. The girl agrees with the order, and forms a fireball above herself. She puts her hands forward, and a powerful flame appears, 
and Gu Ho runs next to her. The protagonist says that he did not expect the members of the Red Shark to actively assist them. A volleyball bounces off the wall. Sol Ah watches Lily and the guys in red clothes playing with a sword and then asks the commander if he did anything suspicious with them. The protagonist crosses his arms and says that they told him that they would be happy to help in order to repay him. The main character put his hand out to the side and says that they have finished checking the anti-insect suit so they can move forward. The brown-haired guy standing next to Lily agrees with the protagonist's words. Dayin tells his group to stop because someone is coming this way. Someone in boots is walking on the stone floor. Three muscular men in black sweatshirts appear ahead. Lily exclaims that these are the guys she saw with the slugs. The protagonist silently looks at them with a wary gaze. The Warriors Guild is in action. Five guys in black sweaters and Lily are playing with a volleyball. The protagonist sighs and straightens his hair and then says that he hopes they are also grateful and ready to correct their mistakes. He wonders what's going on with a serious expression on his face and then notices that everything is simpler than he expected. Fourth day in the dungeon. Inam, with a box in his hand, tells the protagonist that the monsters made their way to the supplies and ate them. The protagonist puts his hand forward and asks to let him look. He reports that judging by the tracks, they should still be nearby. Lily blows the whistle. Members of the Warriors Guild and Red Sharks run towards the Red Rats. The main character looks at Lily, who is petting one of the warriors, who is sitting like a dog. He thought that it was even easier for him because she liked to control them. Nearby lie defeated red-eyed poison mice. Or what's left of them? The main character closes his eyes and bows his head. He thought that he had prepared for different situations, but everything was going smoothly, but he should not let his guard down. He adds that the boss-level monsters are still around here somewhere. Red smoke flies between the columns. There are several zombies in black and red clothes standing in the room. A bat holds a mirror in its horns. Demonic Mirror Bat. The protagonist thought that this was the intermediate boss. He commands his team to prepare for battle and then orders them to leave the vehicles behind and tells Gu Ho to advance. He blows a whistle, after which fighters from the Warriors Guild and Red Sharks run towards the enemies. The protagonist thought that he had brainwashed the Red Sharks and the Warriors, so the mirror would not work on them. He thought that this monster shows illusions to everyone who looks in the mirror, making them his minions. Three men with malicious smiles run towards the protagonist's group. The protagonist thought that the rest of his team should be careful. The main character yells at Gu Ho not to look in his mirror. Tank, with concern on his face, wants to say something in a trembling voice, and the protagonist and Lily shout at him that he is a coward and a brat. The main character commands the girl to make a shield out of fire so that the enemies do not pass through. The protagonist moves his hand to the side and commands everyone to move away at least two kilometers, and he will collect some information and join them. He points at the cars as people from the Warriors Guild, and the Red Sharks run towards them. Lily, with fiery clots above her hands, asks the protagonist if it's worth burning everything here. The protagonist replies that normally he would agree, but for now she should turn off the fire. He uses concealment. He, with Lily in his hands, passes by Gu Ho who does not understand where he has gone. The girl crossed her arms and thought that Gu Ho was a cowardly fool. The main character, with a wary look, wonders where the bat is. He takes out three daggers from his pocket. He throws daggers at the bat, but misses. There is an orange light coming from the bat's mirror. The main character thought that concealment did not work for him. He closes Lily's eyes and thought that the enemy was flying from side to side and not straight, so it's worth moving away for now to understand how he moves. Inam addresses the commander. He tells him with a smile on his face that he is back. Behind him stands Sola, and in front of him Il Nam asks the protagonist if he is injured. The main character puts his hand forward and says that he will explain to everyone what to do, and then adds that there is little time so they should hurry. A bat flies along a dark corridor. The main character turns around and commands the technical support squad to retreat. Someone from the support team shouts that the fortification is complete and they are retreating. The protagonist commands them to prepare for battle. Members of the Warriors and Red Shark Guild stand behind metal shields. The bat opens its mouth wide. Two zombies raise their hands, and one of them screams. Zombies attack shields behind which friendly guild members are hiding. The main character jumped off the floor. He hits the bat. The monster dodged the protagonist's attack. The protagonist calls Lily. The girl put on sunglasses and directs fireballs at the bat. The monster dodges fireballs. Lily clenched her teeth in anger. The bat laughs maliciously. The protagonist uses the shield skill. 
after which a barrier is formed near the monster. The protagonist jumps and attacks the monster, but the bat dodges. Lily forms a shield under the protagonist's feet. He looks at the enemy and thought that no matter how fast his movements are, he will see how much he can dodge the attacks. The protagonist swings a dagger at a bat. He makes a quick swipe at the bat and cuts off its head. The main character smiles maliciously and says that he will take the mirror for himself. He says that the end has come. Nearby, there is a blue gate with horns sticking out of the wall. The main character commands not to let down his guard just because they just got here. Cured people push the gate. Lily, with concern on her face, asks the protagonist how long the little coward will remain like this. Gu Ho behind them put his hand to the back of his head, thinking that this was nothing. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, says that he plans to leave him alone until they defeat the boss. He adds that he has a feeling that otherwise he will be brainwashed again. Behind the gate, someone in a hood is standing in the middle of the hall. It is a skeleton with blue flames coming from its eyes. He took a closer look at the protagonist group. Spirit Hunter, a skeleton in armor and with a sword in his hand, says something in an unknown language. The main character blows a whistle. Many healed guild members with Guho in the vanguard run towards the enemy. Tank asks the skeleton if he's one of his fans. The skeleton opens its mouth and screams. Guho's hands and part of his face turn to stone, after which he says that hugs are always welcome. He makes a blow to the guy, but he covers himself with stone hands and blocks the attack. Guho called the skeleton a hater with a worried expression on his face. The skeleton draws his sword back. The main character thought that Guho was a little shy, but he was holding up well. He adds that this is the moment he trained for. Members of other guilds surround the skeleton. The skeleton screams, after which a large blue circle appears on the floor. He used Spirit Link, a long-range spell that turns those nearby into puppets. The main character, with a small smile on his face, thought that this spell would not work on them. Two guys from the Warriors Guild are hitting the enemy from behind. An orange glow emanates from the mirror on the back of the protagonist's hand, and he thought that the mirror of the defeated demonic mirror bat and his little trick keeps them brainwashed, so the spirit connection is useless. Gu Ho is enveloped in red streams of energy, and he thinks with a joyful expression that it is so wonderful to be a celebrity. The surprise skeleton turns around. He clutches his sword in both hands. Gu Ho grabs the enemy's sword and tells him that he loves him too. The main character tells Lily that she will be leaving soon, and the girl replies that she understands. An orange glow emanates from the skeleton's eyes as he used the Spirit Hunter's second ability. He used Devil Summon and a magic circle appears. Many red circles appear around the skeleton, from which energy emanates. The protagonist wonders if this is the magic of summoning monkeys, and then adds that he has prepared for that in advance. Many smiling monkeys emerge from the energy. A flame emanates from Lily's hand. The skeleton is now surrounded by a lot of fire. The girl put her hand forward and many flames appeared in front of her, after which she said that they would burn everything here and go eat chicken. Concern can be seen on the skeleton's face. The main character pulls his hand away and tells Lily that she is smart and will be responsible for the destruction of the monkeys. The skeleton made an angry expression on his face. He threw a sword with Gu Ho at the protagonist, but he dodged it. The protagonist, with concern on his face, thought that he seemed to have seen something, but would pretend that it didn't happen. Gu Ho, behind the protagonist, hugs the sword with a loving look. The main character thought that now was not his turn to enter into battle. Three healed fighters attack the skeleton. The protagonist watches the battle with his arms crossed and thought that his goal was to safely clear the dungeon with minimal effort. He adds that when these bastards have exhausted their strength, then he will join. An hour later, the skeleton screams loudly and golden energy emanates from its eyes. The protagonist thought it was time and blew the whistle. Two cured guys turn to the protagonist. The main character puts his hand to his belt and asks the skeleton if he is tired of waiting and then invites him to get it over with. The skeleton's eyes turn red and he says something to the protagonist in a different language. The protagonist sighs and tells the enemy that he doesn't know what he's saying, but it sounds like he called him a cowardly scoundrel. He adds that he hopes his words are clear to him. The skeleton swings its fist at the main character, who quickly moved towards him. The protagonist thought that some people have no choice, they can only live this way. He shows the enemy the back of his palm with a mirror, after which it begins to glow. The skeleton opens its mouth. The protagonist thought that he couldn't be brainwashed by the mirror of illusion, but he could lower his guard for a moment. The main character clenches his hand into a fist, 
after which it is enveloped in a huge amount of blue energy. He used the lightning strike fist skill, after which he struck the skeleton with a powerful crackling energy. The enemy's armor is destroyed and cracks appear on his body. The protagonist noticed something, after which he opened his eyes wide. He saw a blue crystal, the spiritual stone. He thought that even high-level magic stones could not compare with it. This treasure allows the owner to perform a miracle. He adds that this is also the reason why he decided to enter the labyrinth of fallen spirits. He takes out the spiritual stone from the enemy's body and says that he will put it to good use. Lily, with concern on her face, asks if it's all over. The main character with a malicious smile holds a stone in his hand. He thought this was an amazing find, after which he imagined a muscular, bare-chested self enveloped in blue energy. He adds that he will now be able to use the transformation. He rests his chin and imagines sunbathing on the beach. And then he thought that if he completed it, his body would go into a practical state for mastering martial arts. But that's not what interests him. He adds that he wants to slow down aging and increase life expectancy so that he can enjoy his youthful body long after retirement, which he will reach in three years. Lily, with wide open eyes, asks the protagonist what it is in his hands and whether it is tasty. The protagonist switches the stone to his other hand and tells Lily that no, this stone is inedible and she will get sick if she tries it. The girl with an angry expression on her face asks the protagonist why, since he himself tried to eat him. The main character clutches a stone with a smile on his face, and puzzlement can be seen on Lily's face. The stone in the protagonist's hand crumbles into dust. Lily looks at the upset protagonist. Dane thought that it was a stone that would have been worth a million at auction if he had decided not to use it. The girl asks the protagonist, who fell to his knees, if he really stopped fighting. The main character wonders why the stone disappeared. He looks at the watch on his hand. The hands on his watch began to move quickly. The protagonist with a malicious smile thought that this means that this watch is powered by magical power. The reporter says that then four guilds, united by one goal, the task of destroying the gates, should have returned. He adds that ten days have passed. In the middle of the road, outside the fenced area, there is a portal. The reporter says experts believe they are dead. Yun Vi watches the report using his smartphone with a sad expression on his face. The man asks her if she is here again. Yun Vi calls him uncle. A man in a black shirt and with a spear in his hand tells the girl that the second team will return the seventh intact, so she should not worry too much. Commander of the Second White House Command, Ban Wu Hyuk. Yoon Havai averts his pupils to the side with a worried expression and tells the man that the other guilds do not plan to send rescue teams. She adds that she knows his team is capable of clearing the A-rank dungeon, but he should be careful. The man replies that it's good. She can rely on him. Wu Hyuk stands near the portal with his men and orders them to move out. The portal begins to spin faster. Wu Hyuk shouts to his people to wait because something is happening with the gate, and so they need to prepare for battle. The protagonist comes out of the portal with Lily behind him, and then cars drive out of there. Wu Hyuk addresses the protagonist with a smile on his face. Univai hugs the main character, and he is very surprised. The main character, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, asks the girl what she is doing all of a sudden, and then tells her that there is a child sitting on his back, so she should let him go. Yunvai asks the protagonist what delayed him, and he replies that a couple of unforeseen circumstances occurred, which should not be discussed in front of everyone. The girl replies that no, because she was very worried. Tired Lily on the protagonist's back says that she has no strength left and wants to go home. The protagonist, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, tells Yunvai to wait for the processing application. The reporter says that thanks to the seventh team of the White House, Superhumans from all guilds returned home alive, and according to additional information, the gate turned out to be more dangerous than the government believed. He adds that at the entrance, there was a dispute between the guilds. The driver of the protagonist's car tells him that the whole country is discussing his actions. The main character looks out the window and replies that this is an extra headache for him. He turns his head a little and asks the driver if he said that it didn't rain while he was in the dungeon. The driver replies that yes, there is not a cloud in the sky. A rainbow rises in the sky above the city. The driver asks the protagonist if he is interested in the rainbow, and then reports that it appeared four days ago. The protagonist replies that this is how it is. With a wary look, he thought that this was not a natural phenomenon, but an omen of the first great disaster. He imagines a rainbow against a cloudy sky. He thought that gradually, color by color, the rainbow would begin to disappear. And on the day when it disappeared completely, a great disaster would begin the night of the seven moons. He imagines monsters that came out of hundreds of gates. 
The main character thought that in the past he barely escaped by staying in a shelter. But now, everything is different. Lily sleeps next to the protagonist on the couch. Dain raises his hand and clenches it into a fist and then thinks that he has become stronger compared to last time. He looks at his hand with a stern look and thought that he had this watch that had absorbed the mana of the spiritual stone. Lily is standing in a red dress with a bow decorated with roses and says that the waist is a little tight. The main character in a formal black suit with a white shirt holds a wit. E in yellow suit in his hand and tells the girl that then let her wear the overalls and she replies that it is ugly. The protagonist asks her what she then suggests he do. He remembers how Yunavai, with a dissatisfied expression on her face, asks the protagonist how it is that Lily doesn't have evening clothes and does he really want to say that she only has home tracksuits in her wardrobe. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, thought that she gave it to Lily so it would be sad not to wear it. He tells the girl to go like this, and if she becomes uncomfortable, he can change her clothes. Joyful Lily tells the protagonist that this is a great idea, and he is a genius. The protagonist thought that when the team returned safely from the dungeon, a party was thrown at the White House. Chan Sung, standing next to his daughter, puts his hand forward and says that here they are, their main heroes of today. He hugs the protagonist and tells him that he knew they would return alive. The protagonist asks the head of the guild if he really wants to kill him himself. Yunvai tells Lily that this dress suits her very well, and the girl smiles happily and thanks her for the gift. The black-haired girl tells the girl that she speaks better every day. Young Shin, with flushed cheeks, asks Lily if she would like to have dinner together. The girl puts her palms together and agrees. Yunvai covers her mouth with an admiring expression and thought it was so cute. Lily approaches the boy and asks him what they will eat. The protagonist looks at the people near the tables and thought that everyone seemed to be enjoying the evening. He adds that in the Black Hound Guild, he could not even dream of anything like this. The guild leader turns to Dayin. The main character with a glass in his hand looks back. Chan Sung with a smile on his face asks the main character what his goals are. The protagonist asks the man in what sense, and he replies that he is curious about what young people dream of today. He asks the protagonist whether he wants to become the strongest in the world or gain untold riches. Dayin sighs and says his goal is to retire. He says he plans to raise a lot of money and build a 9,900 square meter mansion, invite friends and do whatever he wants. Confusion can be seen on the faces of Chan Sung, Gu Ho, and Yun Vai. The black-haired girl closes her eyes and tells the protagonist that his goal is wonderful. Gu Ho says with a happy expression that a peaceful life sounds good. Surprised, Chan Suk asks the protagonist if he wants to become strong by training with him. Yun Havai turns to the guild leader with an angry expression on his face. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, thought that at first he planned to avoid the dangers that would happen in the future, but now he has the potential to become stronger and comrades he can trust. The rainbow in the sky has become more transparent. The protagonist thought that if they could not be prevented, then it was worth coming up with a plan to take advantage. A bright light illuminates the lake. Chan Sung clenches his hand into a fist and says that he did not expect that such a beautiful lake was located in the Forbidden Territory. Next to him is the protagonist, Gu Ho and Lily. He takes off his clothes and runs into the water and then shouts that his spirit has perked up from being close to nature. Yun Vai, dressed in a swimsuit, sits on the fabric and addresses the protagonist. She turns her head to him and asks if he will lubricate her back because she won't be able to reach it herself. The main character reaches his back with his hand and tells the girl that she should practice stretching because he, for example, calmly reaches out. Angry Yun Vai asks the protagonist if he couldn't just agree. The main character points his thumb at Gu Ho and Rice Cake and then tells the girl that if she needs it, she can ask them to help. She looks at Rice Cake and notices that she hasn't said hello to him yet and then asks who he is. The surprised guy thought that the beauty was interested in him. He approaches the protagonist and presses his palm to his chest and then says that his name is Min Jae, and his nickname is Red Bean Rice Cake. Yoon Havai straightens his hair with a smile on his face and tells Min Jae that she is glad to meet him, but however, they are not that close yet. The angry main character tells the guy that if he says something like that again, he will rename him. The protagonist, with a menacing look, asks him how about calling him Blood Pie. A lot of sweat runs down Min Jae's face. The main character waves his hand to the head of the guild and asks him if he wants to compete in swimming. Chan Sung replies that it sounds fun. The protagonist with a smile on his face says that the one who gets to the other side of the lake faster will win. He throws his clothes. He jumps into the lake. The protagonist and Chan Sung 
are swimming very quickly through the water. With a nervous expression on his face, he thought that the head of the guild was the first Superman, and he was very fast. Chan Sung is far ahead of the main character, who thought that thanks to him, he could get a big catch. The head noticed something under the water. A huge red octopus swims out from under the water in front of him. He asks the monster with an angry expression, how dare he interfere with their competition. He makes a high jump and swings his fist at the octopus. He hits the monster's head. There was a large dent on the octopus's forehead. He makes numerous blows to the octopus's head. The protagonist noticed with a puzzled look that Chan Sung fights with his bare hands. He thought it was a good idea to take it with him. He swims closer to the octopus and asks the head if he is okay. The protagonist says that he did not expect a monster to appear here. Chan Sung turns his head towards the protagonist and says that he is glad that he was not hurt because the Forbidden Zone is full of surprises. He looks towards the shore and says that they have sailed far. So he is worried about the others and says that it is better to return to them. The protagonist agrees with the head and says that he will stay for a while to examine the bottom of the lake. Chan Song asks the protagonist if he will do this alone. He swims to the shore and shouts to the main character to come back for dinner. The main character follows the chapter with his eyes and thought that he had already cleared the area where they were sitting, so the monsters would not appear. The protagonist uses the shield skill, after which he dives and a barrier appears around his head. He looks around and thought that the kraken died because he interfered with him. He adds that the real problem awaits below. He sinks lower and lower. He thought that there would definitely be treasure there. He noticed a bright glow. The protagonist looks through the gap in the wall and thought that he had found it and now he could return to the guys and enjoy his vacation. And then he would come here with the baby. A whirlpool appears not far from the main character. The main character opened his eyes wide in surprise. The whirlpool sucks in the main character. The barrier around his head disappears. The main character stretches his hand forward and mentally curses. The weakened protagonist thought that he had said that he would return soon. He calls Lily. She turns back, as if having heard the protagonist's words. Yoon Havai is touched when he looks at the two children. Young Shin tells Lily to drink it before the commander comes back and gives her strange food. The girl thanked the boy and drinks a drink from a glass. She exclaims that she will eat before he returns. A green glow is visible from the crevice. There is a shore in a cave near a pond. Drops fall on the main character's head. He opens his eyes, and the fairy next to him exclaims that the protagonist has woken up. Another fairy asks what they will do. Another fairy asks if something bad should happen. The fairy with long hair made a dissatisfied expression on her face and asks the protagonist who he is. The main character looks at them and thought that he knows these creatures. The protagonist breaks the ropes with which he was bound and then asks the fairies if they brought him here, after which they get scared. One of the spirits shouts that the protagonist has broken the ropes. Another fairy shouts that he looks evil. Another fairy grabs her head and screams that the protagonist will finish them off. The main character sighs and tells the hidden fairies that he will not kill them, so they should calm down. The protagonist imagines a green branch of a plant. He thought that the continent of Nostel was the habitat of magical plants, animals, and fairies. He adds that when he worked there as a guide for a couple of months, he only met fairies near clear water. The protagonist imagines a fairy with long hair at the ends. Snowflake is one of the representatives of the kind and innocent fairies. The protagonist asks the fairies if they are snowflakes. A fairy with long hair asks the protagonist if he knows them. She asks the main character if he has been to Nostel. Another fairy asks the protagonist if he really speaks their language. The protagonist, with concern on his face, tells the fairies to ask questions one at a time. With a serious expression on his face, he thought that in his past life there was no information that they lived here. He adds that it will be problematic if the course of events changes. The main character asks them why they are here. The fairies made sad expressions on their faces. A fairy with long hair says that they lived in a lake, but suddenly it was transported to another dimension. The protagonist thought that they must be talking about the first gate. Three fairies fly over the lake with worry on their faces. The long-haired F. Aerie says that there were monsters that appeared, fought, and ate each other, and the octopus killed many of them. Three fairies run away from a huge octopus. The main character thought that they were talking about the kraken. A fairy with curly hair with a smile on her face exclaims that this is why they hid at the bottom of the lake and found their salvation here. The main character crosses his arms and tells the fairies that it was difficult for them. The protagonist thought that they had been exterminated, which is why there was no information. The long-haired fairy made an alarming expression on her face and said that they have no future because they are weakening due to lack of sunlight 
and cannot get out because of the octopus. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, tells the fairies that the octopus is dead and they can now go out, after which the fairies are surprised. The long-haired fairy asks the protagonist not to lie to them. The protagonist puts his hand forward and tells the fairies to check it themselves, because they can do it. The long-haired fairy says that now they will look, after which she touches the protagonist's palm with her tail, and a green glow emanates from it. Other fairies say that this is true, because the color is green. The fairy with a bob and a curly fairy fly around the protagonist, thanking him for avenging them, and now they can go outside. The protagonist puts his hand to his head and with a dissatisfied expression on his face, tells the fairies to stop because they make him dizzy. The protagonist walks through the cave and the fairies fly after him. One of the fairies exclaims that it's great because they are now friends and the protagonist agrees with them. The main character thought that his original goal was unearthly power and if he had gained it, it would have been easier to deal with the first disaster. The protagonist imagines a jug with blue liquid. He thought that, however, she was guarded by a guard. The main character imagines a magical creature with blue eyes and huge metal arms. He thought that he was trying to find where exactly it was located, but he got along with the snowman. He imagines a lot of coins falling down and thought he had to figure it out. He imagines lying on a cot by the lake and thinking that he would make a fortune if he turned this lake into a snowflake theme park. The long-haired fairy tells the protagonist, who has closed his eyes, that there is a trap here that he should not step on. The main character jumped over the trap and tells the fairy that he will do so. He looks at the fairy and thought that it would be difficult for him if he were alone. The long-haired fairy exclaims with a joyful expression that they are almost there. The protagonist walks across the stone floor accompanied by fairies and one of them tells the protagonist to stop and then offers to say hello to their friend. Another fairy adds that it was he who allowed them to live here. The protagonist, with a worried expression on his face, asks if there really is that someone and then asks them just not to say that it is a white, hard-bodied scoundrel who is half his size. The long-haired fairy replies that this is true, and then asks the main character if they know each other. She waves her arms and exclaims that he is strong, which is why the octopus couldn't get here. She thought they meant the guard. The protagonist tells the fairies to say goodbye to him, and he will wait here. The fairies stop and inform the protagonist that they have already arrived. The main character sees in front of him a short creature with massive arms after which he mentally curses. it. The guard says in an electronic voice that an intruder has appeared. The passage is closed. The gate behind the protagonist automatically closes. He cursed and thought that his escape route was now inaccessible. The guardian transformed and became a much taller creature with sharp claws. He says that the assessment of the intruder has been completed. The destruction of the target has been confirmed. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, asks the fairies if this friend is really good and then says that he called him a target that needs to be destroyed. The long-haired fairy asks if his appearance has changed. The guard goes to the protagonist and says that he is starting destruction. The protagonist says that this is also not bad. Metal armor appears on the protagonist's left hand, and he says that you can try it. The guardian makes a claw attack on the protagonist. The main character blocks the enemy's blow. He is pushed back due to the force of the blow. The protagonist clenches his left hand into a fist and thought that he couldn't do anything about the difference in weight but it's not that bad. The guard looks at his destroyed hand and says that the degree of danger of the intruder is being reassessed. High-class weapons have been unlocked. He quickly moves from the spot and says that the target is confirmed. The main character makes another blow to the guard and asks him if he really thinks that he will wait. Crackling energy appears near the guard's head and he says that self-healing is being activated. The protagonist thought that this was really a robot with the ability to self-heal. The guard makes an attack on the main character and he dodges and thought that he had a problem because he put a little mana into the glove. He makes blow after blow to the protagonist, but he always jumps back and thought that he should retreat for now. The main character looks at the wall and thought that he would break it and get out of here. The long-haired fairy stands between the two combatants and calls the guard snowblind and asks him not to fight. With an angry expression on her face, she points her hand at the protagonist and exclaims that he is their friend. The protagonist looks at the fairy with concern on his face and thought that she was stupid. The guard looks at the smiling, long-haired fairy with the help of a camera and says that this is not a target for destruction because it cannot be destroyed. The protagonist asks the guard where he is looking and hits him with his armored fist. The long-haired fairy holds her head and screams and asks the protagonist why he is hitting Snowblind. The protagonist, with a malicious smile, tells the fairy that they will talk later. The fairy, with an alarmed expression on her face, 
exclaims that they are all friends. Three fairies cry near the defeated guard and ask him not to die. A fairy with curly hair shouts to the protagonist that he is their friend. The fairy with the square exclaims that the protagonist killed Snowblind. The main character grabbed the wrist of his left hand with his right hand and says that he was the first to attack and then asks whether it would be better if he died at his hands. The protagonist sits down, calls the guard a golem, and then asks him if he has proven his qualifications. The guard says that the test is over, the mission is completed. The protagonist takes out a key from an open compartment in the guard's torso and thought that all that was left was to find the safe. The long-haired fairy cries and shouts the name Snowblind. The curly-haired fairy waves her arms and shouts to the protagonist that he is no longer their friend. The long-haired fairy shouts to the protagonist that friends don't kill friends. The main character, with a skeptical expression on his face, replies that he did not do this, and then adds that he can be brought back to life. The curly-haired fairy with a smile on her face asks the protagonist what he said. The long-haired fairy sees a green light when she touches the protagonist's palm with her tail, and then exclaims that he is telling the truth. The protagonist sighs and thought that they were a walking headache, but they were naive. He thought that modern technology could not recreate a golem like him, but Young Shin has a specialization in manufacturing, and he has the power to restart it. A glow comes from the key in the protagonist's hand, and he says that something else is important now. The protagonist goes to the gate and exclaims that this is cool. The long-haired fairy says that this place has opened for the first time, and then asks the main character what they are looking for. The protagonist looks around and says that he is looking for something very important. He sees a jug with blue liquid and says that's it. A window appears with a description of the drink of life. According to him, it is a golden drink with an unlimited amount of strong healing ability. The protagonist thought with a smug smile that potions had not yet been invented, but he already had an endless supply of healing potions in a high-class decanter. He adds that its taste is so good that he will sell it in an instant. He remembers the army of monsters that emerged from the portals and thought that on the night of the first disaster of the Seven Moons, when the army of monsters appears, he will be able to save countless superhumans and civilians. A long-haired fairy with wide, open eyes looks at the protagonist drinking a drink and asks him to give her some too. The main character tells the fairy that there is not much left, but he will give her more when he is full. A long-haired fairy drinks a drink from a jug. She begins to glow brightly and scream. The protagonist covers his face with his hand and asks if it really has a different effect for water fairies. The long-haired fairy exclaims with a smile on her face that her body has become lighter. The main character, with concern on his face, replies that okay, they will sort it out later. He adds that he doesn't need anything else here, it's time to get out. He asks the fairies to take the golem, and the fairies agree. Evening sunlight is visible from above. The main character gets out from under the water together with the fairies. One of the fairies tells the sun that they have come. The protagonist looks up with a nervous expression and asks if she is wandering in her sleep. He sees Lily creating a huge amount of flame and asks if she is playing with fire again. The girl spreads her arms with a serious expression on her face and calls the protagonist uncle when she notices him. The main character shouts to her to turn off the fire and come down now and then asks her if she really wants to destroy the lake. The flames around her disappear. Chan Sung, who is on the shore, shouts and asks the protagonist where he has been. The protagonist, with an alarming expression on his face, thought that if he had delayed a little longer, there would have been consequences. He swims up to the head and tells him that the situation was an emergency. Chan Sung tells the protagonist that he is glad that he returned safely and was able to stop Lily. Otherwise, she would have dried up the lake. Yun Hvai runs to his father and asks him if he has found the commander. Gu Ho runs after her and addresses the main character. The head turns to them and commands them to stop the search. Univai hugs the main character and asks him where he went. She asks the protagonist if he is being offended. Chan Sung opens his eyes wide and tells the protagonist that there are monsters behind him. The main character holds Yun Hvai by the forearm and tells them both to calm down because these are new friends. He adds that he will tell everything in detail later. Lily headbutted the protagonist in the chest and screamed and asked him where he had been. She punches the protagonist numerous times and shouts that it was dinner time and he was nowhere to be found. With an angry expression on her face, she shouts at the protagonist that she had to skip dinner to find him and then calls him a fool. The protagonist looks at the girl with a small smile. He stands surrounded by his team members and pats Lily on the head, apologizing for being late. The main character thought that the vacation did not last long, and everyone returned to their daily duties. Gu Ho, 
to whom the monsters are running, shouts that only their guild is here, so everyone else should evacuate quickly. A humanoid monster with sharp teeth and a horn screams loudly. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, tells Gu Ho to act, and he accepts the order with a worried expression on his face. Two monsters attack Gu Ho, but do not harm him due to his petrification. The protagonist thought that his daily duties included eating five dishes rich in mana and training hard. He adds that when the request to destroy the monsters came, Gu Ho went first. He looks at how the tank takes the blows and thinks that the rate of its growth exceeds his expectations. He adds that with luck, he will play a big role during the first disaster. The main character asks Lily if she is ready, and then tells her that he gives her one minute. The girl agrees with the protagonist and forms two fiery clots above her palms. She shouts at her enemies that she will make french fries out of them, and then sends a lot of fireballs forward. Lily turns to the protagonist and says that everything is ready, and then asks the protagonist to buy her a set with a monster burger. The main character looks at his watch and tells her that she is five seconds late, so she will interrupt with one thing. Lily, with a desperate expression on her face, falls to her knees and exclaims that this cannot be. Gu Ho, who has dark green energy emanating from behind him, asks the protagonist if he can join him for dinner today with a joyful expression on his face. The main character runs up to the tank, puts his hand on his shoulder, and strikes with a dagger at the monster that was behind him. He says that it was a shadow goblin who was waiting in the shadows for the moment to attack. A bead of sweat runs down Gu Ho's cheek. The protagonist, with a stern look, asks him what kind of dinner he is talking about, and then tells him that he needs to get ready. Gu Ho apologizes to the protagonist with a sad expression, and then adds that today he will eat something nutritious and do some extra exercise. The protagonist averts his pupils to the side and thinks that this guy has a good attitude, and then tells him to continue in the same spirit. He takes out a dagger shrouded in blue energy and thinks that his abilities have reached the level that he possessed in his previous life. He turns his head and thought that the shadow goblins are not a problem for him. His mana reserve has also increased. He adds that if he continues in the same spirit, he will become even stronger. There is a rainbow against the background of a cloudy sky. Lily looks at the rainbow and notices that there is no red color on it. And the protagonist thought that he wonders if it will disappear in two weeks. The main character thought that in order to survive the night of seven moons, he needed to prepare several things. He imagines warriors running towards many monsters and thought that it would take firepower to quickly kill the monsters coming out of the gate, as well as a special command to destroy the gate core. The protagonist imagines a lot of documents falling to the floor and thinks that he needs a plan on how to minimize the destruction of the city. He imagines liquid pouring into his hand from a jug and thought that restoring the physical strength of superhumans and healing wounds is also important. He adds that he has taken care of the last one. All that remains is to prepare for the rest. Yunvi asks the protagonist to allow her to report on the status of the potion sales. She walks next to the protagonist and Lily. She says she was told that sales will begin this week. The protagonist, with a document in hand, tells Yun Hvai to continue to monitor them, and then adds that any problem should be reported to her immediately. The protagonist, with a stern look, asks the girl if the conditions for the sale were approved. Yun Hvai, with a smile on his face, replies that it doesn't matter anymore. Even without her advertising, superhumans will line up. She adds that in the report she indicated prices for each dish. The main character read that the portion per person is fixed, and the price is high. Yunvai turns away a little and asks the protagonist if she managed to please him. The protagonist asks how young Shin is doing and then adds that they say the golem can already move. She remembers how a boy with a screwdriver in his hand repaired the guard and says that no one else could have done it, but he claims that he can. The main character approaches his car, where the driver opened the door for him and tells the girl that she should rely on him. He adds that's all. A crack appears on the white background. The main character mentally wonders why he will definitely cope. He replies that everything is for the opportunity to go to the zoo with Lily. He smiles maliciously as he remembers Young Shin with reddened cheeks. He looks at the document, which lists the names. Young Sik, San Jun, Lee Young. He thought that this document listed his friends who were at his retirement party. The main character thought that since his intervention changed the future, there is no guarantee that they will meet. He folds the document under his shirt and says that he will take it for himself. Yun Hvai, with a smile on his face asks the protagonist if he needs anything else, and then says that he wants to work with him more before he goes on a week's vacation. The protagonist asks the driver how long it takes him to get to work. The driver answers that about an hour. The main character tells him that it is quite far and it is difficult for him. The driver, with his eyes closed, 
replies that no, everything is fine. The protagonist asks the driver if he would like to move to an apartment next to the guild headquarters. The driver was alarmed by the protagonist's words. Dayin asks Yoon Havai to prepare the driver's apartment as soon as possible. He adds that even if they have enough rooms for his entire family, he will pay. Yoon Havai closes her eyes and replies that she understands everything. She turned her head a little and thought that the main character was a very strange person. The driver looks at the protagonist through the rearview mirror and asks him what he is saying. The main character, with a smile on his face, tells the driver that it will be more convenient for him. He adds that he has a lot of money, so he shouldn't refuse. The driver laughs and then wonders if he is sleeping or if it is his birthday. The main character turns his head in the direction of the window and thought that if there are potions, then money is not a problem. But you cannot evacuate all loved ones in this way. With a stern look, he thought that he still had a lot of work to do. Min Jae wishes the protagonist and Lily a good trip with a happy expression. The protagonist asks him to take care of the house in their absence. Lily tells Min Jae that he won't be able to escape. The black-haired guy agrees with the girl with a smile on his face. Lily looks somewhere with a surprised look. Gu Ho stands in front of a stone with a huge dent on it. The protagonist puts his index finger to his mouth and tells the girl to be quiet. He adds that they should move on because Gu Ho is focused and the girl replies that's good. Tank put his hands to the stone and says that it's too slow. It's not good. With a frustrated look, he says that if he doesn't get stronger, the commander will throw him out. The main character, with concern on his face, wondered if Guho was still worried about being kicked out. He adds that whatever the motivation, it's good that he's getting stronger, so he won't interfere. Lily says that they will fly further and she will create a shield. The protagonist and the girl are flying on the barrier. Dayin asks Lily since then she can do this. The girl with a surprised look tells the protagonist that she just tried and it worked, and then asks if he really can't do that. The protagonist mentally swore at Lily. He looks at the crevice in the stone wall and thought that this was his personal treasury. He adds that he collected things that he came across in forbidden territory. A joyful fairy with a bob greets Lily, and she touches her with her finger and greets her. The long-haired fairy salutes the protagonist and says that there is nothing to report. Nothing happened. The main character with a serious expression on his face, replies that this is good, and then orders her to patrol near the cave. Three fairies wink at the protagonist and say that they will protect their friend's property. The main character thought that they drank the elixir of life and became fast as bullets. He adds that he uses their powers for this, so that they quickly contact him in the event of an intrusion. There are boxes and shells with various things in the room. Lily asks the main character why they are here, and the main character answers the girl that she should wait. The main character imagines a mask with a woman's lips and thought that the charlatan's mask makes a person attractive and charming, and also changes his voice so that it sounds like a speaker. He imagines a green robe and thought it was a sage's robe that, when using mana, emits an aura that is difficult to deal with. He imagines a staff with a blue stone on top and thinks it glows when you inject mana into it. The protagonist's hair turned brown due to wearing a green robe. He says it's very plausible. Lily put on the mask after which she had a purple cap and robe, and her hair turned golden. She exclaims that her voice has changed, and it sounds strange. The main character exclaims that the preparations are complete, and they begin the operation. The full moon is in the middle of the night sky. People fight monsters that come out of the portal. The protagonist exits the portal after the monsters. He used the reveal invisibility skill, after which the main character and Lily are now visible. One of the warriors shouts and asks who it is. One of them screams and wonders if he has come out of the gate. In front of the protagonist with a staff in his hand, there are many fighters with weapons at the ready. The main character with a small smile thought that it was good that there were many witnesses. He takes off his hood and tells the people in front of him that he is the magician Aximus from the continent of Guy. With a crazy look, he exclaims that he has come to warn that a disaster will soon befall their lands. One of the fighters asks who it is. A rainbow rises in the sky. Another fighter asks what language the protagonist speaks, and then adds that he has never heard it. The two guys look at each other with concern on their faces, and one of them asks the other if the two have left the gate. The stone in the protagonist's staff begins to glow brightly with a blue light. A man in red and black clothes covers his face, and a man with a shield asks what it is. The main character with a serious expression tells people in front of him not to worry, because he will use the magic of translation. He asks to be allowed to introduce himself again and says that he is the magician Aximus from the continent of Guy. He looked at Lily and said that he asked you to listen to him carefully. The girl thought it was a signal. 
She uses the shield skill. The main character and Lily rise into the air on the barrier, after which the protagonist puts his hand with his staff forward and shouts to the people below that he has come to warn them. The blonde guy says that the protagonist is really a magician. The long-haired guy asks the main character what he wants to warn them about. A rainbow rises in the sky and the protagonist says that it is a sign of a curse. He puts his left hand forward and says that when everyone disappears, a disaster will fall on their lands, which will open thousands of gates to hell. Lily noticed that this was another signal. Many portals appear above them, and the protagonist shouts that monsters and demons will flood the earth and heaven. He adds that the living will close their eyes, and the dead will rise. He tells people that they must unite and prepare for the coming disaster. The wide-eyed policeman asks how to understand this. The protagonist thought that he had distracted their attention. He and Lily fall to the ground. One of the guild members says that it is strange that the colors disappear in the rainbow. The main character thought that the special mask makes his voice more impressive, and the sage's robe exudes an aura that attracts people's attention. He adds that the staff simply emits light and helps to look impressive. The policeman puts his right hand forward and asks the protagonist how they can avoid this disaster. The main character closes his eyes and looks down, and then replies that there is no way, you can only minimize the damage from him. He opens his eyes and asks the people in front of him who is the king of the world and then says that he will tell him all the details. Blue House Interrogation Room A man with glasses opens the door and enters the room where Lily and the protagonist are sitting at a table. A man with glasses puts a magazine on the table and says that he has never met anyone like him. Head of San Wook's Superhuman Support Team The main character, with a confident expression on his face, tells the head that he understands that he is surprised, but he only came to warn him about the danger. He tells him that he assumes that he is not the king, and then asks him to immediately escort him to the king. San Wook, with a serious expression on his face, asks the main character why he is sure that he is not the king. He adds that perhaps their cultures are different, and therefore he looks different from the king of their world. The protagonist waves his palm and asks San Wook if his words are hard to believe. He adds that he can read fates, although not very skillfully. The man with glasses puts his hand to his head and sighs. The main character asks his interlocutor if he really doesn't know how, and then tells him that he sees a little how events will develop that will leave an imprint on history and the fate of great people. Blue energy emanates from the protagonist, and he tells Sin Wook that, for example, he is not a king now, but in the near future, he will strive to become one. San Wook, with concern on his face, screams and asks the protagonist how he found out. The protagonist thought that he saw his candidacy for president in the future, and he is also a judge of superhumans who cannot stand it when they commit crimes. A shadow covers the main character's face, and he says that he can't say anything more because that's all he sees. A black-haired man in a white shirt opens the door and tells San Wook that the president said he wanted to meet the magician in person. The head turns to him and replies that he understands everything. San Wook informs Aximus that he will accompany him to the king. The protagonist replies that he agrees, and then with a smile on his face he holds out the staff and it is taken away. He thought that the current blue house had been rebuilt a couple of years ago. He imagined a gate from which pink energy emanated and thought that the first gate opened right on his roof, and a monster appeared from there. He imagines the red dragon opening its mouth and flames escaping from it. Dain thought that in the end the president and most of the parliament who were there died, and the election of a new president only slightly settled the resulting chaos. The main character looks around and thought that now the blue house is solid and resembles a military building. Sanwook stops and tells the protagonist that they have arrived. President's office. Many guards stand in the way of the president, who is sitting at his desk. The president with gray hair and glasses moves his hand to the side and greets the protagonist, and then informs him that he is the president of this country. He asks the protagonist if he is really from another dimension. A man in a gray mask stands next to the president. The protagonist bows and replies that yes, he is Aximus, a magician from the continent of Guy. He adds that he hopes that the president will forgive the imperfect magic of his assistant's translation. Lily also bows to the president and exclaims that they are glad to meet. The president replies that everything is in order and they can sit down. The protagonist takes a closer look at the chair and says that it is unusual. The president tells him that this is a device for detecting lies and then says that if he lies, he will immediately know. The main character, with a smile on his face, tells the president what he thinks, and it would be nice for him to sit on one. The president asks the protagonist to repeat his words. The main character replies that he says that they have nothing to hide. 
Dayeen sits down on a chair and says that he is ready to answer. The president asks the guests if he really came from the guy continent. The main character and Lily answer that this is true. The president asks the guests if their story about the disaster is true. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, replies that it's true. They came to warn them, but his assistant doesn't really know anything about it. The president asks the guests to tell us what they know. The main character begins the story, and Lily replies that she doesn't know anything. The girl bowed her head, and the protagonist thought that the little girl did not understand even half of the questions. He adds that he has practiced martial arts and can control his breathing, pulse, and sweating, so the lie detector does not work on him. The president gets up from H, his seat, and asks his subordinates to remove the devices from the protagonist, after which the sensors are removed from him. The president of the subordinates leave, after which the protagonist sighs, and the trembling Lily raises her hands up. A man with glasses approaches the protagonist and apologizes to him for doubting him, and then adds that the situation is favorable. The main character replies that he understands everything, because he would have done the same. A shadow covers the president's face, after which he tells the protagonist that he will ask him a personal question. He asks the main character if he can help him fly to his continent before disaster strikes. Day in opens his eyes wide in surprise. The president, with a smile on his face, Ask the protagonist if it is safer there, and then says that since he came from there to warn them, it is quite likely. The main character, with a shocked expression on his face, asks the president how he, being a king, can want to abandon his people and fly away. The president, with alarm on his face, shouts that he is not a king, and then says that it just so happened that his place went to him. He adds that if they need money or anything else, they will get it. He moves one arm to the side and presses the other to his chest. He shouts that he is fed up with this dangerous world, in which you don't know when you will die. He asks to just take him, his family, and friends away. The main character thought that he did not expect him to do this. He grabs Lily by the hand and shouts to her that he had a different opinion about them, so they leave now. The president shouts to the departing guests that they themselves said that they would help. The main character answers the gray-haired man that he will never know what is in his soul now. He adds that he doesn't need anything. He rejects his offer. The president says that this is not necessary, but there is no other choice. His bodyguard takes off his mask. A gray-haired man with a mustache and beard squeezes the mask, and it breaks. The first awakened titan, Kim Soo-ho. He goes to the protagonist, and his ghostly clones remain behind him. He towers over the main character and is enveloped in a huge amount of green energy. The main character is trembling and thought that he could not look him in the eyes. He laughs, and Soo-ho asks him why he is laughing. The protagonist asks him how long he plans to continue this prank, and then calls him the Rayal King. Suho's face shows concern. He asks the main character how he found out. The protagonist closes his eyes and replies that he noticed his huge star of fate. Behind the first awakened titan is a bright, glowing green star. The main character thought that Suho was the hero who brought order to South Korea after the opening of the first gate. The protagonist imagines the Korean flag fluttering against a cloudy sky and thought that, having awakened his abilities, he mobilized the police force to protect the townspeople. And after the presidential elections, he rebuilt the Blue House and began to rule the country. He dedicated himself to cleaning up the city and rebuilding the country. All South Koreans know this. Disaster Response Center Headquarters Suho points his hand at the protagonist with Lily and tells the people sitting at the table in front of them that before the meeting begins, he would like to introduce them to the magician who brought them the prophecy. The protagonist says that his name is Aximus, and he hopes that they will listen to him carefully, after which he tells everything about the rainbow. The main character, with a serene expression on his face, says that this is all that is dangerous about the disaster, and then thought that all the big shots were gathered here. Chan Sung clenches his hand into a fist and shouts that among these 10,000 monsters there will probably be very strong ones. Monster Beck Chan Sung Demon King Kim, they Jean listens to the protagonist's speech with a wary look. The white-haired girl with blue eyes is the Ice Queen Han Ji Hai. The brown-haired man with the same color eyes is the Iron Wall of Min They Woon. The protagonist thought that these were the first awakened ones, or to be more precise, this title was given to the five strongest people from among the first awakened ones. He adds that they helped destroy the monsters and stabilize the situation, like Su Ho. Su Ho says with a small smile that he plans to declare a national emergency tomorrow morning and will try his best to prepare for the disaster. He adds that he asks those present to help him with this. They Jean, with a serious expression on his face, tells the president to wait 
and then asks him how he could believe such an unrealistic story. Dae Woon leans on his palm and closes his eyes, and then says that he agrees, because this magician looks like a deceiver. Someone present adds that declaring a state of emergency without grounds is a hasty decision. Another person asks if there is evidence. Su Ho raises his hand and shouts for everyone to be quiet, and then says that he has already checked everything and asks the others not to forget what happened during the opening of the first gate. He remembers the burning multi-story buildings and says that if nothing happens, then they will manage without accidents, which is also good. He adds that they will suffer huge losses if they do not prepare for disaster. They wound sighs and wants to say what he's been working hard on, then stops. He gets up from his seat with lightning speed and runs. The protagonist takes a fighting stance and wonders if this is an attack. They wound shouts to take off his mask now. The main character opened his eyes wide. They wound grabbed Lily with one hand and took her mask with the other. He tells her that the mask kept annoying him, so she should stand still so he can take it off. Lily screamingly asks the brown-haired guy if he is in trouble. They wound took off his mask and asks the girl why she is wearing it and whether it is so that she will not be recognized. The mask falls to the floor. Lily emits smoke as she transforms. They wound looks at his hand while Chan Sung makes a shocked expression. Angry, Lily turned into a cat and meows very loudly. Someone sitting at the table asks if she really wasn't human. The protagonist picks up the mask from the floor. He puts it on the cat and tells Lily to calm down because this guy didn't know anything, so he was wrong. The main character, with an angry expression on his face, tells Dae Woon that showing her face to people is a huge shame for the per representative, so when she goes on a trip with him, she always wears a mask. With a wary look, he thought that in case such a situation arose, he coordinated his actions with the baby. He remembers how Lily with golden hair looked at the mask with interest, and thought that in addition to the fact that the cat mask changes the voice, there was also a spell cast on it that transforms the wearer into a cat if the mask is removed. He mentally tells Dae Woon that his train of thought was wrong, and wonders what he will do now. Su Ho with a dark aura around him asks Dae Woon to apologize immediately. An angry golden cat in the hands of the protagonist meows loudly. The brown-haired guy apologizes for taking off his mask without permission. The main character, with a nervous smile on his face, thought that the little girl had perfectly got used to the role of a cat. Lily meows loudly several times in a row. The next day, Suho declared a state of emergency through television and radio broadcasts. Suho stands behind the podium and tells the citizens that he is standing here today to report the crisis situation that has befallen South Korea. There was a bit of a commotion after the announcement, but everyone quickly adapted. There are helicopters flying in the sky and tanks and armored personnel carriers driving on the ground. The military, police, and superhuman guilds immediately began large-scale military training. A man with brown hair addresses the protagonist as a great sage and tells him that he heard that he is leaving today. The protagonist sits with Lily at the table and answers the man that he will really do this, because the effect of the spell of interdimensional movement has almost ended. He adds that he needs to go back in a few hours. The man asks the main character if he can then ask him for a small favor before he leaves. The main character with a smile on his face replies that yes, of course, he will do everything in his power. The brown-haired man says that here are books obtained during the restoration of the country. The protagonist looks at the many shelves filled with books. The brown-haired man states that he only selected those that were in good condition, and then asks the protagonist if he could take a look at them. He adds that time is short, so he needs to try to check only the most important ones. The main character gets up from his chair and tells the interlocutor that his knowledge is meager, so he should not count on much. He thought that this man really sees him not as a great sage, but as a slave. The man replies that he is immensely grateful to the protagonist. The main character walks between the bookshelves and thought that if we do not take into account spoken language, then the only languages whose writing he knows are the languages of the continent's guy and near him. He adds that he only knows well what is connected with magic and martial arts. He focused on a book called Secret Records of the Sword Emperor. He opened the book and with a surprised expression read the lines where the author of the book, Nam Gung Yuhul, introduced himself and calls himself the Sword Emperor. He thought that this was indeed the Murim language and then wondered whether the Sword Emperor actually left the recording. A brown-haired man asks the protagonist if there is something wrong with this book. The main character closed the book and thought that he was not sure that this was the original, so he needed to check the book thoroughly. Dayin says with a creepy expression that this book seems to be written by the devil himself, and the brown-haired man asks if it's true. 
The main character asks if there were any other objects at the place where they found her, then says that it could be a sword or something like that. He adds that the sword also contains devilish energy, so it takes over the person who holds it and harms people. The interlocutor turns on the smartphone and exclaims that he will check it right away. The protagonist thought that it would be ideal if they could also find the heavenly divine sword that the sword emperor used. The brown-haired guy tells the protagonist that he was informed that no sword was found, and only worn clothes and this book were found in the destroyed cave. The protagonist closes his eyes and smiles, and then says that he is glad to hear. He mentally curses it. The main character puts the book under his robe and says that this book is very dangerous, so he will take it with him and seal it. He adds that their king is very busy, so he should not report. The interlocutor replies that he will do so. The main character reads the lines of a book where the author writes that he was born as an illegitimate son of the Namgung family. He wrote that although heaven had given him a talent for martial arts, he was constantly discriminated against for his origin. He adds that he could not even observe the development of martial arts in the noble Namgung family, and after his mother passed away, he stole all the family martial arts records and elixirs. The main character is reading a book with a concentrated expression on his face and thought that the introduction was not at all interesting to him, and the last part was something he already knew. He adds that the sword emperor, who had become a high-class master, fought with the heavenly demon and, having won by a small advantage, disappeared. Lily asks the main character what he is doing and then says that she is bored. The protagonist tells her to play by herself for a while, and since she's really bored, she might as well read. Angry Lily runs away from the protagonist. The main character shouts to the girl that if she is going to go for a walk, then she should definitely come back for dinner. He thought that now he could spend a little time in silence and solitude. The protagonist read that due to the invasion of a demonic cult, a great war with a heavenly demon had broken out in the central plain. It is further written that he, the sword emperor, had no choice but to intervene to stop him. The difference between them was small, barely noticeable. Now, if he had been born a legitimate child in the Namgung family, he would have been able to master perfect martial arts a little earlier. Only after many years of the atrocities of the heavenly demon did he return to the Middle Lands. If he had returned without an arm or a leg, he would have been called a loser and laughed at. The main character, with concern on his face, thought that this gentleman was too talkative. With dissatisfaction on his face, he asks why so much is written here about the mind technique that destroys the heavens. The protagonist turns the pages and reads as the author of the book addresses the reader and asks him if he wants to learn the best martial arts in the world. It is further written that if the answer is yes, then he should bow to this book and swear that he considers it his mentor. After this, it is written that the author eventually defeated the heavenly demon with the so-called heaven-destroying mind technique. The author addresses the reader and informs him that in this book he put the experience and enlightenment gained in the Great War and all of himself. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, thought that it looked like he had gotten to the bottom of it. The book says that the author explained the essence in simple language that even a monkey can understand, so that as soon as he reads it, he will immediately understand what's what. The main character sits on the floor and puts a book there and then says that he will try it once. He sits in a butterfly pose and forms an orange ball between his hands, with blue crackling energy circulating around it. The main character closes his eyes and thought that there are three main levels of meditation. A stream of smoke rushes to the right. The protagonist thought about accumulation, which refers to how much internal energy is accumulated in Dantian. The smoke is directed to the left side, and the protagonist thought about stability, in the case of which we are talking about how stable the energy is in the body. Next, he thought about release, which determines how quickly energy is released outward. Energy consisting of stability, release, and accumulation is collected in a blue ball. The three levels of meditation swirl and become one. Dain thought that while the great sea mind technique, which he mainly practiced, only pursues stability, the heaven-breaking mind technique represents the perfect harmony of three levels. He adds that in other words, it is ideal for meditation. The tired protagonist sighs and says that now he understands why the Murin people find themselves on the verge of death, trying to master perfect martial arts. He adds that's enough for today. He looks at his watch and says that it's already past lunchtime, and then asks why the baby hasn't returned yet. The main character heard a noise and turns back. He opens the window and sees a portal in the sky. He shouts that he sees a portal and monsters will now appear from it. He sees a minotaur emerge from the portal. The minotaur stands in front of three people and growls. 
The protagonist uses the shield skill and stops the Minotaur's mace with which he attacked. He moves his hand to the side and shouts to the people behind the barrier that until reinforcements arrive, they should not go beyond the barrier. Magic will protect them. People behind the barrier call the protagonist a great sage and thank him. The protagonist wonders if he should test the power of the heaven-destroying mind technique. The Minotaur swings his mace at the protagonist and screams loudly. The main character takes the staff back and says that if he uses magic, the royal palace will be destroyed. He adds that there is nothing else to do but fight with physical strength. The Minotaur hits the ground as the protagonist quickly jumped up. The protagonist is near the head of the Minotaur and clenches his hand into a fist. He punches the Minotaur, after which it pushes away. The protagonist was surprised by the result of his blow. The Minotaur is preparing to make another blow to the main character, and he asks the Minotaur why he is so weak and whether he is really a Minotaur. The Minotaur makes a sweeping attack on the main character. The surprised Minotaur looked up, expecting to see the protagonist in the air, but the main character was below and swinging his fist. He strikes the Minotaur's chest. Dain smiles and thought that this is not a weak Minotaur, but he has become many times stronger. He adds that you need to quickly master other methods. He hits the enemy several times in a row. Lily flies up to the protagonist on the barrier and notifies him that she has arrived. The main character, with concern on his face, asks the girl where she has been. Lily replies that she ate with a friend. The protagonist asks her if she has already managed to make friends with someone in such a short time. Orange energy emanates from the portal. Many minotaurs appear under the portal. The surprised protagonist says that he did not want to damage the royal palace, but there are too many monsters, so there is no choice. They, together with Lily, raise their hands up, and the protagonist shouts for the fire to become rain and orders it to fall on the enemies. After this, the flames are directed at the minotaurs and being engulfed in flames, they scream due to pain. Surprised, Sanwook exclaims that this is the highest magic. The protagonist thought that in the distant future a statue of a great sage would be erected on the square of the Blue House. Suho holds the protagonist's hands and, addressing him as Mr. Aximus, tells him that they will never forget his kindness. The main character replies that he only did that and then tells the man that he hopes he can stop the disaster. A man in a white shirt opens a suitcase with blue stones, and Sanwook tells the protagonist that this is their gratitude to him, and even if the gift is insignificant, he should accept it. The main character, with concern on his face, exclaims that he cannot accept this. San Wook replies that then, they won't let him back. The protagonist takes the suitcase and, with reddened cheeks and drool flowing from his mouth, thanks the first awakened one. He wonders how many high-level magic stones there are. He says it looks like his time here is up. The main character uses the shield skill, after which a barrier appears under him and Lily. He says it's time for them to say goodbye. Lily waves to Ji-hai and then says goodbye to her and calls her a friend. The protagonist, with a joyful expression on his face, tells the people in front of him that he hopes that they will all be safe and sound. The full moon rises in the sky above the ruins. The main character turns to min Jae. With a smile on his face, he asks him if he defended the house well. Joyful Lily tells the black-haired man that she wants to taste his cooking. min Jae crawled out of the tent and asked the protagonist and the girl where they had been all this time and then added that they were in trouble here. The main character asks him what happened. The guy with a nervous expression on his face answers with a cry that when the rainbow completely disappears from the sky, a disaster will befall them. He adds that according to the president, countless gates will appear. The main character and Lily look at each other after his words with mockery on their faces. Min Jae asks them why they are laughing. Tears flow from his eyes, and he informs the protagonist that Mr. Gu Ho went to an emergency meeting he asks that this be conveyed to him when he returns. The protagonist crosses his arms and tells Min Jae that he is doing well, and then adds that he will go to the guild right away. The protagonist looks at the crying guy and thought that he assumed that he would run away and there would be no one here. He adds that it is commendable that even in such a situation, he continued to wait for them. The protagonist, with a smile on his face, tells Min Jae that he has chosen the right side and then commands him to collect the necessary things for now. The guy agrees with a happy face. The protagonist looks at the rainbow, where there are a few colors left, and thinks that they have less than a week left. He says that they will all go to the guild. Yoon Hvai, with a tablet in her hand, screams and asks the protagonist where he has been, and then tells him that they have an emergency meeting, so she called him endlessly, and he even turned off the phone. A girl with an angry expression on her face asks the main character 
if he even understands how serious their situation is. The main character looks at Min Jae and says that guy has already told him everything. A black-haired guy with a backpack on his back greets Univai. The girl notices that they met at the lake and then says that they have not seen each other for a long time. She asks him if they are really planning to evacuate. The protagonist, with a smile on his face, asks the girl if there are any free rooms in the guild and then adds that they will stay here for a while. Univai grabs the protagonist by the hand and asks him if it is because of the gate and then adds that she will call a person who will accompany him. But now, it is much more important to meet with the head. The protagonist asks Min Jae to carry all the luggage and after that he can rest. The guy smiles and replies that it will be done soon. Univai, with an upset expression on his face, asks the protagonist if he knows that he is the only one who did not show up for the emergency meeting because that's why even such a person as the head was seriously angry. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, replies that he simply did not answer the call on his day off, and the head is already angry. Guho approaches them and asks the commander if it is. The main character replies that this is him. The main character asks Guho if he had a good time in his absence. Tank opens his eyes wide. He runs up to the protagonist to hug him, but he dodges. The main character, with a worried expression on his face, asks the guy if he is crazy and why he attacks for no reason. Guho cries and tells the protagonist that he is just glad to see him, because he was already starting to feel like he abandoned him and left. Dane puts his hand forward and tells the guy that even if people point fingers at him and disparage him as Hogu, he will never leave him. Guho looks at the commander with an admiring expression on his face. The protagonist thought that this was all because he was too useful. Lily, with a plush chicken in her hand, calls Tank Hogu and tells him that he is good and kind-hearted, so she will not leave him. Tank thanks Lily, but corrects her by stating that his name is Guho. The protagonist knocks on a wooden door. Yoon Vi informs the head that Commander Day In has arrived. Chan Sung tells everyone present to sit down with a stern look. All team members sit on the sofas to the left and right in front of the head. Yoon Vi informs the chapter that the protagonist was out of range of the network. Chan Sung replies that there is no need for excuses, and then asks the main character if he has heard the news about the disaster. The protagonist replies that yes, he was informed about everything. A shadow covers Chan Sung's face, and he says that the great sage Aximus contacted him and conveyed the prophecy personally for him. He imagines dark images of the protagonist, Gu Ho and Lily, and remembered that the message said that he should leave the Seventh Night Squad alone and give it to the Wheel of Fate, because he will bring light to all of them. Chan Sung reports that no matter how much he thinks, it seems to him that we are talking about the protagonist's team. Yunvai raised her palm and replies that it looks like that. Guho says he agrees. The protagonist with reddened cheeks thought that even though he said it himself, it was unusual to hear his words from others. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, folds his arms and tells the head that when disasters begin, his team should be given complete freedom of action. He adds that they will sort out all the problems themselves, and then asks if this was the prophecy. The protagonist with a wary look thought that eliminating monsters where the guild sees fit was a waste of time. He adds that it is better, after gaining freedom of action, to destroy the core of the main gate. He imagines seven multicolored balls of magical energy. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. He thought that the reason why the calamity is called the Night of the Seven Moons is that among the hundreds of gates, seven special ones with different colors will open. He adds that when the main gate, which is the root of the surrounding gates, disappears, it will take with it several dozen nearby, ordinary ones into oblivion. He thought that in the guise of Aximus, he conveyed information about the six main gates that needed to be destroyed. The protagonist, in the form of a sage, rests his chin with his finger and tells the head that the red energy seems to be beyond his vision, so he does not catch its location. Chan Sung replies that everything is fine, although it's a little unfortunate but the available information is quite enough. The main character thought that the only thing he did not tell was the location of the Red Gate, because there is a spiritual stone there. He closes his eyes and thought that this time his dream of beautiful skin will come true. Chan Sung replies that he thought so too. But can the prophecy be so simple? Yun Vi with a thoughtful look says that perhaps there is some hidden meaning in it. Gu Ho says with concern on his face that it is difficult to understand because his words are too abstract. The main character asks if the great sage who decided to help them made any complex prophecies, and then says that it seems to him that there is no need to twist his words. Gu Ho and Yun Vi made surprised expressions on their faces. 
The protagonist imagines how he and Lily are sitting on a sofa in the middle of space and thought that he said that there is no hidden meaning in the prophecy. He thought that after much convincing, the seventh team received freedom of action. Three days later, White House training room. Lamps illuminate the training room. The main character standing behind, Gu Ho put two fingers forward and asked the guy if he remembered exactly how the mana moved through his body. The tank trembles and answers that no. The protagonist looks at the smartphone with the saved notes of the Sword Emperor's recordings and tells Gu Ho that he will do it again, so he should pay more attention. The protagonist thought that the Golden River Stream technique in the secret records of the Sword Emperor is a martial art that focuses on external attacks, so the breathing method is simple. He adds that this art only strengthens the body and helps in performing basic techniques. But for Gu Ho, it is extremely useful. Gu Ho stands with his legs bent and his arms extended forward. The protagonist again raises his index and middle fingers and then asks the guy if he now understands at least a little. Gu Ho replies that not really. The protagonist thought that the Emperor of the Sword wrote that it is so simple that even a monkey can be taught, but why can't he cope? The main character asks Gu Ho if he understands now and the guy replies that he seems to understand a little. The protagonist tells the guy that he should be able to feel it little by little, and he replies that he's not sure. The protagonist hits Gu Ho on the back and shouts at him that he has shown it for the 30th time, and then informs him that he is not even at the level of a monkey. Gu Ho, with a frustrated expression on his face, replies that whether he understands or not, he will try to continue training on his own. The angry protagonist tells the tank that he should do so, and then adds that he has things to do, so he will go. The protagonist thought that only the purple color of the rainbow remained, the disaster of which was right in front of his nose. He looks at Lily who is sitting on the cloth and eating chicken, and then asks her if it tastes good to her. A joyful girl with chicken bones in her hands agrees. The protagonist says that he bought her three boxes of chicken, and she has already dealt with them all. He wipes her face with a handkerchief and says that if this is so, then she needs to get up because it's time to work off food. Lily opens her eyes wide and asks the main character if that's why he bought them for her. The main character thought that inside the Red Gate, which they would enter when the disaster began, there was a valley of flame. He imagines a volcano with lava flowing from it and thought that since the area is filled with flames and boiling lava, they will have to go through the heat. The main character thought that the required item in the fight against the local boss was the Fong of the Ice DR. Agon. He imagines an ice Fong lying on a red backing in a box. Blackhound Headquarters Building. The main character and Lily are flying on the red barrier and he says it seems that this item is with his former employer. The protagonist and Lily are wearing black clothes and masks, and the girl's hair has turned purple due to the effect of a magic potion. The protagonist thought that before his return in time, the Black Hound Guild was the place where he, at the age of 20, worked as a slave for three years. He adds that the balance between work and personal life was disrupted, and vacations could only be remembered when you were injured. The protagonist clutches a dagger in his hand and is enveloped in blue energy. He thought that if he had healed his knee back then, his life would have been a little different, namely the same as now, when the sword chi energy changed when reproducing the heaven-destroying mind technique. He looks out the window of the building and thought that thanks to the hellish work there, he knows everything about the layout of the headquarters, surveillance cameras, and the location of important objects. He climbs inside the room, through the window, and tells Lily that they need to come here. Blackhound Security Control Room Two people are sitting at a set of monitors behind a control panel, one of whom says that everyone has gone to a place for evacuation and they have to remain at their post at such a time. A control room worker with brown hair with an angry expression on his face shouts that the more he thinks, the angrier he gets, and then asks why they have to be here in an emergency. He adds that markets and shops will soon be completely empty. The blonde worker asks if no one locked the doors, then adds that as soon as the disaster begins, he will rush headlong to the guild evacuation site. One of the workers notices that one of the screens has gone dark and asks if one of the infrared cameras is turned off. Another worker asks if the lens is broken. The protagonist quickly enters their room, and one of them points his finger at another screen and says that according to this camera, something is located right in front of the door to their room. The protagonist takes several hits and knocks out the workers. He sits down on a chair and tells the two defeated guys to sleep tight until tomorrow, calling them friends. He takes off his mask and presses the yellow button with a smile on his face, and then says that he hasn't been here for a long time. A voice comes from the camera speaker, which reports that an emergency has occurred. Someone has entered the head's room. Below the camera are two guys with machine guns. One of them shouts and asks who this crazy fool is. The main character sits at the control panel and says that there are four of them and they are armed, 
but do not look like superhumans. He adds that all employees in the building must go there. Lily sits on a chair nearby. The soldier replies via radio that they are moving out immediately. He reports that they are there and are already entering. The main character smiles after his words. The soldier says that there is no one here and asks if they have escaped. The screen shows a video camera image of two soldiers standing in a corridor where the ground has fallen behind them. One of them radios to the security control room that the door has closed. The main character leans back in his chair and closes his eyes, and then says that the attackers have been caught. He adds that being locked up is extremely boring, so he will play music for them, after which a melody will be played. Lily destroys the wall with magic. Admiration can be seen on her face, and the main character smiles. He sighs and thought that they still dare to say that running a guild is difficult. Lily takes a closer look at the shiny golden chicken and then asks if it is gold. With her eyes wide open, she asks the protagonist if they will take everything that is here, and then adds that she only wants that thing. The protagonist, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, tells her that there is no need to burden himself with useless rubbish. He thought that there was a room with special weapons, rooms with objects obtained from killing monsters, and a place for collecting objects from another world, the purpose of which is unknown here. The main character enters the room where there is a box covered with glass. He says that the guild members took good care of the safety of this thing. He will take it with gratitude. He opens the box containing the ice fawn. He puts the item under his jacket and says that now they must return. Lily asks the protagonist if they will go there and then adds that she is curious about what is there. The main character asks her what place we are talking about. The girl points her finger at the wall and says that behind this wall lies a lot of magical power. The main character clenches his hand into a fist and then armor appears on his hand. He asks Lily to move away. He hits the wall, after which a hole appears in it. He sees a lot of magic stones covered with glass, and then says that this is a wonderful loot. He smiles and calls Lily smart, and then adds that as a bonus he will buy her three cheese balls. The girl rejoices after the protagonist's words. The protagonist puts his hand forward, after which magical energy swirls in front of it, sucking stones into it. He says that he will absorb the next spiritual stone, so let this artifact eat all of these. He looks at his hand, and it seems to him that nothing has changed, and then he wonders whether it was worth using so many spiritual stones. He says that he will consider that he was paid all the severance payments that he did not receive at the time, and then tells Lily that now they can return home. A purple rainbow is visible against the background of a tall building. The next day, the rainbow disappeared. Lily sits down on her knees and laments the fact that she didn't get any cheese balls with a shocked expression on her face. The protagonist tells her that he will buy them next time. Third place for evacuation. The protagonist trembles with a smile on his face. Sola asks the protagonist if something good happened to him. The main character closes his eyes, and the blue-haired guy gets scared when he sees purple-black energy. Dayin says he finally received all the benefits he was entitled to after resigning from the company he previously worked for. The three guild members look at Dejin, who is emitting powerful black and purple energy. One of them wonders what's wrong with the head. Another thought that yesterday the guild's cash was completely emptied. Another thought that they were saying it was unknown who the criminal was. Fourth place for evacuation. The main character says that he is owed a lot, but now the problem is resolved. Sola tells the protagonist that he had a hard time. He informs the main character that the equipment setup is complete. The main character steps aside. He presses his finger to the communicator on his ear and asks the team members if they can hear him. Ayel Nam responds to the protagonist that he hears him perfectly. Inam replies that the connection is fine. The main character turns his head towards Gu Ho and Lily and then asks them if they are ready. The girl, dressed in a uniform with many belts, exclaims that she is incredibly uncomfortable. Gu Ho, dressed in tight clothes and covering himself with his hands, says that these clothes make him very, very embarrassed. The protagonist says that Miss Lily has armor that provides high protection, and Mr. Gu Ho has a combat suit made of a new flexible material. He adds that this is unique equipment created specifically for the two of them. With a serious expression on his face, he asks Gu Ho what his strange pose is and whether he plans to stand like that during the fight. The red faced tank says that when he activates petrification, it will be a completely different matter. The protagonist wondered if he was really going to petrify this part of his body. Univai approaches the main character and tells him that the people he mentioned a few days ago have been safely transported to the evacuation site. The protagonist replies that this is great, and the girl asks if they are friends for him and if he wants to see them. Dayin replies that now is not the time, later. 
He imagines a long-haired woman in a green dress, a gray-haired man with a mustache, and a man in a purple vest. He thought he was asking for a personal favor, to provide protection for friends who were with him at his retirement party. He adds that all of them in the past lost their families during the first disaster. He thought that this time this would not happen. Chan Sung addresses the disaster and shouts to him that it can strike at any moment. He adds that he, Chan Sung, will stop him. The main character looks at the head, raising his hands, and says that he heard that the head was so excited that he didn't even sleep a wink the whole night. Yoon Vai, with flushed cheeks, agrees with the protagonist, and then says that she sometimes feels like she is raising a son. The head of the guild shouts for the disaster to come quickly. The protagonist turns away and says that, be that as it may, he thinks that with such resources it will really be possible to stop him. Near the metal dome, there are many cars, tanks, and armored personnel carriers. A rumble is heard, and the head asks if it is a monster. After a short silence, he notices that these are allies and shouts about it. The huge robot takes a heavy step. The main character smiles and says that this is Young Shin. He adds that he sees that he has achieved success. A black and blue robot stands in front of them. Lily waves her palm in greeting with a smile on her face and asks Snowblind if his name is, and then greets him. The robot replies that he is not Snowblind. The boy in the cockpit inside the robot holds the steering wheel and says that he is Young Shin. The main character holds Lily by the hood and says that the voice comes from inside and then asks Young Shin if he has modified it so that he can sit inside. The girl exclaims with admiration on her face that she also wants to go there. The protagonist tells the boy that he even put on a combat uniform and then asks him if his mother really gave him permission. Young Shin, with red cheeks, tells the protagonist's team that he will ensure their safety. The protagonist, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, clenched his teeth and tells them that as for this, love should have its time and place. Yoon Havai screams and asks the protagonist to look at the sky. The sky glows brightly in different colors. The protagonist, with concern on his face, tells Yoon Havai to return to the command post. Many orange portals appear in the sky. Many blackbirds fly around the city. Two soldiers in body armor are surprised at the number of portals. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, thought that this was only the first wave and their veins were already shaking. He crosses his arms and shouts that the enemies are simple monsters that they have already dealt with countless times. He commands everyone to focus on preparing for battle. The commander of the soldiers commands to take combat positions. One of the soldiers with a machine gun at the ready shouts that fire support is in place. Another soldier shouts and offers to try it once. The protagonist thought that now that they had come to their senses, they could be trusted to protect the evacuation site. The commander of the soldiers commands to open fire after which the tanks fire their cannons. The commander shouts that the superhumans first of all deal with the monsters that have come close to the base. A man with a bow shoots at a monster that was being attacked by another fighter. There is a powerful explosion on the road, and a huge monster with sharp teeth flies towards people. Chan Sung laughs loudly and shouts that the enemies have finally arrived, and then hits the monster three times. With a smile on his face, he shouts that he has not been on the battlefield for a long time. He thought that Chan Song had decided to destroy the dark blue gate that looked like a steel prison. He makes a wide attack on the green monster and shouts that he will destroy everything, including the blue gate. The main character thought that it was decided to divide the main gate between the first awakened ones and a professional team of superhumans. He adds that he plans to move separately and accidentally wander into the red core gate. The main character turns his head to Young Shin and tells him to be careful because this is a battlefield. The boy in the robot tells the main character that he will follow him, and the protagonist made a skeptical expression on his face. Dayin says that time is short, so he will cover them if necessary. Young Shin agrees with the protagonist with red cheeks. The main character, standing in the back of an armored car, commands the seventh team to take their positions, because right now they are starting to carry out their own operation. Lily and Gu Ho are standing behind the protagonist in other cars, and Young Shin is standing behind them. All military equipment is moving. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, thought that from now on they need to pretend that they are moving without a particular goal and set a course in the direction of the core of the Red Gate. Sola looks at the radar and sees many red dots near them. With a worried expression on his face, he informs the commander that monsters are approaching from all sides. The protagonist commands the team members not to slow down and let the cars drive in a crescent. He picks up a spear and thinks that it's unusual to deal with military weapons. But for a Superman with 20 years of experience, 
Mastering something like that is as easy as shelling pears. Humanoid wolf monster runs towards the car. Sola shouts that there are monsters right ahead. The protagonist commands to continue moving forward. He swings his spear while standing on the car, after which a purple-black wave of energy appears. He commands to turn right at the intersection and beware of the corpses of monsters, after which he makes several strikes and cuts up the enemies. The main character asks Lily if she is ready. The girl forms a flame between her hands and tells the protagonist that she is ready. The main character points a spear at a crowd of monsters and tells Lily to attack them. She shouts that she will quickly deal with them and then go to the meat buffet. After this, her flame becomes more powerful. She directs the flame into the crowd of monsters. Soul, Ah tells the protagonist that walking through fire is dangerous. The protagonist replies that you can't slow down and you need to keep moving. Lily with a serious expression on her face holds her hands in front of her. She directs even more flames at her enemies. Young she flies on robot jets behind three cars. He hears Lily scream loudly and then says that he will eat all the portions. He made a worried expression on his face. The protagonist smiles and thought that Lily knows how to eat. He commands everyone to move forward at full speed and turn right near the hospital and after two blocks turn left. He thought that a few more meters and they would be there. Cars drive towards the portal. Sola asks the protagonist if there is a red gate at the top of the hill. The protagonist pulls the spear back and thought that as he thought, they are here. Sola, with a smile on his face, says that apparently this is what the great sage meant in his prophecy. The main character informs the team that they are entering the red gate. Dark energy emanates from portals in the sky. Dark energy hits the ground. A huge dinosaur emerges from the dark energy and roars loudly. Giant Tyrannosaurus Rex, fiery variety. Sola reports that there is a monster at a distance of one kilometer and then asks whether to slow down. The protagonist answers with a serious expression while you need to maintain the existing speed. He thought that if they hesitated here, other monsters would come after them and they would find themselves surrounded. The protagonist orders Gu Ho to move forward and he jumps from the car and says that he will show what success he has achieved in training. Tanko jumps off the ground near the dinosaur, which has opened its mouth and is about to slam it shut. Enveloped in golden energy, Guho jumped into the monster's mouth and held its mouth open. The main character thought that this was the mana of the Golden River Stream technique. Guho gritted his teeth, and the protagonist thought that he was still able to master it, although the speed was slower than the monkeys. The protagonist tells Young Shin that it seems that it is his turn to provide support, because he himself claimed that he would provide protection. The boy immediately became wary after the words of the protagonist. He takes the order and flies straight at the dinosaur. Young Shin grabs the dinosaur's tail. The protagonist opened his eyes wide. The boy hit the dinosaur on the ground. Gu Ho, Dae In, and Enam shout that they also want to ride this thing. The main character makes a top-down attack on the monster and resolves it into two parts. The defeated dinosaur lies on the ground, and the protagonist thought that a monster of such enormous size must clearly have it inside. The main character cuts the monster into three parts and sees a pink sphere with a glow emanating from it. Core Chi Energy The protagonist thought that they were saying that this thing has a good tonic effect. Gu Ho, with a worried expression on his face, shouts to the protagonist that the monsters are approaching again. The main character with a smile on his face exclaims that then, they will jump into the gate. He imagines a volcano with a lava lake next to it and thought that in order to destroy the red core gate, he must kill the fire giant sleeping in the volcano. The protagonist reports that the armor replacement is complete. He clenches his hand into a fist and then says that the refreshing effect of these clothes is much stronger than he expected. Guho, Lily, and the protagonist are enveloped in a blue aura. The protagonist touches his shoulder and says that not only the helmet is equipped with it, but also all the protective equipment. So in the future, they will be very comfortable moving in such conditions. Sola tells the protagonist that when he first received it, he was also extremely surprised. He adds that all the equipment is made by Young Shin and calls him a really very talented guy. The protagonist thought that, as expected, he did the right thing by asking for this in advance. Young Shin addresses Lily, after which she turns to him. He asks her if she could click here. Lily presses the button and then asks the boy what it is. A bottle of liquid jumped out of the robot, which Lily caught with her hands. She thanks Young Shin with a happy expression. The boy with reddened cheeks replies that there is nothing to thank him for. Boiling lava flows from a volcano. The main character tells the team members that if everyone is ready, then they move forward. Fire dogs run towards the protagonist's team, 
and he shouts that a flock of monsters has appeared ahead. Guho jumps and asks the protagonist to leave them to him. The main character looked at him and thought that he began to move wildly. The protagonist picks up a rifle and says that then, after such a long time, he will refresh his shooting skills. Guho clenches his stone hand and asks him to tell the fire dog to attack him. He takes a fighting stance in front of two monsters and says that he is no stranger to heat. The pro. Tagonist pulls the trigger and a blue beam emanates from his rifle. The beam hits the monster, after which it freezes. The main character thought that thanks to the iron golem, he could relax a little and shoot. He adds that it's good that he decided to prepare firearms with liquid nitrogen in advance. Gu Ho, who is standing next to the frozen dogs, says that he is cold. The main character tells Young Shin, who is flying nearby, to go and do the finishing touches. A boy breaks a frozen monster. The protagonist thought that he was very comfortable in this world. The main character tells the team to keep moving at the same pace, because there is a fire centipede ahead, and then they will face a fire slug. Young Shin flies over the protagonist's car. The main character looks at Lily, who sighs heavily. He asks her why she is sighing heavily. The girl replies that fire does not work. The protagonist tells her that of course he shouldn't. He tells her that she can just rest. Lily, with a shocked expression on her face, asks how she can rest, and is there really no use for her now? The main character, who is aiming with a rifle, asks Lily what she is saying, because when she is done with everything here, she will have many opportunities to have a lot of fun, so she should be ready. Dissatisfied Lily replies that she doesn't want it that way. She lowered her head a little, and her cheeks turned red. Cars are heading towards the volcano. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, tells his team to stop. He thought that so far there had been no difficulties in moving forward, but this lava lake was a huge problem. The protagonist's team is approaching a lava lake. The main character says that there are no monsters near the lake. He asks the medical team to bring him the corpse of one of the monsters. Ayel Nam hands the protagonist the corpse of a rat monster on a tray. A huge snake crawls out from under the lava. The main character sighs and says that if they started crossing without checking, then trouble would happen. He says that first he needs to catch this monster, and then turns to Soul Ah and asks if the technical support team has a giant fishing rod. He adds that even a disposable one will do. A guy with an alarmed expression on his face asks the main character if he really wants to go fishing for this snake, and he replies that he needs to try. Soul Ah runs away and tells the protagonist to wait a minute. The main character turns to Gu Ho and Young Shin, and then tells them that they will choose bait while they wait for the fishing rod. He tells them that they must play rock, paper, scissors. The two guys look at each other after that. Gu Ho cries and screams. Young Shin flies through the air while tied to the end of a fishing rod's line. The snake swallows the tank and closes its mouth. Young Shin pulls back on Gu Ho. The monster screams loudly as it is pulled out. Gu Ho, with a double-bladed device in his hand, says that once inside, he must use it. The double-edged device cuts the snake's mouth from above and below. The main character commands Young Shin to pull with all his might. A boy pulls a monster out of lava. The snake hits the stone floor. The main character screams and asks Gu Ho if he is okay. The tank jumped out of the monster's mouth and replied that he was fine. He and the protagonist made surprised expressions on their faces. Someone got caught on the top of the volcano from the inside. The main character thought that a fire giant was really coming out of the crater. A fiery stone monster emerges from the lava inside a volcano. The protagonist wonders if they woke up because they were making noise. He looks at the moving snake and thought that he would have to reconsider their strategy and then notes that first of all they need to deal with this snake and retreat. He jumped away from the attack from the snake's tail. Gu Ho grabs the snake by the tail and shouts that he needs to act now. The protagonist makes two spear strikes to the monster's head and commands Young Shin to attack from the left, after which he replies that he understands everything. Dain thought that this monster was not giving them even a second to change lanes. The main character and Young Shin attacked the monster at the same time. The protagonist thought that the attacks weren't working and then wondered how strong this monster's scales were. The snake opens its mouth and green energy emanates from it. The main character jumped away from the enemy and commands his allies to dodge. With a wary look, he thought that Young Shin did not have enough experience to face this kind of monster. The boy with a nervous expression says that the robot has a self-healing function. The protagonist commands him to retreat, and he will distract his attention. He tells Gu Ho to retreat as well to check his condition. Gu Ho accepts the protagonist's order with a surprised expression. Inam, with a worried expression on his face, asks the protagonist if it will be okay if he fights alone. 
Young Shin takes Gu Ho by the hand and flies off on jet engines. The protagonist with an alarmed expression on his face says that so far there are no problems with this. Inam reports that they are exploring this place with the help of cameras, but that enemy on the mountain poses a danger. The snake's tail is directed towards the main character, but he dodges the attack. The protagonist, with a concentrated expression on his face, says that he knows, and then reveals that the villain on the mountain is a more serious problem. Inam replies that yes, his height is about 40 meters, and perhaps it is because of his size that he is approaching too quickly. The protagonist hits the monster's tail, but misses, and then thinks that the closer he gets, the more clearly he realizes its enormous size. He wonders if, before he returned in time, the attack on this place was organized by the first awakened ones. He got angry and thought that now the one who opposes him is him. He wonders what to do. The main character opens his mouth and after a short pause begins to speak. He commands the seventh team to get into the cars and sit in the deep rear before his signal. Gu Ho and Lily became worried after the words of the protagonist. The main character thought about what his original plan was. First of all, he wanted to catch the monster snake in the lava lake. He imagined standing on a fallen snake. Then he had to plunge the fong of an ice dragon into the body of the fire giant sleeping in the volcano. He imagines plunging a fong into the giant's chest. After that, he had to quickly run away before the fire giant awakened. The main character imagines himself standing on a fallen giant with a spear in his hands. In the end, he had to hunt him, weakened by the energy of the ice dragon's fong. The protagonist thought it was a flawless plan. He pulls his spear back and turns to the members of the seventh team and commands them to go to the rear and wait for him to call them. Gu Ho touches the communicator in his ear and asks the protagonist how they can leave it and leave. Lily's expression looks worried. The protagonist asks the tank if he doesn't know that when whales fight, shrimp die. He adds that if they stay, the same fate awaits them here. The main character smiles and blue streams of energy begin to emanate from him and then says that they need to make the whales fight each other so that they drive themselves to death. The protagonist jumps towards the snake. He runs down his long body and uses sky-shattering energy flying step. He jumped away from the monster, and the snake opened its mouth, after which acid poured out of it in a powerful stream. The protagonist cut the monster's tongue with a lightning strike. The protagonist runs away from the monster and shouts to him that he is here. With a serious expression on his face, he touches the communicator and asks the team if they all manage to move to a safe place. Lily shouts that she doesn't want to and will go to him. Blood sprayed from the protagonist's ear. He kicks off the ground and tells the team members to do everything they can to keep the baby out, even if she refuses to listen to them. The giant comes towards the protagonist and fiery clots emanate from him. Dayin runs among the clots of fire towards the monster with a spear in his hands. And then he thought that the heat was so strong that, despite the presence of protective equipment, it was difficult to breathe. He made a shocked expression. The snake hits the protagonist with its tail, but he dodges. The giant approaches the snake. He hits him, and the protagonist, watching this, thought to keep it up. The wounded snake growls angrily. He stands opposite the fire giant. The giant makes a strike at the serpent, but hits the ground as it dodges. He covers himself with his hand as the snake spews acid at him. His hand became covered in acid. The main character looks out from behind the stone and says that the giant is an excellent fighter. He takes out the box and thought that all that was left was to find the right moment and use the ice dragon's fawn. He adds that it will have a good effect only if it is inserted into the area near the heart. He puts on white gloves and thought that when the opportunity arises, he will plant a fawn in his chest and run away. The snake wraps its tail around the giant's hand. He wraps himself around the head of the giant, who screams loudly because of this. The main character uses the hiding skill, after which he becomes transparent. He jumps off the rock. The giant opens his eyes wide. Flames emanate from his body. The snake screams loudly in pain. The giant struck the serpent with his hand. The protagonist, with an alarmed expression on his face, clutches a fong in his hand. He uses sky-shattering energy, flying step. He thought that one way or another, while he was intoxicated with victory, he needed to. Hurry up and attack. He rushes towards the giant's chest. The giant tries to grab the protagonist with his hand, and he uses the shield, but he does not have time to appear. The giant hits the stone floor with his hand. A stone handprint remains on the floor. Lily's hair flutters in the wind. She asks the protagonist if he saw it. She put her hands to her belt and tells the protagonist that without her he almost died. The main character looks at the girl and asks her why she came. 
Lily, with a joyful expression on her face, replies that she is here to earn the cost of food. The fire giant screams at the protagonist and the girl. Lily puts her hands forward and directs flames at the monster, and then screams that she will destroy it. The main character tells her not to do this. The giant opens his mouth. He sucks Lily's flame into himself. Hot steam emanates from his mouth. Lily opens her eyes wide and is surprised that the monster can eat fire. The main character, with a bewildered face, replies that's why he said not to attack. The protagonist closes his eyes and with a worried look on his face, he thought that it was like pouring gasoline into a tank and then adds that he dropped his weapon and fong when Lily saved him from certain death. He wonders what to do. The protagonist tells Lily that first they need to go back and develop a new strategy. The girl clenches her hands in a fist and tells the protagonist that it seems she can do this too. She opens her mouth and inhales air. The giant looks at the protagonist and the girl. Lily absorbs the giant's fire. The protagonist, sitting on the barrier she created, thought it was a grandiose spectacle. The giant runs away, and the protagonist wonders if he is running away because Lily has a higher level of fire control. The giant trembles and points his hand forward. The protagonist looks at the giant, who froze and stopped emitting flames. He thought it was an amazing strategy. He looks in bewilderment at Lily, who is absorbing the last of the flames, and then thinks that he never thought that it was possible to win in such a way. Gray spots appear on a white background. Soon after the destruction of the Red Gate, the other main gates were also destroyed in turn. There is a crane near the construction site. The disaster was averted faster than last time, and within a week most construction companies and citizens volunteered to rebuild the city. This also applies to the seventh team. Min Jae tells the team to speed up and then suggests finishing everything today. He tells the first head of the IL NOM support squad that he said that this is not how it is done. Gu Ho is talking to a construction worker while robot manager Young Shin is welding. One of the two construction workers sitting at the table asks Min Jae if those guys are called the seventh team of the White House. The guy replies that usually people who come from superhuman guilds do not undertake manual labor. Min Jae clenches his hand into a fist and asks what is the use of a person who is simply chilling in the guild. He adds that if help is needed somewhere, then you need to immediately run to provide it. The construction worker pours a drink into Min Jae's glass and tells him that they are very grateful for such an attitude. The black-haired guy thanks the builder, and he says that everyone else should also rest a little. He adds that they should also at least eat something. Inam agrees with the builder's words with a joyful expression on his face. The builder with the stubble tells the members of the seventh team that they are all working hard, and then asks what is so special about the man who does nothing. Min Jae and Inam became worried after his words. The blue-haired guy says that this is their commander, and then asks not to misunderstand because he simply has not yet healed his wounds. The protagonist and Lily are lying on cots. The girl eats popcorn. The protagonist smiles and seems to be shining. The builder asks what wounds he is talking about because his snow-white face indicates that he has never faced any difficulties in his life. Inam replies with a smile on his face that it was the commander who offered to provide support to the community. Guho slams his hand on the table and says that he has eaten. He gets up and asks the builders what else he needs help with. One of the builders also gets up and tells the other builder that it's time for them to wrap up and get to work. The second builder agrees. The first builder tells Gu Ho to follow him. Tank agrees with a smile on his face. After the end of the disaster, the interdimensional gates will not open for 31 days. The green-robed protagonist causes the stone in his staff to glow. According to the last prophecy left by the great sage Aximus, the gates have not opened in the past few days. Thanks to this, many people united and quickly rebuilt the city. Daylight illuminates multi-story buildings. The superhuman guilds also had busy days, disposing of monster corpses and conducting research. Yun Havai tells the protagonist that she sees that he is still resting. The main character is distracted from the book and looks at the girl. She asks the protagonist if he is bored with idleness, and he replies that he is not at all because his dream is to indulge in idleness all his life. Lily turns her head to the protagonist and exclaims that she knows who she should be, an unemployed person who has a lot of money. The main character thought that she was a walking pest, but in view of her merits during the raid, she should be given a rest. Yun Vi was surprised and turns to the protagonist. She tells him that his skin has become so perfect. The protagonist touches his cheek with a smile on his face and then notices that Yun Vi noticed it. He thought that this was the flesh change activated by the fire giant's spiritual stone. 
He imagines the fire giant's energy being redirected towards the protagonist and enveloping him. He thought that now he could enjoy life in a body with beautiful skin even after retirement. The protagonist, with a joyful expression on his face, holds a stone in his hand, the energy around which forms a heart, and says that a few days ago, he underwent a series of procedures. Yun Havai puts his palms together and, with an admiring expression on his face, asks the protagonist where exactly he passed her and whether he will give her the contacts of that place. The main character replies that they went bankrupt and went out of business. Yun Havai asks the protagonist not to be greedy and will share information with her. The main character asks her if she really came to ask him about this, and she replies that no. Dayin thought that even though there was still half of the spiritual stone's mana left, he had already found another use for it. Yun Vai tells the protagonist that she is here to report on potions. She adds that they have increased the number of production plants to three, but supplies are still not enough. She adds that there are also requests for partnerships. The protagonist takes the documents that the girl gave him. In the documents, he read that the BD potion was gaining explosive popularity after it played an important role during the disaster. The protagonist imagines two bottles, one with a blue potion, the other with a yellow one. It is based on the drink of life and is currently exclusively supplied by the White House. Thanks to him, people who should have died survive safely. The main character imagines a wounded construction worker who is given a potion by a medic. He read in the document that even those who were destined to live the rest of their lives as cripples recovered. Deaths are estimated to have dropped by a tenth, so demand will continue to rise. The protagonist tells Yun Vi that she has done an excellent job, and then adds that she must decide the partnership issue on her own. The black-haired girl holds another document in her hand, and says that the next report concerns the body of the fire giant. The main character replies that they should let him go. He asks that 20 kilograms of skin, bones, and blood be left to him, and the rest should be disposed of at his own discretion. Then he asks what will happen next. Yun Havai sighs and asks the main character if he will take part in the joint funeral ceremony for the fallen today. The protagonist lowered his head onto the cot and tells the girl that it will most likely not be crowded, so he will refuse. An angry Yun Havai asks the protagonist why he asked for information about the families of the victims. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, says that even though it's summer, he decided to call Santa Claus. Suho stands in front of the monument and says that 427 people died that day. There are many people standing behind him. He says with a sad expression that among them are soldiers, policemen, and superhumans. He adds that everyone was someone's parent, child, friend, citizen of this country. Suho approaches the monument and says that they will never forget the sacrifices of these heroes. The people behind him cry after these words. The girl asks her mother when dad will come. Mom starts crying and the girl tells her not to do it and then asks what to do if Santa Claus doesn't come to her. Mom replies that she won't cry anymore. Su Ho closes his eyes and thought that he did not have the courage to look into the face of the great sage. He looks up at the sky and sees a trail of energy. He asks if there are monsters there and then points out that this contradicts the prophecy. The main character in a Santa Claus costume, Lily in an elf costume, and a fairy are flying on a sleigh in the sky. The girl with a surprised expression on her face tells her mother that there is Santa in the sky. An orange portal appears in the sky. Suho moves his hand to the side and yells for everyone to stay alert, then calm man. DS his men to protect the civilians. He says that he doesn't know who it is, but he will appear at such a moment, it's low. He pushes off from the ground and green streams of energy begin to emanate from him. He looks up and sees swirling streams of fiery energy in the sky. The brown-haired girl points to the sky and tells her mother to look there, and then says that Santa Claus has really come. An explosion of energy occurs above the protagonist in the sleigh, which looks like fireworks. Joyful children raise their hands up. Three fairies in elf costumes fly near streams of energy, and soap bubbles come from them. Joyful children catch soap bubbles with their palms. Suho subordinate, with a worried look on his face, asks him what to do with the attack order, and he closes his eyes and commands to cancel it. He opens his eyes and says that this is not a monster, but Santa Claus. The protagonist and Lily fly onto the roof of the White House building. The red-haired girl jumped off the sled and exclaimed that they left gifts in all the houses and it was a lot of fun. The protagonist also gets off the sleigh and tells Lily and the fairies that everyone has done a great job and now they will go eat something tasty. Lily replies that she is all excited. Yunhavai appears and asks the protagonist if they landed safely. The protagonist takes off his coat and replies that yes, the sleigh and suit were useful. 
Univai crossed her arms and replies that it was not difficult to get them. But in return, the protagonist must say why he made such a plan. She imagines a sealed envelope and reports that it was very labor-intensive to provide monetary support to all the families of the victims, which in some ways is very labor-intensive. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, turns his pupils to the side and answers that he doesn't even know. He thought that all the fallen were soldiers, policemen, and superhumans, and most of them were heads of families, and what their families needed most now was real help. He remembers standing at the altar dedicated to the deceased and thinking that government subsidies cannot be called such, they are small. He smiles and says that he was simply able to do it because he decided because he had the opportunity. He reports that he often sleeps during the day and is idle, and when he gets bored, he helps those who are having a hard time. Yun Vi was surprised by the protagonist's words. The main character says that he thinks that he can continue to live well, even if he adheres to this lifestyle. The girl puts her hand to her cheek, closes her eyes, and then sighs and says that she is really extremely worried. The main character asks her why, and is she really afraid that he will become a sissy and a slobber? Yun Vi opens one eye and with a smile on his face denies the protagonist's words, and then says that if he continues in the same spirit, she will truly fall in love with him, although, of course, she still likes him. The protagonist leaves and tells the girl that she should start a romantic relationship elsewhere. The girl got angry after the protagonist's words. She says that maybe he said so, but maybe he's just playing hard to get. The main character sighs and answers the girl that, in fact, he hears everything. Lily runs to the table and enjoys the party. Dayin and Yoon Havai follow her. The red-haired girl exclaims that today she will eat everything here. The main character became alarmed after her words. Min Jae tells the protagonist to pass quickly, and Gu Ho calls the commander. The main character tells the team that they have worked hard to restore the city. Young Shin points to a two-seater table with several dishes on it and tells Lily that he prepared this table especially for her. The girl tells the boy that he is the best. The main character sits down at a double table and asks Young Shin if there are only two chairs. Lily took a piece of pizza and eats it. There is bewilderment on the boy's face. The protagonist wipes Lily's face and tells her to eat little by little, and she agrees. He looked at her and thought that she had never started a conversation about her parents. He asks her if she wants to see her family, after which the girl makes a puzzled expression on her face. Lily lowered her gaze, and the protagonist tells her that she never talked about her family, and then asks her if it might be that she is bored or curious about how her household lives. Young Shin asks the main character if he scolded Lily. The protagonist props his head with his hand and replies that's not the point. They just had a serious conversation. He tells the girl that if she doesn't want to answer, then don't, and in return, let her just tell her if she wants to meet her parents. The girl got nervous and said what she wanted, but there was one problem. The main character pats her on the head and tells her that then she needs to go and meet them on the guy continent. He removes his hand from her head and says that it's been a while since he spent time sightseeing and moreover, he needs to stock up on some medicine. He adds that in between times you can drop by to see your parents. The girl agrees with the protagonist. Lily runs along the path. They're four surrounded. She sees the protagonist and calls him. She takes the protagonist by the hand and, with a frightened expression on her face, asks him to help. A man with purple hair wearing a mask smiles ominously and asks the girl if she is telling him this. Lily wakes up in her bed with horror on her face and screams loudly. He raises his torso and breathes heavily. She opens the door to the protagonist's room and asks him if he is awake. The protagonist opens one of his eyes and wipes the other. Lily goes to bed next to him and says that to be honest, she doesn't want to go back but she has to. She says with a serious expression that she wants to see her mother and she made a promise to Wendy. She says that she hopes everything is fine with him. Lily clings to the protagonist and trembles. She tells the protagonist that she has always been hungry. She remembers the times when she lay in bed with her mother and her hair was blonde. The girl's mother hugs her daughter and says that she is very sorry. The girl turns to her mother. The woman apologizes to Lily, and the girl replies that everything is fine and she is glad that her mother is next to her. Morning light falls on the mountains. Mom asks her daughter to listen to her carefully. She, holding her daughter by the cheek and shoulder, tells her that she will go to work as a maid in a very rich house, and if she obeys the owners, then she will not have to starve. She asks her daughter if she understood, and Lily gives a positive answer. Mom hugs her daughter, who thought that she would definitely return later. A cart rides along the road between the trees. Lily opened her eyes wide. There are many children sitting in a cart in front of her. The girl asks Lily what her name is, after which she is surprised. 
A blue-eyed girl with long hair introduces herself as Wendy, then says that she is cold and asks Lily if she can sit closer to her. Lily agrees, after which Wendy snuggles up to her and thanks her, and then tells her that she is so warm. She asks Lily how old she is, and when she heard her age, she is surprised and says that she is a year older than her. Someone lifts the fabric of the cart near Lily and tells the children to get out. Men in raincoats accompany the children. One of the children wonders where they are. Another child reports that he was told that they would go to the city. Someone with a whip appeared in front of the children. A man in a goblin mask tells the children that they should shut their mouths and silently follow him. Lily remembers how she and Wendy were behind bars and thought that the children who arrived with them disappeared one by one. And after that, the memories are foggy. Someone says that this is already X transaction on the account. They answer him that it's true. The essence of fire. X blood. A fragment of X. Lily with an exhausted face lies on the table. Someone says that everything was successfully implanted. Two people in robes with hoods on were leaning over the girl with a magic circle behind them. One of them asks if their body is rejecting them. The other replies that there are no symptoms yet. Streams of red symbols fly by. The first of the people in robes says that the probability is very high and then says that they are starting. The second one is surprised by the reaction of the girl's body. The first one notices that this is a success because the mark was placed on her body. Pain can be seen on Lily's face. She closed her eyes. One of the people in robes says that their cherished wish has finally come true. Another asks if there will be any side effects. The first one answers that it is not yet known, but even if they do, it doesn't matter because this girl will become a monster. Lily thought that from that day on she began to feel even more hungry. A purple magic circle appears on her stomach, which Wendy looks at. She hands Lily the bread and tells her to eat, and she replies that it's not her share. Wendy tells her friend that if she doesn't eat it, she will throw it away. Lily looks at the bread with an appetite on her face and replies that okay then. She eats the bread and tells Wendy that she is very hungry, then apologizes. The friend replies that everything is fine. Lily thought that one day, Wendy suggested running away. Wendy shows Lily the ice crystals in her hands that look like a flower. Lily asks her friend how she did it. Wendy, whose hair color has changed, replies that she doesn't know. Lily thought that her friend's hair color had changed. Wendy, whose hair has turned blue, clenches her hand into a fist and invites Lily to run away. The heroine, with a joyful expression on her face, accepts her friend. Proposal. Moonlight illuminates the treetops. Wendy screams to let her go. The masked man holds the blue-haired girl by the neck and calls her a scoundrel, and then says that he did not expect that she had already awakened. He adds that if she had said earlier, she would not have had to suffer in that cell. Lily, who was grabbed by a man in a robe, screams and asks her friend to let her go. Wendy points shards of ice at the masked man and screams at him to die. The man is enveloped in green energy, which takes the blow. He smiles and tells the girl that she didn't even leave a scratch. With a menacing look, he shouts to the girl that in the future, having become a puppet, she will do great things. Wendy grabs the enemy's hand and thought that even if she had to die, she would never return to the cell. She directs streams of blue energy at the robed men who were holding Lily, after which she shouts at her that at least she must escape. A masked man with a dissatisfied expression on his face screams and asks Wendy how dare she do this. Flames form near Lily. Her hair turned red and she, looking at her hand, says that, like Wendy, something has appeared. The masked man turns around and shouts that girl has also awakened, and then commands his subordinates to quickly grab her. Wendy, who controls the blue energy, yells at Lily to get her thoughts together. With a serious expression on her face, she shouts that now is the only chance. She asks Lily to leave now. The red-haired girl opened her eyes wide with a sad expression on her face. Lily runs away while Wendy creates a huge amount of ice behind her. The morning sun is rising in the sky. The heroine mentally turned to Wendy and asked her to wait because she will certainly return. Lily enters the orange portal. One of the men in robes shouts and asks where the gate came from. The other commands to quickly go after her. Another one of them shouts that the gates have closed. Lily thought that she would definitely return and save her friend. She sleeps with her eyes closed. The protagonist raises his torso and looks at the sleeping girl and then thinks about the goblin mask. Chan Sung slammed his fist on the table and screamingly asks the main character if he is in his right mind now. He asks him how he can ask for a month's leave when a disaster just recently occurred because he knows how busy the guild employees are now. 
The protagonist stands in front of him in a brown jacket, and behind him is Yoon Vi. With a confident look, he says that he must definitely take a vacation, and then adds that he still has one personal request. The head of the guild shouts that he doesn't know what this is about, but he won't be able to fulfill it. Chan Sung shouts to him that if he wants to go on vacation, he can give him one week next month. The main character looked angry and thought that he did not want to resort to such a method. He asks Univai, what is the expected profit from the BD potion this month? The surprised girl hesitated. The protagonist says that he heard that the number of orders is so large that they do not have time to produce potions. So he wondered if he should focus entirely on supplying only this one. Chan Sung, with concern on his face, asks the main character what he is getting in now. Dayin reports that they say the value of the loot from the main gate is enormous. However, even if the achievements of all teams were combined, they would not be one iota closer to the successes of the seventh. He asks if he should stay in a guild that treats him this way. The head of the guild looks down and asks the protagonist if he is really threatening him now. The protagonist asks the head what the amount of compensation for violation of the contract is. Chan Sung, with an angry expression on his face, replies that he understands everything and asks the protagonist if he didn't just need a vacation, and then calls him soulless. The main character sighs. He thanks the head with a smile on his face, and then tells him that when he returns, he will buy him a gift. Chan Sung sighs and asks the main character what he is going to do for a whole month. The protagonist replies that he needs to find one person. Yoon Havai tells the main character that if it comes to searching, they will do it much faster, and then asks him if she should connect search networks. Dayin turns to her and replies that no, he must handle it himself and bring her here. He conjures images of Wendy and a man in a goblin mask. He got angry and thought that he would finish off another scoundrel. The protagonist asks the head, what about the request? Chan Sung sits down at the table and asks the protagonist what else is there. Dayin tells everything to the chapter, after which he, with a surprised expression on his face, asks the main character if he is sane. That evening, White House. Housing for rent. The main character holds a red crayon in his hand and tells Lily that this is the continent of Guy. He drew a map of the island where he marked one place with red chalk. He says that the place Lily mentioned is around this area. The girl with reddened cheeks replies that her house is there. Someone knocks on the door and the protagonist asks Lily if she called anyone she knows and the girl gives a negative answer. Young Shin and his mother enter the apartment. The woman greets the protagonist with Lily and asks if they mind if they come over for a while. The protagonist allows them to pass, after which Lily and Young Shin are greeted. The woman tells the main character that her son wanted to voice the purpose of their visit himself. The boy shifted his pupils to the protagonist. With a confident expression on his face, he tells him that he also wants to go on vacation with Lily. The protagonist covers his mouth with his hand and thought that in fact he chatted so often about his vacation so that the news about it would reach him. He adds that traveling becomes easier when you have a master with you who can make anything out of anything. With a stern expression on his face, he asks the boy if he will be allowed because they will cross the control zone and there will be dangers everywhere. He adds that he will have to face a huge number of surprises. Young Shin, with a worried expression on his face, exclaims that he just might take the golem with him. The main character asks his mother what she thinks about this. The woman replies that she agrees because her son is not one of those who will refuse to go because of the ban. She adds that she only asks for it to be returned safe and sound. The protagonist approaches the woman and replies that it's good. He will return unharmed. Young Shin says Lily's name. With reddened cheeks, he presses his palm to his chest and tells the girl that even though he is weaker than her, he is trying his best to be useful. The girl puts her hands behind her back and is very happy after the boy's words. Late night, White House building. The protagonist is standing in the elevator with a sword on his belt and thought that he did not expect that he would come here on his own feet. White House, 12th underground floor. The elevator doors open and a bare-chested Chan Sung stands in front of the protagonist. Chan Sung's personal training room. The guild leader, standing among the cracks and debris, informs the protagonist that he is late. The main character replies that he arrived 10 minutes earlier. Chan Sung asks if it's true and then says that he's so excited that he decided to warm up. He turns his head slightly towards the protagonist and tells him that it is very unexpected that in a personal request he asked for a three-day, one-on-one duel with him, and previously dodged the answer every time he offered to fight. The main character laughs. He imagines the silhouettes of a warrior wearing a horned helmet and holding an axe in his hand, and another warrior behind him. He thought that there were stronger warriors on the Gai continent than those currently on Earth, 
so he needed to test how effective the martial arts he had mastered by studying the Sword Emperor's records were. He imagines a dark silhouette standing on a red magic circle and thought that the head is the strongest person with whom he can easily make an appointment. He is quite a suitable opponent. Dain unsheathes his sword and tells Chan Sung that he is counting on him for the next few days. The head answers the protagonist that he is also counting on him. He gets into a fighting stance and asks if it's time for them to start doing a little warm-up, after which a powerful, golden aura emanates from him. The protagonist, with a frightened expression on his face, tells the head that during the day, he behaved too impudently. Chan Sung runs to the main character and shouts that less words, more action. He strikes, causing a bright, golden energy to appear. Three days later, Lily, with a serious expression on her face, asks the protagonist what's wrong with his eye. She gets angry and asks him if he was hit, and then adds that she will give him a beating. The protagonist puts his hand to his ear and tells the girl to better pack her luggage. He imagines how joyful Chan Sung beat him and thought that thanks to the three-day duel with the head, he was able to adapt to the use of the Sword Emperor's martial arts. Dayin swings his sword wide at Chan Sung, but he dodges it. He thought that yesterday, as a result of unsuccessfully repelling an attack, he was mercilessly beaten. The main character drinks a health potion and wonders how the world managed to give birth to such a monster. White House, First Floor Lobby. Chan Sung raises his fist and tells the protagonist that he has finally come down. Standing next to him are Gu Ho and Yun Vi. The head, with a smile on his face, asks the main character if he is excited about the vacation and then advises him not to go anywhere and not let himself be beaten. The main character with a tired face answers the head that thanks to him. Now it's unlikely that anyone will be able to beat him up. He tells Gu Ho that in his absence, he will be the one to lead the seventh team. The tank, with concern on his face, asks the protagonist if he can do it. The protagonist runs his thumb along his neck and tells Gu Ho that if he acts like a fool, everyone else will become the same. He adds that if the team's reputation is ruined upon his return, then he should prepare for the consequences. Gu Ho cries and replies that he will try his best. Min Jae sighs and pats the guy on the back. The main character thought that he still didn't know that he was one of the best tanks. With a serious expression, he tells Min Jae to make sure Gu Ho handles everything well. The black-haired guy with a smile on his face accepts the protagonist's order. The protagonist turns his head towards Yoon Vi and addresses her. She closes her eyes and her cheeks are red. The main character, with a serene expression on his face, asks the girl why she is behaving this way and whether there is a speck in her eye. The girl grabs the protagonist and with an angry expression asks him if he really doesn't know that he needs to kiss goodbye. The main character turns his head to the side and asks Yun Vi what she is talking about and then says that he just wanted to ask her to fulfill his request properly. Behind the girl stands Chan Sung, from whom a destructive dark aura emanates. Yun Vi asks the protagonist if he really only intends to exploit her. The main character thought that he was not ready to die yet. He turns his back to them and says that, in general, he will be back soon. Lily raises her palm and bids farewell to the rest of the guild. The head of the guild wishes them to have a good rest, after which the main character and Lily leave. Chan Sung puts his hand on his daughter's shoulder and asks her why she has such a worried expression on her face. Yoon Vi, with a sad expression on her face, says that she is simply worried in her soul as if they will not be able to see each other again. She asks if she is wrong to think so. She turns her head and looks at her father, who tells her that there is no need to worry about it. Commander Dae-in is much stronger than he seems at first glance. He recalls how the protagonist, in a fighting stance, formed two copies of the sword using a skill. He says that in particular he almost got into trouble yesterday. Yoon Vi asks if this is true, and her father says yes. Chan Sung clenches his hand into a fist and says that when he returns, he will invite him to fight one more time, and until then he needs to devote himself to special training. The protagonist is alarmed and wonders why he felt so anxious in his soul. Shelter in a restricted area. Young Shin turns to the protagonist when he sees his worried expression. The main character takes off his backpack and tells the boy not to pay attention, and then asks him if he said goodbye to his mother properly. Young Shin gives a positive answer. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, replies that okay then, and then says that he also assured her of the safety of the trip, so he thinks she won't worry too much. He asks the boy if he heard on the way here that the vacation trip was a lie, and then adds that they are planning to go to another dimension for Lily's mother. Young Shin picks up the smartphone and tells the protagonist that nothing matters when it comes to Lily, and he also modified the golem as he asked. He presses a button on the smartphone screen. Smoke is coming from the robot. 
He transformed into a carriage with a horse. Lily exclaims that this is so cool. Young Shin, with reddened cheeks, touches his cheek with his finger and says that the golem originally had a transformation function. He only slightly adjusted it. Admiration can be seen on Lily's face. And the surprised protagonist wonders how it is even possible to achieve such a transformation by making small adjustments. Confused, Young Shin says that there are other forms. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, tells the boy that he will show him later. But for now, the carriage is enough for them. He became alert, and blue energy emanated from his eye. The protagonist goes towards the blue streams of energy and invites his companions to open the gate first. He stopped near the source of energy from which the streams emanate. He drew a magic circle on the ground and thought that the continent of Gai and the earth were already connected. The passage was simply still closed. He holds a blue stone in his hand and thought that the fixed gate would have to open on its own in a year, but if you use the spiritual stone, then it can be opened right now. He clenches his hand into a fist, after which a bright blue light emanates from him. He opens his fist and a clot of energy floats above his palm, from which many streams emanate. The energy swirls and the protagonist tells the team members to get into the carriage. A carriage with a horse stands near the portal. Lily is worried and trembling. The main character tells her that they are moving forward. The girl was happy after the protagonist's words. A horse and carriage enters the portal. She entered the portal completely. Someone shouts orders to find him, even if they have to turn everything upside down. Wooden houses are burning in the city. A man with a bandage on his forehead stabbed a man in the back who was begging for mercy. A brown-haired man killed strikes the hand of one of the residents, who asked not to touch the child. An old man tied to a post tells a red-haired man with a club that they, vile scoundrels, deserve to be punished, and then asks how they can do such a thing. The scoundrel replies that it would be nice if he told everything he knows. He points his finger at the old man, and then tells him that if he continues to keep his mouth shut, then everything will end very badly. He asks him if he really wishes death for his children and grandchildren, and then asks where they hid him. A mustachioed man in a raincoat is hiding around the corner. He takes his sword out of its sheath and thinks that he cannot allow his benefactor, the village chief, to die. He mentally apologizes to the teacher. A portal appears, from which a carriage appears. The mustachioed man calls his enemies scoundrels, and then adds that he is the one they are looking for. The carriage and horse land on the ground. Someone exclaims that something suddenly fell from the sky. A mustachioed man, with an alarmed expression on his face, wonders what this is, and is it really a teleportation spell of enormous power? Some of the villains say that it looks like a carriage. The protagonist complains of pain in his bones and opens the door. He touches his cheek with his finger and says that if he had known that everything would be like this, he would have gotten into the carriage after arriving here. In front of the main character are a scoundrel and a tied-up old man. Lily asks the main character what is outside after which the main character closes the door, causing the girl to hit her head. He tells her not to come out yet. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, tells the villains that they picked a good moment. He turns his head. He sees a man with his hair tied in a long ponytail, with a cut visible on his arm. A little boy is crying and calling his mother. A crying girl covers his mouth. Black and blue energy emanates from the protagonist, and he calls the villains vile creatures, and then asks them if they even know what kind of village this is. The protagonist imagines a portal to the city among the wooden houses and thought that in this village a year later a gate leading to the earth would open. He imagines a lot of gold coins and thought that, therefore, if this area is developed, the price of his land will increase significantly. A mustachioed man in a cloak sits on the floor and screams, asking the protagonist to help him, calling him Mr. Magician. The protagonist asks him if he is addressing him. A mustachioed man with wide, open eyes answers yes and then says that given teleportation on such a scale and an unusual carriage, he must be a magician who has reached heights that he never even dreamed of. He takes out a bag of gold and tells the protagonist that if he helps them, they will reward him in full. The main character with a smug smile reaches out to the gold and says that he likes the reward. He thought that he had grabbed a few magic stones to exchange them for cash, but everything turned out much better. The mustachioed man tells the protagonist that if he takes care of these thieves, he will pay him ten times more. A man in a cloak with a hood, with concern on his face, wonders if he is a real magician. A man with a bandage on his forehead asks if they accidentally got into something they shouldn't have. A red-haired, dark-skinned man shouts at his subordinates that they are useless fools, and then adds that the fool next to the magician is clearly one of the people they are looking for. He adds that his comrades must also be nearby, 
so he needs to call everyone here. He points his finger at the main character and shouts at him to take the money that they just gave him and then get out of here. The protagonist begins to count the money. He pours the coins into his palm and counts to 20. The angry red-haired scoundrel asks the main character if he is deaf. The main character tells the mustachioed man that there are 35 gold coins and then asks him if he said that he would pay 10 times more if he dealt with those thieves. The man with reddened cheeks replies that yes, that's right. The main character asks him if he should just kill them for 700 gold coins. The mustachioed man, with a shocked expression, says that this is 20 times more. The protagonist turns around and tells him that if he doesn't want to, he can forget. The mustachioed man put his hand to the protagonist and shouts to him that he will pay. The protagonist says he accepts the request and then thinks that he was going to do it anyway, so he'll just kill two birds with one stone. The red-haired man is trembling. He pulls the club back and commands the crossbowman behind him to shoot at the main character before he uses magic. The main character uses the shield skill, after which the barrier stops all the bolts that rush at him. He opens the carriage door and tells the kids to get out. He asks them to put out the fire first, after which Lily runs out of the carriage and takes the order of the main character. The girl points her palm forward. The flames are heading towards her. The flame gathers over the girl's palm. She eats the flame and exclaims that this fire is not tasty at all. One of the villains wonders if that girl is also a magician. The red-haired scoundrel commands his men to bring out the fighting ogre, because a magician is nothing if no one protects him. A huge ogre appears with a necklace of fangs and screams loudly. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, asks young Shin to deal with him. The boy accepts the protagonist's order. He gets on the horse. He puts his hand to the horse's neck and tells it to take action. Yuzuri is surprised when he sees the horse transform into a robot. He shouts and asks if this is a golem and how this is possible. The robot stands opposite the ogre, which is running towards it. The ogre swings his axe at Young Shin. His axe shatters due to the impact. Confusion can be seen on the ogre's face. Young Shin hits the ogre's head. The robot pinned the ogre to the floor. A man in a bandage with concern on his face shouts that the battle ogre is defeated. A scoundrel with white hair runs and screams, asking how this thing can be defeated. A wall of fire appears in front of them. The main character pierced the white-haired scoundrel, stunned by the fire, in the back. With a lightning strike, the main character cuts off the arm of one enemy and cuts the back of another. He found himself in front of them. The red-haired villain shouts to the protagonist to stop, after which he shifts his pupils in his direction. A dark-skinned man holds a club to the old man's head and shouts that one more step and he will finish this old man off. The mustachioed man shouts that the headman is in danger. He screams and asks the protagonist to help the old man because he is his benefactor. The protagonist replies that he really should save him since he is the headman. The red-haired man shouts to the mustachioed man that if he wants to save the headman, then he should put out the fire and remove this horse, and the protagonist should throw his sword to the side. The main character ends up behind him and swings his sword while he talks about what will happen to the protagonist if he doesn't do this. The protagonist hits the enemy. He stands near his body and thought that the art is a combination of concealment and a flying ball of energy that destroys the skies. He adds that this is the first time he has used it in a real fight, and the results are pretty good. He notices something under the scoundrel's paper. He puts it in his coat. The headman bows to the protagonist group and tells them that without them, the benefactors, they would all be dead. He adds that as the village chief, he is extremely grateful for saving the village. There are soups, sausages, and pastries on the table. The protagonist replies that he was paid, so he provided a service. The headman replies that if it were all about money, he would not spend such an expensive potion on healing the villagers. He puts out his palm and tells the protagonist to make themselves at home, and then adds that he hopes they will enjoy dinner too. Someone opens the door and apologizes for disturbing you. The mustachioed man puts his hand to his chest and tells the protagonist that he is truly grateful for what he did and then asks if they mind if they join his meal too. The old man moves his hand to the side and replies that of course, they can pass and sit down over there. The protagonist replies that he doesn't care. The mustachioed man approaches the chair and thanks the old man and the protagonist. A girl with two long strands of brown hair in front and an old man with a long beard sit down at the table. The mustachioed man says that these are his companions, his wife and his accompanying knight. The main character with a smile on his face replies that he is pleased to meet you. He wondered if the man who was nowhere to be seen during the clash with the bandits turned out to be the accompanying knight. Young Shin Spoon feeds Lily with flushed cheeks. 
The main character chews food and closes his eyes. A drop of sweat runs down his cheek, and he thought that they would drill a hole in him with their gaze. The old man, with concern on his face, asks the main character if he is traveling and if he can ask where he is going. The main character replies that his destination is a small village in the kingdom of Teru, where he needs to find someone. The wife of a mustachioed man looks carefully at the protagonist. The protagonist notices this and looks at the girl with bewilderment on her face, who immediately looks away. The mustachioed man with a smile on his face exclaims that he and the protagonist group are going to cross the border, and then adds that they are also heading to the kingdom. The main character, with a skeptical expression on his face, thought that everything was written all over their faces. The old man gets up from the table with an empty plate and says that he will go get more food. The protagonist is chewing food and thought that it looks like the headman is also involved in their affairs. The mustachioed man asks the protagonist to listen to him and then says that he has one request for him. He put his hands together and asked the main character if he could accompany them at least to the border. The main character asks him if he didn't say that he already has an accompanying knight. A bearded man sits with a serene expression on his face. He raises his hand at shoulder level and tells the protagonist that he has heard that he has excellent skills and then adds that they will also go in the same direction. He asks the protagonist to accompany them only to the border. The main character reached under his coat with his hand and with a smile on his face thought that this old man had such an authoritative tone as if it was in the order of things for him to treat his interlocutor with disdain. He adds what it means to know before him. He takes out a paper from under his jacket and, saying that he refuses the request, puts it on the table. The main character says that he found it in the hands of the bandit leader. The paper contains information about the search for Hawk and Allen, who looks like a brown-haired man sitting in front of him, but without a mustache. Crime. Rebellion. Reward. 100,000 gold. Be sure to bring him alive. The protagonist imagines two people shaking hands and thought that the connection between Earth and the Guy continent would be established in about a year and only six months after that they would begin to fully interact. He imagined standing next to the defeated elf men with horns against the background of the red sky and thought that he did not immediately go to the continent of Guy, but he knows some important events that happened here in the past. He imagines a map where the kingdom of Teru and the principality of Hicks are located nearby. He thought that their current situation was the principality of Hicks, located in the southeastern part of the continent or more precisely, a tiny town called Roan. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, thought that if he remembers everything correctly, around this time, there was an uprising in the Principality of Hicks. He adds that there is a high probability that they are directly related to him. Alan goes to the protagonist and asks if this is the only one a poster, and the main character replies that it is. The brown-haired man replies that it's good and asks then to just turn him in to receive a reward. He sits on the floor in front of the protagonist and asks in return to take his wife and bodyguard across the border. Concern can be seen on the faces of the wife and bodyguard. The main character gets up from his chair and asks Alan how long he is going to lead him by the nose. He points to a woman in a green hood and tells Alan that she is much more dangerous than him. He says that at first he was not sure of the correctness of his guesses and then asks the girl Princess Helen if she is the last member of the ruling family of this country destroyed during the uprising. The girl has a stern look. The bearded bodyguard calls the protagonist a scoundrel and asks him who he really is. Dayin replies that he simply pointed his finger at the sky and seems to have hit the mark. The bearded man grabs the hilt of his sword and shouts to the princess to stand behind him and then orders the protagonist to step back because otherwise something will happen to him. The old man strikes the main character with his sword, but he blocks the attack with a kitchen knife and asks what will happen to him otherwise. The old man pulls his sword back and says that he would have fought better if not for his injury. The protagonist says that this is just an excuse and then trips the old man, causing him to fall to the floor. He picks up the knife and invites Alan to talk, and he shouts to the main character not to come closer. The magician concentrates and forms a fireball between his hands and shouts to the protagonist that one more step and he too will fight. Lily tells him that this is not possible. The magician's fireball disappears. Lily, with a piece of sandwich in her mouth, tells Alan that if he does any mischief while eating, he will be scolded. She asks young Shin if this is true, but he doesn't know what exactly they are talking about and therefore simply nods actively. The protagonist punches the magician and asks if he said he would grab them and eat them. He adds that he suggested just talking. The headman stands with a sword in his hand and points the finger of his other hand at the protagonist and then calls him a scoundrel and adds that even if he is called a benefactor, he will not dare to touch the princess. 
He runs at the protagonist and shouts that now he is a headman, but was once a knight and is ready to give his life to protect the princess. The protagonist ends up behind the old man and hits him on the back of the head. The old man falls to the ground, and the protagonist puts his hand forward and asks if they can calm down. Alan screams at the princess to run away and grabs the protagonist's leg, then calls him a lousy villain. With a serious expression on his face, he shouts to the protagonist that he will not be able to even lay a finger on the princess while he is alive. The main character tries to explain himself, but he is interrupted by the princess, who asks him to stop. Helen, with her eyes downcast, says that she knew that someday this day would come. She takes off her hood and tells the protagonist that she will obediently follow him, but she needs to leave the others alone. Alan calls the princess and asks her to stop. Helen, with long brown hair tied in a ponytail, presses her palm to her chest and tells the protagonist to take her with him. The protagonist sighs and asks the girl if she can stop making him the bad guy because he never told her that he would kill her. Helen put her hand forward and asked the protagonist if this means that he will not catch her and will not report her to the rebels. The main character puts his hand to his belt and answers that he is still thinking about it. Helen, with an upset expression on her face, thought that she knew that the main character was no different. She says that her doubts are dispelled, after which she takes off her cloak with a hood. She jumps, dagger in hand, at the puzzled protagonist. She hits him, but the protagonist dodges. Dayin reaches out to the girl's hand. He tried to grab her hand, but she jumped back. He turns around and thought that the princess also had a surprise, which he did not expect. A stool falls to the ground. Helen screams at the protagonist to drop the weapon if he doesn't want the girl to get hurt and puts a knife to Lily's neck. The main character, with an alarmed expression on his face, tells Helen that she has taken a dangerous step. Young Shin holds a plate of bread in his hands and exclaims that he protected the food. Lily, with food residue on her cheeks, tells the girl who grabbed her that she actually ate a sandwich. Helen asks the girl if she is really not going to remain silent, and then tells her not to touch the sword because otherwise she will get hurt. Lily uses the shield spell, after which an orange barrier appears around her, which pushes the princess away. The main character asks Helen, who is sitting on the ground, if she is giving up. The girl throws many daggers at the main character and shouts that this is absurd. The main character fights off all the daggers with a kitchen knife. He uses the hiding skill and becomes translucent, after which he quickly approaches the princess. He grabs her face. He tells her that she is stronger than he thought, and she screams and asks him to let her go quickly. Gray spots appear on a white background. The protagonist asks the girl if she is really a princess, and then asks her to let him check. The girl's eyes turn green, and her hair turns blonde. She shouts to the protagonist that he showed unheard of rudeness. Dayin snaps his fingers at the back of her head and tells her that she now looks like a half-elf, and then tells her that she can calm down now. Alan screams and calls the protagonist a villain. He and the bodyguard jump on the protagonist and shout at him to take his hands off the princess. The main character hits the old man on the back of the head, after which he opens his eyes wide. He asks them if they have really gone back to their old ways when they have already frayed his nerves. He hits Alan in the back of the head, after which he screams in pain. The protagonist stands among the two defeated men and tells Helen to sit quietly and listen to what they are told. He asks Young Shin and Lily if they've finished eating, and then asks them to help him clean up. The girl eats bread and answers the main character that she will eat this bun, and that's it. Helen opens her eyes and hears Alan calling her. She is tied with ropes, as is the bodyguard with a magician next to her. Alan exclaims that the princess has woken up, and she asks if they were captured in the end. Helen asks the protagonist, sitting on a stool in front of her, what he intends to do with them. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, replies that he has not yet decided and was thinking about Princess Helen. He imagines her standing against the backdrop of the mansion and thought that she was a representative of the direct line of the ruling family of the Hicks Principality, the granddaughter of the Supreme Elder of the Elves, a half-elf of noble birth. He imagines spears and stakes that are among the fire. He thought that initially the princess ultimately faced a terrible ending, and her death later became the spark for an interracial war, but the war was extremely disadvantageous for him. Dayin raises three fingers on his hand and says that he is considering three options, and then names the first one, to sell them to the first person he meets. He shows two fingers on his hand and says that the second one is to pretend that he doesn't know anything and go his own way. An angry Alan shouts at the protagonist that if he pretends he doesn't know anything, he will give away all his money. The main character replies that he himself can simply shake them out of his pockets. 
He shows one finger on his hand and says that the last one is to take them to the elven forest. The shocked bodyguard and Alan scream and ask the protagonist how he found out. The main character with a malicious smile on his face says that in any case they will go in the same direction and then adds that of course, they will have to pay for the service. He tells Helen that if she gives the opportunity to meet her grandmother, he will take her safe and sound to the elven forest. The girl with a serious expression thought that the offer was not bad, because compared to her request, it was an extremely small payment. She asks the main character why he needs her, and then adds that she cannot enter into an agreement until she finds out about the main character's goal. She is about to tell the protagonist what will happen if he plans to harm her, but the protagonist sighs and, interrupting her, asks if he would offer such a deal if he had such a plan. The main character imagines Lily in a nest and thought that the purpose of traveling to the continent of Guy is to find Lily's parents, as well as to find a couple of objects along the way. And in order to achieve this goal, he should use all the resources that are at hand. The main character with a smile on his face tells the girl that he has one goal, because there is someone he wants to meet, having received assistance from the Supreme Elder. He thought that they were saying that he had mastered all the spells and incantations in the world and was the longest living being on the Guy continent. Black characters move across the paper. The image of a golden dragon appears, the wisest dragon Abraxas. The main character crosses his arms and says that this is not such a difficult task. He imagines his watch and thought that the dragon might know about that watch. Helen, with a worried expression on her face, tells the protagonist that even if the grandmother asks, there is no guarantee that he will want to meet him. Alan and the bodyguard are silent. The main character tells the girl that she should just provide assistance and he will figure it out on his own. A carriage passes along a mountain road. The protagonist's group and the princess and her people are sitting inside the carriage. Alan looks around and asks if this hole from which the wind is blowing is a spell to maintain the temperature, and what kind of chair is this that can be unfolded with just one button? He admires the reflective direct rays of the magic mirrors and reports that he cannot believe that such a carriage exists in the world. The main character with an angry expression tells him to sit quietly because if the kids wake up, he will have a lot of problems. The magician apologizes to the protagonist. Dayin thought about the bodyguard driving the cart, and then asking if it was okay for him to sit outside since he seemed to be injured. Alan replies that Sir Leonard was poisoned and has already undergone detoxification. He adds that they will switch places later. There are many swirling patterns on a white background. Alan tells the main character that perhaps, due to his age, he will need more time to recover. The main character, with a serene expression on his face, replies that okay, let the two of them decide this between themselves. Dayin tells Helen that he is curious to know something. The girl with a serious expression tells the protagonist not to talk to her. The protagonist sighs and asks the girl if she really forgot about the rules that were established before they went on a journey together. He tells her that firstly, she should not expect to be treated like a royal person, and secondly, she must unconditionally follow his instructions. He wants to name the third point, which is valid on Tai. Elhi arrives in the elven forest and meets with the supreme elder, but the girl interrupts him. Helen, with an angry expression on her face, compliments the protagonist's words with information that her royal seal will be used as collateral. She holds her palm with her other hand and thought that the seal remaining in the royal palace was a fake. She adds that even her bodyguards don't know that the real one was with her, but the protagonist somehow knows about it. The main character props his head on his fist and asks Helen what she intends to do after she finds herself in the elven forest. The princess replies that she will receive the royal seal back. The protagonist replies that he also does not plan to keep her, and then asks her if she will then live quietly and peacefully in the forest. Helen opened her eyes wide and shouted that she did not intend to hide all her life. She clenches her hand into a fist and shouts to the main character that she is going to gather all the forces under her command to punish the traitors and take back her country. The main character crosses his arms and replies that this means that she wants to start a war, and then adds that he would not recommend doing this. Helen asks the main character if he really proposes to leave alone the enemies who killed her parents. Dayin bowed his head and tells the girl to do as she wishes. He smiles and his image is reflected from the glass of the window. He tells the girl that if she is obsessed with revenge or achieving success, she will miss out on all her golden years. But this is just grumbling from an older person that she can ignore. An angry Helen tells the protagonist that he was born lazy and overly optimistic. The main character closes his eyes and replies that this is his way of life. The sun rises against the backdrop of trees and mountains. Someone shouts to the carriage to stop. There is anxiety on Helen's face. 
and the main character, with a serene expression on his face, asks if they have already been overtaken by the squad sent in pursuit. Leonard, with a nervous expression on his face, shouts to the princess that this is the pursuit squad of Marquis Ormond. Helen asks if they have caught up. The main character touches the shoulder of the sleeping Lily and tells the children to get up, and the sleepy girl asks if it's time for breakfast and says that she wants to sleep. The main character says that the enemy is nearby and asks young Shin to stop the carriage. The boy picks up the phone and agrees with the protagonist. Leonard shouts and asks why the horses suddenly stopped obeying him and are they really not going to rush at full speed. The main character gets out of the carriage and tells the old man to sit inside the carriage and rest, and after a short stop they will set off again. Many warriors in armor run towards them in front and Leonard shouts and asks the main character what kind of nonsense he is talking about and doesn't he see the enemies ahead. He adds that the enemies are the knightly detachment of the principality, and they are different from the thieves they encountered yesterday. The protagonist sighs and, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, tells the old man that he said, everything is fine, and then again asks him to sit inside the carriage. The enemy commander commands to surround the carriage. His warriors lined up in rows, and he walked in front of them. A gray-haired man with a mustache puts his hand forward and tells Leonard that they haven't seen each other for a long time, and then asks him if that half-elf is inside this carriage. The bodyguard screams calling the warrior commander Viscount Manchi and tells him to shut up, then calls him a vile traitor. The commander of the warriors straightens his mustache and with a smug expression on his face says that he is now a count, unlike the one who ran like a mangy dog. He adds that the so-called hero title Leonard is ridiculous to the point of stomach cramps. The bodyguard grabs the hilt of his sword. Viscount takes out his sword which is enveloped in transparent white energy, and then says that this is an undeserved title for a person who never became a sword master, but a hero should have such skills. His face is covered by a shadow, and he tells his warriors that he will deal with this nonentity himself, and they should not interfere. Warriors accept the order of their commander. Leonard, with his sword at the ready, runs towards the enemy and curses at him. Viscount knocks the bodyguard's sword out of his hands. He makes an attack and hits Leonard with his sword and he grits his teeth in pain. Viscount swings his sword at his opponent and says that this will be the final blow. He became wary because he noticed something. The main character attacks him with a sword, and he jumped away. Viscount's mustache fell off after being attacked by the protagonist. He screams because he is upset about the damage to his mustache, while the protagonist pours an expensive healing potion into Leonard's mouth. He rushes the old man to Alan and tells him to take him into the carriage. Viscount pulls his sword aside and calls the main character a scoundrel, and then tells him that he may not expect an easy death. He adds that with the help of the Aura Blade, he will cut even his soul into pieces. Dayin asks his opponent if he is pretending that the Aura Blade is something truly grandiose. His sword is enveloped in white energy, after which he tells the enemy that he too can create it. Viscount quickly runs to the protagonist and shouts that it was a low trick and then adds that such a youth as the protagonist is not capable of wielding an aura blade. The protagonist parries the enemy's blow with his sword. With a stern look, he tells Viscount that he considered him a superior fighter, and then asks if he is an entry-level swordmaster. The enemy calls the protagonist a scoundrel and hits him with blow after blow. Viscount shouts to the protagonist that he will finish him off and makes another blow. Dain thought that, however, it is not as simple as it seems. He imagines how he struck the head of the guild, and he jumped away from the attack. He thought that thanks to the duel with Chan Sung a few days ago, he was able to achieve the manifestation of the Aura Blade for the first time. He adds that the changes in the body and the Sword Emperor's records also helped improve his skills. The protagonist parries several attacks in a row at once, and the waves from the blows spread out to the sides. He thought that it would be difficult to defeat such an opponent with just the art of the sword. Viscount shouts to the protagonist that all he can do is run away like a rat. The protagonist becomes transparent, and then smiles and replies that he doesn't even know, because he hasn't even started yet. Viscount shouts to the protagonist that he is a scoundrel, not a knight, after which a blue glow appears behind him. The main character appears behind the mustachioed man, and makes a strike, and he blocks the attack with his sword. Viscount, with an angry expression on his face, strikes the main character, and calls him a cowardly creature, and then asks him if he can still call himself a swordmaster. The main character cut off the end of his mustache from the whole side. Viscount actively waves his sword around and screams. He turns his head to his warriors and commands them to attack the carriage and kill everyone except the princess, and the warriors accept his order. 
He shouts at them not to let anyone escape. Young Shin saddles the horse and tells the protagonist that he will take care of them. The horse transforms and smoke comes out of it. She transformed into a robot. Lily asks Young Shin if he will really fight alone, and the boy replies that he alone is enough. The warriors stand in front of the robot. The warriors notice that the horse has changed and wonder if he is a magician. The rocket engine on the robot's boot began to glow bright blue. The robot flies through the warriors, pushing them aside. Viscount exclaims with a shocked expression that this simply cannot be. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, tells his opponent to focus on their fight. The warrior commander tightly grips the sword in his hand and shouts to the protagonist that he will go to the end, and then calls him a scoundrel. He cut his hand with a sword and shouts to the protagonist that he will certainly kill him. The main character became wary. The Viscount's sword emits dark red energy. The protagonist notices that this is a demonic sword. The eyes of the mustachioed man turned red and he, about to make a stabbing blow to the main character, shouts to him that he is well informed and asks him to die. The protagonist blocks an enemy attack. He dodged another attack and, with a smile on his face, tells the enemy that he really decided to use a cheating item, since his abilities are not enough, and then asks him if he thinks he can handle him, because he looks dangerous. Viscount swings his sword and shouts that he can easily handle it, and then asks the protagonist where he is always trying to escape. He makes many blows to the main character, and he blocks them by gritting his teeth. The protagonist's sword breaks and streams of red energy are sent into it. The protagonist is pushed away by powerful red energy. He coughs up blood due to being hit by an enemy. Viscount raises his fist in the air and laughs loudly as Lily appears behind him. The girl calls the protagonist and directs a lot of fiery energy at the enemy. Viscount tells the sword to absorb these flames, after which it absorbs Lily's flames. The girl became worried about what happened, and Young Shin stood in front of her and said that he would try to stop the enemy. The main character tells him that this is dangerous, so he should not engage in a fight. The boy sits inside the robot with a slightly serp, rise expression on his face. The main character gets to his feet and says that after such a long time, he finally felt the taste of real combat, so they should leave the games. Armor appears on the protagonist's hand, after which he says that now he will show what a real cheat item is. Viscount runs towards the protagonist and screams at him to die. The main character's hand is enveloped in streams of blue energy. He swings his fist at the enemy and in a menacing voice tells him to die. The main character makes a blow, after which a powerful stream of blue energy is directed at the enemy. Helen watches with a shocked expression on her face. Lily opens her eyes and mouth wide. In front of the protagonist, there is a large crater with smoke coming from it. He thought that this was the first time he was using this item, so he set a limit of 25% energy output. He adds that the little thing turned out to be more useful than he thought. He goes to a sword stuck in the ground, which is enveloped in red streams of energy. The main character takes the sword by the hilt and looks at it, and then thought that there is not a single scratch, the sword has good strength. He made a serious expression on his face and thought that he knew one similar blade. He imagines the demonic sword salad shrouded in red energy against a backdrop of a twisting symbol and a mountain of bodies. He thought he was giving enormous power in exchange for blood, but the user is consumed by demonic energy and soon he goes crazy, so the sword constantly changes hands. The main character gets into the carriage and examines the sword, and then thought that initially it became known only at the height of the interracial war, and he never expected that it would fall into his hands like that. He adds that they say that it has the best characteristics among demonic swords, but somehow he doesn't really want to use it himself. He wonders if he'll get blood on his hands even if he just sells it. The carriage passes near the rock. The main character sighs and asks if he can then exchange it for something like a holy sword. Leonard, with a worried expression on his face, asks the main character how far it is to the border. The protagonist puts the sword on his feet and answers the old man that they will soon arrive in Randall, where MS needs to get a pass to cross the border, and there will be three days left before the border itself after leaving the city. Leonard replies that he doesn't know if he can hold out. Helen screams at the old man not to say that, and he closes his eyes and apologizes to the princess, because he is no longer the same as before. Helen, with a serious expression on her face, tells Leonard that just the fact that he is next to her gives her strength. She asks him to never again utter words that could be considered a sign of weakness. The main character opens the book, and the princess asks the main character what he is reading, and he replies that he is just trying to relieve boredom. Helen and Leonard look closely at the main character. The old man asks the main character if he can ask him for one favor, 
and he tells him that he doesn't even have to try. The old man tells the protagonist that he didn't even listen to what it was. Dane closed the book, after which he agrees with the old man and asks him to speak. The main character, with a smile on his face, puts his hand forward and asks the old man not to ask him to help them return the kingdom in exchange for a title or money. A drop of sweat runs down Leonard's cheek and he is about to say something, but Helen closes her eyes and asks him to stop. Leonard looks at his trembling and bruised palms and tells the princess that it would be great if he had the opportunity to cross the border with her. He remembers walking in front of the army on horseback and thinking that during his life he had achieved great success in several wars, as a result of which he was called a hero and was rated as a person who would soon become a master of the sword. Cracks appear, as if on glass. Leonard thought that in the end he could not reach him and did not protect her highness from traitors. He lowered his gaze and with a sad expression on his face thought that now he was not a protector, but rather a ballast on her shoulders. He tells the protagonist that he heard him and will not offer anything else. The main character silently looks out the window. Near the lattice gate, there are two guards with spears. Entrance to the Randall Fortress. The carriage stops among trees and bushes. The protagonist says that only he, Lily, and the princess will go to the fortress. Helen, with a surprised expression on her face, asks the main character what he means. Alan is worried and tells the protagonist that the princess risks being in danger if she enters the city. The protagonist puts on a robe and asks the magician how he can trust them and leave them all in the carriage. He adds that he is taking her with him so that they don't do anything stupid. The magician replies that they would never stoop to such a shameless act. The main character, in a stern voice, asks the princess and her people if they have forgotten how they took the baby hostage. Helen closes her eyes with reddened cheeks and replies that everything is fine. She will go with him. The main character with Lily and Helen move along the roofs of houses, outskirts of the Randall Fortress. Helen, disguised as a brown-haired girl, asks the main character if there is a store here that sells supplies. The main character tells the girls that they have to settle another matter first, so they should follow him and not be distracted. Helen, with a dissatisfied expression on her face, says that there is a terrible stench here and asks to leave here as soon as possible. The protagonist replies that this is the usual smell of the slums. A dirty old man and a blue-haired man are sitting to the side of them. Helen looks at the children looking into the wooden barrel and asks how people can live in such a place. The main character tells the girl that she probably doesn't really know anything because she has never left the walls of the royal palace. He adds that this is also part of the kingdom. The protagonist and the girls enter the tavern. The tavern keeper standing behind the counter asks the protagonist group if they would like beer, and he replies that they are not interested in alcohol. The main character puts a gold coin on the table and says that he would like to make a request to the thieves' guild and buy some more information. The tavern keeper, in a trembling voice, asks if this is a gold coin. One of the visitors asks the tavern keeper if he said that there was a gold coin there. Three men get up from their seats, and one of them takes out a knife. One of them says to look at the protagonist's group. Another says that they don't look particularly strong, and the third scoundrel says that perhaps they have something else useful. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, says that it looks like they have come to the right place. After which Lily becomes wary. She swirls a powerful stream of fire around them. After which the villains get scared. Someone behind asks the protagonist what kind of request they want to make, after which he turns his attention to the source of the words. A gray-haired man gets off his chair and is told by the protagonist that he needs a pass and information. The gray-haired man says to follow him. Opposite the protagonist groups it's a bald man who puts his hand forward and asks them where they are going since they need a pass. Helen, with her eyes wide open, thought that she could not believe that there was such a huge space on the ground floor of the inn. The protagonist tells the interlocutor that they are heading to the kingdom of Teru, and then asks him how long it will take to make a pass. The man replies that it will take at least one week. The main character puts a bag of coins on the table and asks the man to make a pass in two days, and the status is a wizard and five servants. The man replies that, of course, they will do everything in the best possible way. Helen and Lily are surprised after the words of the protagonist, and he thought that the little girl took all the gold coins that the knights had, so there is no need to worry about money. Dayin says that he is also looking for a man who wears a goblin mask, whose name he does not know, but he is probably one-armed and a wizard. The bald man puts his hands together, closes his eyes, and smiles. Lily turns to the main character, and the bald man did something with his hand under the table, after which he says that first they need to check if there is any information about him in the data they have. 
The main character with a malicious smile thought that these scoundrels seem to know something. The bald man tells the protagonist that he will take them to the headquarters, because the information they requested can only be viewed there. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, replies that he doesn't care, and then tells the bald man to lead him. A bald man walks ahead of the protagonist's group and smiles maliciously. He thought that the protagonist really called himself a wizard and thought that he had extraordinary abilities. He adds that as soon as they arrive at the headquarters, they will be immediately disposed of and the protagonist's gold coins will go to them. The main character stops in place. He looks at the wooden gate with metal ornaments and thought that if you were not a member of the Thieves' Guild, then finding out the location of its headquarters is a difficult task because most of the strangers who entered there were never able to return back. The protagonist smiles and thought that on the other hand, this means that there are a lot of valuable things there, so he really can't wait to I'll see what their treasury is like. He looks at Lily and asks if her legs hurt. The girl with a smile on her face replies that no, everything is fine, and the protagonist asks her if she is hungry. The girl turns her pupils to the side and answers with a little anxiety that she is a little hungry. The main character tells her that he knew it. He hands the candy bar to Lily and says that this is for her. The girl takes a candy bar, and the protagonist thought that this should help relieve some tension. She eats a chocolate bar with flushed cheeks and thanks the main character. She says that it's really tasty, and the protagonist replies that it's good that he took the bars with him. A bald man against the backdrop of a table with chairs tells the protagonist's group to wait here a little while he goes to get an informant. Reception area of the Thieves' Guild headquarters. The main character, along with the others, goes to the table and asks the bald man if they really have to wait again after walking so much, and then asks him to quickly bring him here. The bald man presses a button on the wall and tells the protagonist's group that they are caught. Helen watches the grade appearing in front of her with alarm on her face. The protagonist's group was locked behind bars. Helen screams and asks the scoundrel what he is doing. The bald man tells the chief that they have been captured, and he replies that this is good. The princess grabs the bars. A woman in black and red clothes appears and asks the bald man, bowing to her, if it is them. The protagonist with a wary look asks questions whether this means that if we are talking about the chapter, then in front of him is Goldilocks, and is the goblin mask really such an influential figure that she intervened in the matter? Helen, with an angry expression on her face, screams at the villains that they have deceived them, and then reveals that they were targeting her from the very beginning. Goldilocks turns her head to the bald man and asks him who this woman is and he replies that he also does not understand what she is talking about. The main character stands in front of the princess and moves his hand to the side, and then says that at times she experiences clouding of mind, so you should not pay attention to it. He adds that they should talk to him. Goldilocks, with a malicious smile on her face, tells the princess that, according to the latest information, she is Helen. With concern on her face, she screams and answers the woman that she mistook her for another person. Goldilocks asks Helen if she has changed her appearance, because her face is not the one she is familiar with. She closes her eyes, and with a smile on her face, tells her subordinates that how lucky they are, because she will be able to send information about the princess to those people. She asks them if they are interested in knowing what she really looks like. Helen shouts that this is not true, and she says that everything is not so. Half of Goldilocks' face is covered by a shadow, and she asks if those people wear goblin and orc masks. With a serious expression on her face, she thought that they were saying that the dangerous guy who was looking for information about them was a fairly high-level fire wizard, but other than that, she knew nothing about him. She turns to the protagonist and asks him who he is. Dayeen replies that he paid the money, and then asks why on earth she is asking questions, since she must answer his question. Goldilocks snapped her fingers and asked the main character if he still didn't understand what situation he was in. She adds that if he turns up his nose, believing in his magical abilities, then let him give up all hopes. She says that there is a barrier installed here that seals magic. An orange magic circle appears above the protagonist's group, the energy from which is directed towards them. Helen covers her mouth with her hand and exclaims that this is mana. The main character clenches his hand into a fist and says that you can't call him a simpleton, but somehow he didn't think about it. Goldilocks asks the main character if he now understands what's what and if life is dear to him then he must answer why he is looking for a goblin mask. Two men behind her are aiming at the protagonist with a crossbow. The main character is looking for something under the cloak and says that he will do something when he finds it. He pulls out a gun and aims it at Goldilocks, saying that this is what he's going to do. There is a shot, after which blood splashes. Goldilocks lies on the ground with a wounded leg. The protagonist shot at three guys armed with crossbows behind her. 
He fires a few more shots and tells Lily and Helen to hide under the table just in case. The girl agrees with the protagonist, and the princess holds her head. The main character loads a magazine into a pistol and thought that the name of this pistol is Zeus, and it will become the original weapon of Young Shin. He fires four more shots at enemies. He points the smoking barrel of the pistol upward and asks his enemies if they really don't have such weapons. Goldilocks gets up from the floor and shouts to the protagonist that he is locked in a cage anyway. She adds that she will return and kill him. The protagonist grabs the hilt of the sword and asks the girl where she was going. He swings his sword. His sword is now engulfed in flames. He says that even without using mana, he is able to cut through these thin rods. Goldilocks falls to her knees and, with an alarmed expression on her face, asks the main character if he really wasn't a simple wizard. The main character tells her that he just asked for a pass for the wizard, after which he put the barrel of a gun to her head and says that now it's his turn to ask questions. With a serious expression on his face, he asks her where this scoundrel with a goblin mask is. Sunlight falls on the city walls. Alan says that the sun has already risen, but they are still not there. He adds that he thinks they need to go save the princess. Behind the magician and the bodyguard, behind the trees and city walls, an explosion occurs. Alan screams and asks Leonard what kind of explosion it was and then says that they need to go to the city now. The protagonist appears behind him and asks them where they are going. Alan notices that the princess has returned and then says that they were very worried about her. He adds that they also saw fire in the city. The protagonist, with a small smile on his face, replies that he did it on purpose because he wanted to destroy the evidence. Alan asks what these bags are, and the protagonist replies that they are gifts. The bags contain an emerald staff and a honey-marinated mandrake. The magician asks if these are gifts for them, and then thanks the main character. Also in the bag is a drawing of a magic weapon, which depicts something round in shape. There is also a shadow bracelet that can change your appearance as well as a character necklace in the form of a sheep. Lily exclaims that this necklace is so cute. The main character puts the bags in the carriage and says that he gave everyone what they need at the moment. He closes his eyes and seems to shine, and then says that with such a harvest, we can safely say that they have a treasury of their own. He put on a serious expression and thought that, however, most of the time was wasted. He thought about what he had found out that Goldilocks had been brainwashed. The main character remembers how Goldilocks with a fanatical expression on her face, shouted at him not to dare to speak disparagingly about them, because they are her overlords. He imagines a man in a goblin mask holding Goldilocks in his hand, and then thought that although she showed blind devotion to them, she actually knew nothing about them and did not realize that she was brainwashed. Dayin holds a red ball in his hand and thought that this was the only thing he managed to get. He adds that this is a magical communication tool that only receives calls and is used by those villains in the shadows. He sighs, closes his eyes, and then says that everything is so confusing. Lily and Young Shin sleep on cots next to him. Dayin thought that firstly, there are a limited number of places that are able to invest large sums of money in conducting experiments on young children. He imagines gold falling down against the background of the palace and thought that this was either an empire or a kingdom. He thought that if these two options were incorrect, then the culprit was a group with equally enormous influence. The protagonist looked down with a stern look and thought that it was enough for him to simply catch the goblin mask, but the scale grew exponentially. He thought that he had no idea where it was and then wondered how he could find it. He looked at Lily with a confident look. He imagines how a red-haired girl entered the portal and thought that the baby had run away and they must be looking for a child with fiery eyes. He put on a serious expression and wondered if he could just wait until he came to find the baby. Outside the city walls, there are many mountains. The main character thought that the border wall of the Principality of Hicks was erected in the deepest gorge of the continent. It adds a historical barrier that has been blocking the path of monsters descending from the central mountain range for hundreds of years. He imagines a map where one arrow goes to a mountain range, the other to the kingdom of Teru. He thought that their plan was to cross the border wall and go to the elven forest located in the northern part of the central mountain range and then to the Teru kingdom to find Lily's mother. The main character sees the alarming expressions on the faces of Leonard, Alan, and Helen, and then asks them why they are all sitting as if dazed. He tells them that the border is just a stone's throw away. <clears throat> Honored opens his eyes and asks the main character why he himself did not fall into despair, having come up with such a reckless plan. He imagines a sketch of a horse and carriage running against the backdrop of an explosion. The bodyguard tells the protagonist that the plan is to run as fast as they can and break through the barrier. 
The protagonist, with a confident expression on his face, tells him that they did not receive the pass, and then asks him if he will then suggest some other way. Leonard responds to the protagonist that he simply does not know who is guarding that border wall. Dayin replies that, in fact, he knows everything and explains that he is the commander of the Black Lion Knightly Order, who fights monsters behind the wall and a master of the sword. Leonard's face looks shocked. The protagonist crossed his arms with a serious expression on his face. The old man tells the protagonist that he has already defeated Manchi, so he understands his confidence. But Golkin is of a different breed because he is the only one in this country and the best sword master in the world. Helen with a stern look says that when that traitor Ormond rebelled, it was enough for Golkin to come forward, and his majesty would now be safe and sound. The protagonist imagines a cloaked warrior with a sword and thought that, however, when the uprising broke out, the sword master did not answer the call, saying that the wall could not be left unattended. He wonders if the reason he guarded the wall for so long was because he had something to protect. Entrance to the border wall fortress. Many people with bags are walking through the open gate. One of the guards tells the people to line up according to their status and purpose. The border fortress has six gates, and the larger the size of the gate, the more senior a person can use it, and the number of users varies greatly depending on the status. Among the gates, there are large golden gates for the royal family, gray gates with ornaments for the nobility, metal gates for knights and magicians, wooden gates with ornaments for rich merchants, mercenaries and representatives of other races, as well as small wooden and lattice gates for ordinary people, of which there is nothing. The protagonist sighs and tells Helen that the other gates are empty, so will the heavens really fall to earth if the lower class inadvertently uses them? The princess put her hand to the window and thought that she had previously believed that differences in status were natural. Three young guys and an old man passed through the gate. Helen thought that these were ordinary people trying to leave the country because of the civil war. She wonders how those who lost their homes are different from her. She closes her eyes and prays for a chance to fix this situation. Leonard, with a confident expression on his face, shouts to the princess that he will create such a chance for her. Alan presses his fist to his chest and shouts that he will help too. Helen clenches her hand into a fist and tells her subordinates that she is grateful. The main character turns away from them and says that there is no need to complicate everything so much. He informs his group members that it is their turn and then tells young Shin to continue driving the carriage. The boy holds a blue and black gamepad in his hands and accepts the protagonist's order. The main character reports that they are starting to implement the plan. A warrior in armor puts his hand forward in front of the protagonist's group and asks to name their names. Two warriors with swords at the ready stand in front of the main character. The main character tells them to watch carefully what he does. He is wearing a goblin mask and says that he will go to the Terra Kingdom right now. He thought that this was the only way the real one would come after their soul. The brown-haired warrior asks the main character what he is saying and then sees him take out his pistol. The protagonist fires a pistol shot. One of the warriors shouts that the enemy has attacked. Another warrior commands the wall to be sealed immediately. The main character enters the carriage and asks young Shin to ride as hard as he can. The horse begins to run very fast. Dayin asks Lily if she can handle it. The girl formed a lot of flames near the carriage and replies that yes, she can handle it quite well. The flame is heading towards the Golden Gate, and the protagonist thought that this entrance was intended for high-ranking officials, and its protection was poor. The gate explodes, and the carriage drives through it. The carriage rides outside the gate. One of the warriors shouts that the enemy has destroyed the gate and entered the fortress. Another warrior commands the carriage to stop. A mustachioed man with a bald head tells Count Golkin, standing in front of him, to accept the sovereign's decree. A man with stubble and scars on his face asks the man what he means. The mustachioed man asks him what this unheard of impudence is and then tells him to quickly bend the knee and accept the order. Golkin, with an angry expression on his face, approaches the mustachioed man and asks him if he really told him to kneel. The mustachioed man replies that this is not his will, but the sovereign's. Golkin snatched the document from his hands. He read what was written there, that there was a high probability that the escaped princess and her associates were trying to cross the border, so it was necessary to strengthen its security and be sure to catch the princess. He tears up the document and says that this is a similar order. The mustachioed man asks Golkin how he dares to do this with the order of the sovereign. He grabs the mustachioed man by the face and tells him that he never recognized Ormond as ruler, and if he wants to say something, then let him come in person. He threw it from the balcony and says that this is his answer. The man in armor bowed to Golkin and, 
calling him commander, asks what they should do if the princess is discovered, and he replies that she fled, leaving the country, so she should be killed on the spot when discovered. The warrior replies that the order will be carried out. The wind rushes into the face of Golkin, who looks into the distance and thought that there was an interesting point in the content of the letter. He sees the mountains that are beyond the walls. He thought that it said that some boy killed Manchi, and then wondered if there was a strong warrior on this tiny piece of land that he did not know about. He became sharply alert, shifting his pupils to the side. He sees a horse running down the street, leading a carriage. The protagonist takes out his sword, which is enveloped in white energy. Golkin wonders if this is the aura blade. Dust rises from the floor. Three mass partners of the protagonist jumped onto the carriage, and one of them commands everyone to take positions. The protagonist imagines a map of a settlement with an arrow through the middle. He thought that the border wall was a two-tier structure, and the distance to the next fortress wall was one kilometer. He adds that the point of their plan is to break through it as quickly as possible. Many arrows rush into the carriage. The main character and Lily use the shield skill at the same time. A magical barrier blocks all arrows. Three magicians are standing on the roof. One of them picks up a staff and uses the cutting wind skill, after which green energy is formed. The second mage uses the fireball skill, after which he forms a flame. The third mage uses the ice spear skill, after which ice spikes are created that fly towards the carriage. Alan puts his staff forward, which begins to glow brightly green, and then shouts that it will block curses. He uses the reflective shield skill, after which several green barriers appear around him that block enemy spells. He uses the storm wind skill, after which powerful streams of wind rush towards the guards. Dayin tells Alan that he turns out to be a master of his craft. The magician replies that he is the one who is constantly called a genius, and then adds that if only he had a staff in the first place. Riders on horses run after the carriage. Their commander orders to break the wheels of the carriage. Leonard takes the sword in both hands, after which he is enveloped in golden energy. He shouts to his enemies that they cannot do this while he is alive. He swings his sword, after which a wave of energy is directed towards the enemy. Blood pours from his mouth. He shouts and asks how long is left to the fortress wall. The main character shouts to him that they are almost there, so she needs to hold out a little longer. Lily forms flames in her hands and tells the protagonist that she is ready. The protagonist tells her to aim the blow at the wall. Lily accepts the protagonist's order and flames come from her hands. The protagonist became wary and looked sharply to the side. He thought that something dangerous was approaching. He jumped out of the carriage and shouted to the members of his group not to stop and continue moving towards the wall. He lands on the floor and pulls his sword back. He blocks a blow from Golkin, who rushes at him. The enemy jumps back and tells the protagonist that he is surprised that he blocked such a blow and is still standing firmly on his feet. The protagonist clutches his sword tightly and wonders where he sees that he is standing firmly on his feet and what kind of power it was. Golkin smiles maliciously and asks the main character if this means that he is real. He moves his hand to the side and tells the main character to have some fun. He suddenly jumped at the protagonist. Dayin blocked the enemy's blow. He thought with concern on his face that, as he had been told, he was obsessed with martial arts and did not spare anyone during battle. Golkin laughs, and small streams of red energy emanate from his eyes. He makes several blows in a row at the main character, which he blocks. The main character takes out a pistol and thought that although his enemy has enormous strength, he still has the advantage in speed. He fires several shots at the enemy and misses. He looked closely at the enemy's left side and thought that there was a gap there. The protagonist makes an attack on the enemy, but he blocks it and shouts that this is interesting. He parried another blow and shouts to the protagonist that his sword, like his own, is hardened in real combat, so let him show what he is capable of. The main character's left hand is covered with armor, and then with a smile on his face, he asks the enemy if he is curious and reports that it will soon hurt. He clenches his left hand into a fist, after which it is enveloped in blue energy. The main character thought that if he hit with a quarter force, then a huge amount of blue energy appears and is directed at the enemy. Golkin leans on his sword and laughs. He breathes heavily and tells the main character that thanks to him, for the first time in a long time, he felt like a living person. The protagonist raises his sword up and tells the enemy that it would be nice if he felt like a dead man. The protagonist steps back and Golkin says that since he started this, it means he has to bring this matter to the end. Dayin wonders if he is crazy, and then thinks that he can't stand fights that don't bring benefits. 
He adds that by now the carriage should have reached the fortress gates. Lily calls the main character, after which bewilderment can be seen on his face. The red-haired girl raises her hand up and shouts to the protagonist that she will help him. The main character with an angry expression looks at Lily flying on the barrier and says that he is trying to buy them time, and then asks her why she returned and makes a fuss. The girl moved to the main character and asked him how she could leave him and leave. The protagonist, with concern on his face, wants to say what this means, but Lily interrupts him. She says with a happy expression that young Shin said the same thing and the others came back. Alan, standing on the carriage, raises his hand with his staff up and asks the main character if he is safe. Helen standing next to him shouts that she cannot leave, leaving her comrade. The protagonist says that he kept wondering why it was so quiet. Behind Golkin, many warriors appear, and the protagonist thought that this means that this place is already surrounded by a huge number of military forces, and in addition to this he will have to fight with Golkin himself. A blue aura enveloped him, and he thought that since they were planning to get out of here, they needed to be prepared for the fact that one of them would die. He says that now there is no other choice. The protagonist's facial expression shows bewilderment after he hears Golkin chuckle. The enemy puts his hand to his forehead and laughs loudly. The main character asks him what made him laugh so much. Golkin remembers how he saw wounded soldiers on the road from the roof of the house and tells the protagonist that he is curious about something, because with such an ability, he could make a hole in the wall much faster. But for some reason, he did not kill anyone. With a stern look, he asks the main character if he considers them unworthy. The protagonist replies that this is the customer's request. Helen stands next to him, wearing a goblin mask. Golkin opens his eyes wide and asks the main character which customer he is talking about, and he replies that it is the princess. Particles of light seem to fly near Helen. The protagonist says that later all these people will again become her subjects, so she does not want any of them to get hurt, and it was not difficult for him to do something like that. He asks the warrior captain if he's going to fight. Golkin, with a serious expression on his face, replies that the fight is over, and then adds that he will issue them a pass, but in return they must stay the night. The protagonist asks what's going on with a nervous expression, and then thinks it's great. Dinner at the Black Lion Residence. Golkin sits at a table with a variety of delicious dishes on it. The protagonist thought that this man was interested in powerful beings, and then adds that he once heard that even superhumans from Earth were invited to a meal while passing through the wall. The protagonist clinked his mugs with Golkin and thought that he really did not expect that in this life he would find himself in such an honorable place. He adds that according to rumors, he even gives gifts if he likes the fight. Golkin, with a smile on his face, tells the protagonist that now, seeing his face, he catches himself thinking that he is younger than he thought, and his skills are not inferior to him. The protagonist replies that he simply has a childish face by nature, and in reality, he lived a decent life. There are many bottles of alcohol on the table. Golkin tells the protagonist that he seems to be from a different country than he came from, and then asks him where he learned to wield a sword like that. Dayin thought that after talking with him, he learned that the Golkin family had been guarding the wall for several generations and would also continue to guard it in the future. He adds that this is why he has so many questions. With a serious expression on his face, he tells his interlocutor that if he is so curious about what is going on outside, then why don't he go outside the wall and take a look? Golkin closes his eyes and shakes his head in refusal, and then says that this is unacceptable because he cannot give up the family business because of his greed. He adds that it is better to finish the story that he started. The main character resigned himself and began to tell everything from the moment he lost consciousness at the bottom of the lake. Golkin says that this place is amazing, and then Helen, with a serious expression on her face, asks him how long he is going to pretend that he doesn't know her. Golkin scratched his earlobe with his little finger and asks what it was, and then says that his ears suddenly itched. Helen asks him if he is checking her, or if he cannot look her in the face because he did not protect the sovereign. Golkin gritted his teeth and asked the girl what she said, and then reports that she showed impudence. Red-black hostile energy emanates from him, and he tells the girl that if this little friend weren't here, he would personally cut her throat. He adds that she should be grateful that she is still alive. Helen is shaking and clenching her teeth. She gets up from her chair and shouts to Golkin that she is Helen Reinhardt, the rightful heir to the throne. Particles of light appear next to her, and she shouts to Golkin that he is a knight of the wall, and if he has not forgotten his knightly oath, he should behave more politely with her. The man sighs and tells the princess that she is definitely better than her father, because she has the courage, and she speaks smoothly. 
Helen with a serious expression tells Golkin that he has no right to insult his majesty. The man tells the girl that her father was a coward. He adds that since he took the knightly oath, this man was afraid of his strength and never sought his support. The girl replies that, however, this is not a reason to insult his majesty. The protagonist, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, thought that he hated boring conversations. Golkin says that this is not the only reason, because if he intervened, the civil war would drag on for a long time, and if the wall is left empty, the risk of invasion will increase. With a stern look, he tells the girl that her father was a ruler who was not worth endangering the entire country. He adds that Helen, too, should not set foot on this earth after tomorrow. He's about to say what will happen if she suddenly appears in his field of vision, but the girl interrupts him. Helen, with an angry expression on her face, shouts that she refuses. She adds that she will certainly come back, punish the traitor, and take back her country. Golkin asks her if she thinks that something will change if she becomes a ruler. The girl replies that yes, she will change because on the way here she learned a lot about this country. She remembers how she ran away while the warriors protecting her were being killed, and says that she remembers the knights who laid down their lives protecting her, as well as the poor people who went out of their way to survive near evil people. She remembers the old man and the blue-haired man who were sitting on the ground near the alley, after which she says that she will return to fix everything. Helen remembers the poor people's gate on the city wall and says that the first thing she will do is make the six local gates publicly accessible to everyone and ensure that her people stand above the class system. Golkin props his chin with his hand and asks the princess if she will make the six gates public and does she really think that he will allow it. The girl replies that of course because this will be the decree of the empress. Golkin asks the princess what she said and then laughs. The main character gets up from his seat and thought that he just needed to find a place and rest. The black-haired man shouts to the guard that a whole hour has passed, and he is here on an extremely important mission. The guard replies that the process will take some time, so you will have to wait. Golkin tells his subordinate, who is covered with a cloak and hood, that let the Ormond mongrels stand at the gate for a couple more hours, then they should be driven away. The hooded figure calls Golkin commander, and then asks him what he intends to do with the princess. The commander stops and turns his head to the side, and then says that he will wait and watch her because one day they will meet again on this wall. Central mountain range, entrance to the forest of elves. Sunlight falls on the crowns of trees. The male elf tells the protagonist group that they have been waiting for them. He presses his palm to his chest and tells them that the supreme elder has sent to meet them. He introduces himself as Garand, an explorer from the elven forest of Sefersal, and then informs the protagonist party that they will accompany them from here. Helen, with a smile on her face, says that the elder is her grandmother, and then asks to quickly take them to the village. The protagonist, standing behind her, thought that the supreme elder of the elves had the gift of foresight. Garen approaches the main character and asks him if he has an object with demonic energy. The protagonist asks him what kind of demonic energy he is talking about. The elf reports that he sensed harmful demonic energy from afar, so he will not be able to enter the village. The main character wonders if it's because they just hate people. He hands the elf a sword shrouded in red energy, and then says that this is probably the problem, and invites Garen to take it. The elf extended his hand to the sword, and said that it was a demonic sword. The main character turns his head to the side, and says that they have resolved the problem, so they can go. Garen replies that no, not really. He points the sword at Lily, and tells her to stop, and calls her a vile devil. The red-haired girl with concern on her face asks if they are telling her this. Garen shouts that his eyes do not deceive him. It is the devil. The protagonist grabs the elf by the shoulder and asks him what he is doing. The elf says that he feels terrible demonic energy and great evil, and then adds that it suppresses the desire to kill that fuels her from within. Lily, with an alarmed expression on her face, replies that she is not like that at all. Garen shouts at her that she is disgusting. The main one tells the elf to stop, and he removes the protagonist's hand from his shoulder and calls him ignorant. He asks the main character if he knows anyone he is protecting now. Dayin clenches his hand into a fist and tells the elf that he knows and therefore tells him to stop. Garen turns her head to the protagonist and shouts that even though outwardly she looks like an ordinary child, but inside this creature has received demonic baptism. He shouts that it needs to be destroyed right now, after which the main character punches him in the face. He asks Garen, who has put his fingers to his forehead, if he really can't hear him. He takes another punch to his face and tells him not to dare say anything like that in front of the child again. 
Two elf girls take out their swords and tell the protagonist to move away from Garand and ask how he dared to attack them. Dayin, with a serious expression on his face, says that he was silent, although this elf behaved so tactlessly. Hostile black and blue energy emanates from the protagonist, and he tells the girls to go and tell the Supreme Elder that they will not enter the elven forest and let her come to them herself. He points his index finger at the girls and with an angry expression on his face, says that he is giving them two days and if she does not show up within this time, he will burn everything here. Alan sits by the fire and tells the protagonist, who is opposite him, that he is ashamed to look into Lily's eyes. He asks if it's true that Lily received demonic baptism and what an absurd claim that is, and then adds that when baptized, even healthy adults die in nine out of ten cases. The protagonist responds to the magician that he seems to be a little knowledgeable. Alan says with a serious expression that he once read about this in a book. He imagines a magic circle glowing red and says that demonic baptism can only be performed by high-ranking sorcerers. And the book also said that this activity requires a huge expenditure of money and materials. He adds that the majority cannot withstand the hellish pain and die. The protagonist wrinkled his face with anger and thought that he would certainly finish off that scoundrel in the goblin mask. The protagonist tells the interlocutor that's enough talking and asks him to go to bed. Lily comes to them, calling the protagonist uncle. With a frightened face, she hugs a stuffed chicken toy and says that she can't sleep. The main character replies that it's good. Then she can change places with the magician. Blue lights fly above the treetops against the background of the night sky. Lily sits on a chair by the fire and asks the protagonist if she will become a demon. The protagonist, with a stern look, replies that he does not know. Lily asks the main character what to do if her mother hates her. Dayin sighs and tells the girl that she, of course, looks like the devil because she doesn't listen to anyone, eats a lot, and her character is not sweet. Lily gets angry and asks the protagonist what he just said. The protagonist tells her that, however, he is exactly the same. The girl opens her eyes wide in surprise. The main character says that he did not listen to anyone and did not study. He was only busy having fun with his friends. He remembers how he left his backpack with comics behind him and ran to his friends, and then says that his parents probably also considered him an imp. He adds that nevertheless they were very worried about him, and then asks Lily if she thinks that her mother is somehow different from them. The girl squeezes her toy and answers the protagonist that no, it's no different. She invites him to live together when they find her mother. Dayin, with a dissatisfied voice, asks the girl if she is really going to stop a respectable bachelor from getting married, and then says that she will buy an apartment next to the guild, where the two of them can live there. Lily asks the main character where he will live. He put her to bed and says how clingy she is. He gets out of the carriage. The white-haired elf stands opposite the protagonist and tells him that they had a very sincere conversation. The main character looks at the smiling elf and thought that due to the risk of a surprise attack, he expanded the range of his senses, but did not notice her presence at all, although she came close to the camp. He became worried and thought that only one person had such power among the elves. He asked the girl if she is the supreme elder. The girl bows and tells the protagonist that she heard that her children behaved rudely towards him, so she asks for an apology. She puts her hand to her chest and tells the protagonist that she would like to thank him personally. She thanks him for saving her granddaughter and changing her destiny. The main character crosses his arms and tells the elder that he should not apologize to him, but he will still accept the apology. He asks her if they convey to her the conditions that he set by agreeing to bring Helen here. The elder replies that she has already contacted the dragon. The main character asks her what the answer is. The girl replies that he has not arrived yet, and waiting for an answer takes several days. Dayin thought with a serious expression that then maybe he should look into the Teru kingdom first. The elder asks the main character if he would like to wait for an answer in the elven forest. An image of elven houses built on tree trunks appears. The elf informs the protagonist that having the powers of the supreme elder, she would like to invite them to Sefersal, the elven forest. She continues talking and directed her pupils towards the carriage. She looks at the dark red energy emanating from the carriage and thought that Lily is a poor thing and if left as it is, she will become a disaster for the world. She says that she will cleanse that child from demonic baptism. Elven forests a fersal. Glowing lights fly over the elven houses. The elf man tells the elf woman that he heard that they have a demonic sword and strong demonic energy emanates from the carriage. The elf asks him why the supreme elder brought them here. Helen, with her hair tied in a ponytail, smiles and exclaims that everyone arrived safely. Alan approaches her 
and says that he is glad that he has the honor of seeing her again. The protagonist standing behind him tells Helen that as far as he can see, she is doing well. The princess, with a surprised expression on her face, replies that she was uneasy at heart because she could not come here with them. The protagonist with a serene look asks her if the old woman went with her, and then adds that for some reason she is not visible. Helen replies that Leonard's condition has worsened, so she is now taking care of him. The protagonist turns his pupils to the side and says that when there is time, you can go and see him. He hands the seal to the princess and tells her to take it. The girl extends her hand to her and says that for sure, she must take the seal. She takes the seal and tells the protagonist that this ends their contract. She adds that she will certainly repay him one day for the service rendered. The main character smiles and imagines a lot of falling money and then tells the girl to think carefully about this issue over the next year. He thought something like giving the White House a monopoly on the principality's magical goods would do. Helen, with a surprised look, asks the main character that he will really come to her in one year after this time has passed. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, replies that perhaps it will be so. The girl smiles and replies that then she will also achieve her goal in one year. She imagines a round symbol with an eight-pointed star against which she combines the hands of six other people. She thought that she would use the royal seal to find the relics of her ancestors and gain strength. She adds that she will make a treaty with the six elven families, and her preparations will be completed when she returns to the wall and receives the support of Golkin. She tells the protagonist that she will then officially grant him something. The main character with a stern look asks her what she is talking about. Helen smiles and says no, nothing. Lily in a white robe with a green belt says that she is dressed. The elder puts his hand on her shoulder and tells her that it may hurt a little, but once the cleansing is over, everything will be fine. Lily replies that the pain does not frighten her because she is used to it. The elf with a sad look tells her that this is good. The protagonist approaches them and asks if all preparations have been made. The elder turns to him and replies that yes, everything is ready. She gives the protagonist the torch and says that it is filled with sacred energy and will be needed during cleansing. Lily enters the pool, which is surrounded by many columns. The elder, standing next to the protagonist nearby, says that it is time to begin. The premises have two prison cells, which are located behind bars. A person approaches one of the prison cells and tells the man inside that he, it turns out, was not lying. The man in the goblin mask holds a purple ball in his hand and tells him that he is, however, very unlucky to see that he is still alive. In the purple ball, you can see how the protagonist's group moved on a carriage. The ball shows how Lily used her fire magic. A brown-haired man from a prison cell shouts that this is the child of fire. The man in the goblin mask tells him that this is the same child he missed. The brown-haired man noticed the goblin masks on Alan, Dayeen, and Leonard, and then thought that they dared to mock him. He gritted his teeth in rage and thought that after that day, he became a test subject. The masked man tells him that he will give him one last chance, after which he throws something into the prison cell through the bars. The brown-haired man reaches for an object that has fallen to the floor. He picked up a mask shrouded in red energy, and a man outside the prison cell tells him to correct his mistakes himself. The full moon rises above the protagonist and the elder as they watch Lily as she stands in the pool. The girl goes to the center of the pool. Helen closes her eyes and then casts a spell and forms green energy in her hands. A green magic circle with various symbols appears around Lily. Streams of water swirl around the girl. Lily gritted her teeth in pain as dark red energy came out of her body. The tired elder says that even though she foresaw it, the demonic energy is truly enormous. She tells Lily that it will be a little difficult, but she needs to be patient. The eyes of the protagonist standing next to her are covered by the shadow of his hair. He clutched the sword tightly in his hand. Lily is trembling, and a hole has appeared in the center of her stomach, from which a lot of energy comes out. A large clot of energy bursts out of her body and screams loudly. The elder falls to his knees, and the main character makes a jump. The protagonist stands in front of Lily, and the elder shouts that it is necessary to prevent this energy from returning back, because only by killing that demon will it be possible to destroy the demonic baptism. A monster with a trunk and wings flies towards the protagonist. The protagonist is enveloped in blue energy, and he tells the monster that he jumped out just in time. He put his arm with armor forward, and with a serious expression on his face, he tells the monster that he just needs a punching bag, so now he will get it. The protagonist pushes off the floor. He makes a strike at the monster, but it blocks the blow with its tail. He swings his fist at him. He pushes off the ground and jumps. 
The monster looks at the main character. It flies up and ends up above the main character, and then releases dark red smoke from its tail. The protagonist blows smoke to the sides with his sword and thought that before returning in time, fighting with demons was already in his liver. He adds that if you try, you can find a weak point and easily finish it off. He made a stern look and tells the monster that he cannot let him die such a simple death, and then calls him a flying creature. Many drops of sweat flow down Lily's restless face. The elder holds her in his arms and asks her if she woke up and how she feels. Lily calls the main character. Dayin raises his fist, and the elder, watching this, asks if he is angry. Lily says that it cannot be any other way, because when someone hurts a loved one, it certainly ignites the fire of rage in the heart. She smiles forcefully and repeats the words about her dear person. The protagonist stands on bloodstains and breathes heavily. He looks at the monster lying on the floor and says that now he has relieved some of the accumulated stress. The monster is trying to get up while being badly wounded. Dayin thought that even despite the blows received, this creature would continue to recover. But compared to the beginning of the battle, the speed had decreased significantly, and the concentration of demonic energy had decreased. He reaches his other hand towards the sword. He was enveloped in blue energy and thought that he was still at the level of imitating the steps that he had read hundreds or even thousands of times in the heaven-destroying mind technique. The monster flies at the main character and screams loudly. Dayin used the heaven-destroying divine sword. Step 1. He swings his sword and says the words Heaven's Revenge. A bright wave of blue energy is sent towards the enemy. The elder and Lily close their eyes due to the bright light. The red-haired girl opens her eyes wide. Smoke formed around the protagonist. He clenches his teeth and trembles because he feels severe pain throughout his body. Cracks appeared on his sword, and he thought that he now understood why it should not be used until the Wachian level was reached. The sword crumbles after which the protagonist sighs. He thought that the sword was not bad. He adds that this martial art is difficult even for a holy sword to withstand. The protagonist sees a transparent red crystal and thought that what fell out was the core of the demon. He adds that a demon of this level should definitely have something like that. He thought that it could be used as a magic stone or used to produce an artifact, and then takes his sword out of its sheath. He destroys the red stone with his sword. Streams of red energy come from the stone fragments. The protagonist's sword blade has turned black, and he says that the appearance seems to have changed a little, which is pretty good. Lily calls out to the protagonist, and then hugs him from behind. The main character is trembling, and tells the girl that his whole body hurts, so she should loosen her grip. Lily asks the main character if he has already let off steam. The protagonist strokes her head, and says that yes, there is now lightness inside. Sunlight falls on the elves' houses built in the trees. The protagonist, with his eyes closed, meditates in the butterfly pose, and is enveloped in streams of blue energy. He thought that after yesterday's battle, he had not used any restorative magic or potions. He adds that in order to imprint new martial arts skills in your body, it is better to recover naturally, so the muscles will remember the pain. He opens his eyes and thinks that the internal injuries are also healing well. The elder carries food on a tray and asks the main character if he is feeling better. The main character replies that thanks to her care, Yes, and then asks her how Lily is doing. The elder remembers the image of the girl sleeping among the roots and says that the effects of baptism still remain on her body, but she will quickly return to normal if she undergoes the healing course of the sacred tree. She looks at the protagonist eating and says that, however, she is worried about Lily's huge appetite. The protagonist replies that she always ate so much. He thanks the elder for his help and adds that he is sincerely grateful to her. There are leftovers of food on the tray. The elf tells the main character that she did this because he saved her granddaughter Helen. She closes her eyes and tells him that this is just payment for his kindness. The protagonist with a serious expression on his face tells her that they had an agreement with the princess, and her help is a completely different story. He adds that he will repay her favor. The girl tells the protagonist that he should just gain strength, and then adds that she doesn't really need anything. The protagonist's face is covered by a shadow, and he asks the girl if he shouldn't explore the foggy forest. He adds that he thinks this is what she needs. The elf wants to ask the main character how he found out about it, and he replies that he happened to hear it out of the corner of his ear. Among the fog, there are many tree crowns. The protagonist thought that the misty forest was a mysterious forest, which at some point expanded its territory towards the elven one. He adds that the fog that is there is very destructive for the elves. The protagonist asks the elder if the fog has any attention on other creatures, 
and then says that he will try to explore the foggy forest. The elder says that she should make a formal request and prepare a reasonable reward. The main character asks her what she means, and then says that he said that he wants to repay her kindness. The light is reflected from the window. The protagonist adds that he also has a lot of money, so there is no need for a reward. Leonard sits on a bench and looks into the distance. With a lifeless expression on his face, he says that if not today, then tomorrow. The protagonist appears and asks the old man how he is feeling. Leonard smiles and tells the main character that he heard, that he killed the demon again. The protagonist replies that the news spreads quickly, and the old man says that the princess joyfully shared this news with him. The protagonist opens the book, and the old man, noticing this, says that the protagonist has opened this book again, and then asks if it is so interesting. The protagonist replies that it was written by an old man and is almost entirely filled with praise to himself. Leonard, with a smile on his face, says that during the battle at the border wall, he squeezed out all his strength and mana and then saw the limits of his skill. The protagonist turns the pages of the book. The old man closes his eyes and says that he wonders how everything would have turned out if he had seen him a little earlier, three years or at least one year ago. He looks into the distance while many leaves fly by next to him, and then thought about the level that could be achieved by breaking the limit. Dane thought that seeing the limit means being able to overcome it in just one step, and for some reason it seems to him that this tactic will help the old man. He runs his finger over the pages of the book and, reading its contents, says that the body is shriveled up like a baked apple, and not even an ounce of mana remains in the cheek core. He continues to read the text of the book, where it is written that his appearance was no different from a corpse. Leonard asks the main character what he is talking about. The main character reads the words of the author of the book, where it is written that he thought about his life from the very beginning, and in particular about how he felt on the first day when he picked up a sword, finding himself on the verge of death. He suddenly realized that he had forgotten about the sword a long time ago. What he needed was to simply master strong martial arts. Leonard cries because of the words of the book read by the protagonist. He wipes away his tears and says that although these words were written by someone from a different background and living in a different world, he as a swordsman deeply understands his feelings. He asks the protagonist if he has the opportunity to show off his fencing skills, after which the protagonist shifts his pupils in his direction. With a worried expression on his face, he takes the sword out of its sheath and says that he is not good enough yet, but he will show it once, so he should watch carefully. He clutched the sword shining in the sun in both hands. The protagonist takes a fighting stance. After this, he moves forward as if in a dance and makes a piercing blow. He closes his eyes and puts his free hand forward and moves his hand with the sword back. Leonard makes a stabbing blow with a cane, repeating after the protagonist. He moves his cane smoothly in a fencing dance. He makes several hits in a row and shines brightly. The protagonist covers his face with his hand due to the bright light and thought that going beyond his limit was actually useful. He opened his eyes and was happy. He tells Leonard with a younger face that now you can't even call him an old man. Misty forest. There is fog between the treetops. Leonard shouts to the enemies to attack him. The main character tells Leonard, who is waving his sword around, to go quietly because otherwise all the monsters will come running. The bodyguard asks the main character, and so what? He gives the protagonist a thumbs up, and with a smile on his face tells him that he will defeat them all with his aura blade and be done with it. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, tells him that he is too optimistic. Alan, with an uncertain expression on his face, says that his reaction is quite normal, because he not only rose from the dead, but also rose to the level of a master. Day Ean, with an angry expression on his face, asks him not to say that and not to let him return to his zombie state. Alan, with reddened cheeks, tells the protagonist that he heard that he read this book to him, so he would also like the same. The protagonist tells him that he may not even dream. He adds that the old man said that he saw his limit, so he needed a push. He and the others sit down on the logs. He tells them that the deeper they go into the forest, the thicker the fog becomes, so they need to look around a little. Alan agrees with the protagonist and reports that he does not feel the presence of monsters nearby. The protagonist thought that it would be much more comfortable if he could use a golem here, but there is one thing. He remembers how young Shin sat on the ground near a tree and said that he would not move until Lily woke up. Alan says that as far as he knows, this fog has been a headache for the elves for hundreds of years. The protagonist with a stern look says that if they get rid of the fog, the elves will be safer. Leonard, with a smile on his face, replies that it is possible. This will also help win their favor. 
Alan says that then the implementation of their plan will also speed up, and then asks the protagonist if he really calculated all this. The protagonist replies that you can say so. He thought that he was also planning to build himself a villa in the elven forest. He imagines a tree-shaped house as part of his retirement plan. Alan tells the protagonist that he is great because he puts so much effort into her highness. Leonard tells the protagonist that they are really very grateful to him. The protagonist, with a misunderstanding on his face, asks the guys what the princess has to do with it. Joyful Leonard tells the protagonist that he will deal with this issue himself, and they will no longer burden him. Alan exclaims that this is true and calls his partner's words golden. The protagonist, looking at them, thought that he did not know what kind of misunderstanding had arisen, but this could be quickly corrected, so he would postpone resolving the issue until later. He looks wary and says that there is an enemy there, so you need to prepare for battle. Leonard makes a jump and shouts that he will deal with him. The protagonist thought that in some sense it was even convenient. The bodyguard strikes the enemy. He sees an elf whose body was covered in stitches. The protagonist says that this is a chimera elf, whose weak point is the spirit stone inserted into its chest, so you need to aim only at it. He informs his partners that he is leaving the chimeras to them, and he will take care of whoever is behind them. Alan puts his hand forward and forms flames using magic. The protagonist sees a dark image behind the chimeras and thought that he already knew the reason for the appearance of the foggy forest. He thought that this was a masterpiece of the treatment of the Archmage Drites, the guardian of this place. He sees in front of him a black-haired elf in a blue dress and with a bow in her hand, and then says that he or she is Mordria. The girl shoots a fiery arrow at the protagonist, and he dodges the arrow. He approached her and thought that he was also confident in his speed. Mordria jumped away from the main character, and then she shoots him with a bow, which is enveloped in green energy. Earth, ice and fire arrows fly at the main character. He wonders if these are arrows of elemental magic. The protagonist fought off the arrows with his sword. He suddenly notices green energy concentrating behind him. He uses the shield skill, after which a blue magical barrier appears, blocking the enemy arrow. He smiles and says that this is to be expected from the original. He adds that the level is different than that of a fake. The protagonist imagines the image of Mordria and thought that she was a doll created after the elf that the Archmage Drites loved more than anyone else in the world a thousand years ago. He adds that in a past life Mordria was killed by superhumans, and later a method of stamping living beings was discovered and many copies were made, but all of them turned out to be not as good as the original. The protagonist moves his hand to the side and tells the girl that although she will have to sweat, she needs to take her with her. Mordria pulls the bowstring, but the protagonist quickly moves away from the place where he was. The protagonist is one of the red stones on her body, which causes the girl to open her eyes wide. He went behind the girl's back. He hits her back and destroys the orange stone. Mordria kicks the main character. She practically grabs the main character, causing him to look surprised. Dayin quickly breaks the stones on her chest and stomach. The girl falls to the ground, and the protagonist says that he suffered a lot with her. Alan approaches the protagonist and exclaims that they are finished too. Leonard stands next to him, who says what it means, the problem was in this doll, and then asks him if he is going to take it with him. The protagonist replies that it is very valuable and they should take it and use it to their advantage. He adds that now that there is no guard, you can safely return back. Archmage Dreit's hut. There is a small chair near a wooden one-story house. The protagonist thought that from the outside it looked like a small hut, but in the basement there were many useful things. Alan ran up to the bookshelves and said that there are magical ingredients here that are difficult to find even in the palace, as well as lost manuscripts on magic. The protagonist asks him not to make a fuss because first they should take only the most important things. He extended his hand to the small chest and thought that first of all, he would take the most valuable thing here for himself. He adds that this was the Archmage's second most important legacy after Mordria. Energy streams of red, green, orange, and blue colors fly around the protagonist. He thought that these were spirits and of course, first of all, they should like him, but the power would be extremely useful if he man aged to get it. Leonard, with concern on his face, screams and asks the main character if he is okay. The protagonist, whose eyes are covered by a shadow, tells the bodyguard to wait and not touch him now. A mark in the form of crossed swords appears on the protagonist's hand, colored in four spirit colors. A voice comes from it asking the main character if they can live here. The protagonist replies that yes, but in return he will ask to pay a hefty amount of rent. Spirits inhabit the mark on the protagonist's hand. The mark disappears and the protagonist's hand glows. 
He thought that there was no change on the outside, but inside he felt the power of the spirits. Leonard asks the main character what else this is. The main character turns his head towards him and replies that it's nothing special, and then asks if they took everything. He adds that now they can go and destroy the magic circle of the fog. The fog has disappeared outside, and now everything around is illuminated by moonlight. The protagonist says that the fog has clearly cleared. Alan goes ahead, and Leonard follows him and suggests returning carefully. Dane follows them. He holds a purple ball in his hand and thought and wonders why the communication tool reacted unexpectedly. Alan asks the protagonist what happened, and he put his finger to his lips and told him to be quiet. With a concentrated look, he tells his partners that from now on they must keep their mouths shut and not come a step closer. An image of a man in a goblin mask appears in a purple ball, asking the main character who he is. The protagonist with a wary look thought that this scoundrel did not know him. He adds that he was thinking about provocation, but maybe you should change the method. The masked man tells the protagonist that he asked him who he is, and then asks where Goldilocks is. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, asks him if he is the most important person the lady was talking about. The masked man asks the main character if he heard about him from Goldilocks. The protagonist replies that his name is Ansel, and he belongs to the Randall Thieves Guild. He adds on Goldilocks' orders. He is pursuing the scoundrels who devastated the guild. He reports that these creatures crossed the border on a steel carriage. A masked man with a surprised look asks the protagonist about the steel carriage. The protagonist replies that yes, she has an unusual shape, which is difficult to find anywhere, and she is also pulled by a huge iron horse. The masked man smiles maliciously and thought that he heard that the Randall Thieves Guild was completely burned down, and then concludes that he was there too. He adds that contacting his sixes through a magical communication tool was a good idea. He asks the protagonist, calling him Ansel, if there was a girl with red hair among his companions. The main character clenched his hand into a fist and thought that, as expected, he was looking for the baby. The masked man asks where they are now. Dayin put his palm to the back of his head and replies that they are somewhere on the central ridge, but he cannot say the exact coordinates. He adds that since he was in a hurry, he did not have time to take a map and compass with him. The masked man calls the protagonist a fool and asks him if he even knows how huge the central mountain range is and can this really be called information. He commands to continue the investigation and then says that he will call him every day at the same time. The protagonist smiles and says that there is one problem. However, a man in a mask asks what the problem is. The main character squeezed the purple ball tightly, causing cracks to appear on it. He says that the connection quality is poor because the crystal ball was damaged during his time in pursuit. He adds that he doesn't know whether he will be able to get a signal tomorrow. The masked man slammed his hand on the table and asked the protagonist what he said and is there really no other sphere of communication through which he could contact him. The protagonist asks him how a simple thief could have such an expensive item in his hands. The masked man with a serious expression thought that they deliberately announced that they were going to the Tarot Kingdom and if the variable was created fraudulently it would be difficult to track them down. He adds that at the moment this guy named Ansel is the only one who can track down the child of fire. He gritted his teeth and thought that in any case the boy would be eliminated when he contacted the organization. He adds that he will consider this an emergency. He tells Ansel that he will now tell him how to contact the organization, after which he spends some time explaining. The protagonist with a concentrated look replies that he understood everything and then asks him if he can find out who exactly sent him here and then adds that he still doesn't know his name. The masked man put his hand to the ball in which the smiling protagonist was visible, and then he thought that this boy was impudent because he dared to ask his nickname. He adds that his death will be especially painful. The masked man introduces himself as the Red Goblin, and then adds that this will be enough. The protagonist, most of whose face is covered by shadow, repeats the nickname of the masked man. He tells the Red Goblin that he will contact him next time, after which he breaks the sphere into many pieces. After those events, the protagonist awakened Mordriai again with the help of a spiritual stone taken from the Dreit's hut. The main character asks the black-haired elf to accompany them to the elf settlement along the shortest route. Alan looks at the elf with an admiring look. Upon returning to the village, the elves held a grand feast. Many elves among the glowing lights are talking to each other. An elf in a green cloak notices the protagonist and exclaims that he has finally returned, and then says that thanks to him, his daughter woke up and he will be able to see his son's face for the first time in 100 years. The elf in a blue cloak wants to say what happened to her husband thanks to the protagonist, 
but he interrupts her and tells both elves to have fun. He adds that he is very tired, so he dares to leave them. The elves thank the protagonist and give him many gifts. The protagonist, with concern on his face, asks what kind of gifts these are. He put his gifts on the bench, and an elder appears nearby, who tells the main character what he deserves. She smiles and says that this is a natural reaction to the fact that the misty forest was destroyed. The protagonist sits down with her on the bench and says that he should have repaid her for saving the baby. The elf replies that although this is so, we should not forget that he also changed Helen's fate. The protagonist replies that it's true, because if it weren't for him, she wouldn't have been able to get here. The elder replies that this is indeed so, with a serious expression on her face. She says that she can read the fates of living beings, but only read, and not interfere. She adds that she is only allowed to observe, but, oddly enough, the fate of the protagonist is hidden from her view. The protagonist listens to the girl's words with a concentrated gaze. She tells the protagonist that, however, many destinies in the world are changing because of him. The protagonist crossed his arms and thought that the reason was to Heidel's watch. He asked the girl what her conclusion is, and is she really hinting that he should sit quietly and fold his hands? The elder closes his eyes and makes a joyful expression on his face, after which he answers the protagonist that it's nothing like that and calls him a very good person. She adds that she likes the changes that the protagonist brings to the world and therefore hopes that he will continue to change even more destinies. A drop of sweat runs down the protagonist's cheek and he replies that there is nothing difficult in this because he just needs to do everything at his own discretion. The protagonist takes his gifts and the elder asks him if he is leaving already. Dayin replies that the baby must be suffering from a starving fate now, so we should go and help change that. The elder sits on a bench among white flying lights. Small streams of green energy appear next to her, and she asks Abraxas what he thinks. The voice answers the elder that, as she said, he is interesting, so it would be nice to meet him once. The protagonist in a straw hat and sunglasses sits on a chair and says that they have been in the elven forest for too long. He reveals that the elves said they were going to build the villa on his wish list, so he can't leave without seeing it. The elves began construction around one tree. The protagonist with a smile on his face says that the fact that he needs to return to his world within a month is confusing all his plans. From the open window, Lily's voice is heard calling the protagonist. Her face is dirty and she is holding a brush in her hand, and young Shin is standing next to her. She exclaims that she figured out the painting. The protagonist tells the children that the two of them should take a shower while he loads the luggage, after which he and Mordria go to the carriage. The children agree to the protagonist. Leonard looks at the cart attached to the carriage and asks if it would be better to get another one. Standing next to a cart filled with things, Alan crossed his arms and asked why not fold them, dividing them by size. Leonard climbs into the cart and replies that it won't work because the cart is packed to capacity. Helen standing behind him says that there is still a lot of luggage left. The protagonist with a skeptical expression asks what is there. Helen hands the protagonist a yellow bottle and exclaims that this is a traditional family drink. Alan, with a gray stone in his hand, T. LLS the protagonist to definitely take the spiritual stone with him. The main character, with an awkward look on his face, says that he is grateful for the gifts, but there are too many of them. He adds that he will take the rest the next time he comes here, so they should unload half of the luggage back. Alan and Leonard made shocked expressions. The bodyguard says that they put everything together so diligently. You can see the sunset behind the mountains. The protagonist says that now you can set out. Next to him are children, and opposite them is the princess with her people and the elder. The protagonist says that it's a pity that they have to part so soon. Leonard shakes the main character's hand and tells the main character that they will definitely meet again, and then he will certainly repay his kindness. Alan bows to the main character and says that he is really very grateful to him. He adds that at the next meeting he will appear before him as a more outstanding magician. Helen, with reddened cheeks, tells the protagonist that she hopes he doesn't forget his promise to see her in a year. The protagonist, with an embarrassed expression on his face, tells them that the three of them remain too serious until the very end. The elder tells the main character that he hopes that he will visit them again someday. She gazes at the protagonist with a serene look and says at the end of this journey, while traveling with him, she wishes him luck in getting that desired answer. The protagonist smiles and thought that she wanted to say that Abraxas will be waiting for him at the end of the journey. He commands to go, after which the carriage moves. Lily says goodbye to everyone with a smile on her face. The protagonist tells her not to lean out of the window because she might get hurt. Helen, Leonard, and Alan wave goodbye. 
The princess stops waving her hand and says that he really left. She turns around and with a serious expression on her face tells her subordinates that they will then begin to carry out their work, after which they say that they accept the order. Kingdom of Teru, City of Florence. The carriage drives along the road. The protagonist, who changed his hair color to gray as a disguise, thought that entering the country was easy, since the passes were issued by Golkin himself. He looks at the luxurious multi-story building and thought that this was the same meeting place that the goblin mentioned. A hotel employee standing behind the counter greets the protagonist and asks him how he can help. He turned his attention to the children and wondered what kind of ragamuffins they were and whether they were the kind of people who immediately flinched when they heard what the cost of living here was. The protagonist puts a bag of gold on the table and asks to give them the two most expensive rooms. The surprised hotel worker exclaims that these are gold coins. The protagonist says that he also needs one magical communication tool. The hotel worker takes out a purple ball and tells the protagonist that here it is, and then adds that if anything else is needed, he should be informed about it. Great Florence. Lots of cards, chips, and dice fly among the black and gold lines. This is one of the most famous hotels and gambling establishments on the continent. The roulette wheel is spinning on the gaming table. It is known that the gaming halls occupy three floors, and the lower you go, the more likely it is that they will offer you gambling with higher stakes. A luxurious chandelier shines brightly on the ceiling. Lily wears a green and white dress with a yellow bow, and her hair is brown. She exclaims that everywhere you look, everything is so sparkling and beautiful. Young Shin is wearing a jacket, and his hair has also turned brown. He says that when they return, he will make a lot of shiny things. Lily asks if this is true, and then reveals that she, however, prefers chicken. The protagonist holds a bag in his hand and tells the children that here is the money, so they, the kids, can do whatever they want for now. He adds that if he starts to feel sleepy, they should go back to the room and sleep. Children agree with the main character. The protagonist tells Mordria, who has a serene expression on her face, that she will now accompany them, and if anything happens, she should report to him. Joyful Lily stands in front of the elf and young Shin and offers them something tasty to eat. The main character asks if he should also have some fun. With a smile on his face, he throws a red chip into the air with his finger and thought that he can have fun until he manages to get to the fourth hidden floor. Someone shouts that he will make another warbler. Great Florence, third floor. The main character walks between the gaming tables. He thought that although the entrance to the third floor looked free, the stakes here were clearly crazier than on the floors above. The brown-haired man is carefully watching the main character, and he thought that the managers began to closely watch him. He guesses that it's probably because he's never been seen here before. He stands near an empty chair and pays attention to two employees of the establishment behind him. He thought that among them, there was an expert-level swordsman, a magician, and several assassins, and there was also a magic ceiling barrier installed in the trap. He adds that as he thought, this is not just a place for secret meetings. A brown-haired man approaches the protagonist, puts his hand to his chest, and asks the protagonist if he is looking for a specific game. He points to the roulette, and tells the protagonist that it is a game with simple rules, and then asks him what he thinks about it. He tells the protagonist that he must choose a number from 1 to 50, and then he will start spinning the disc, and if the metal ball stops on the number he chose, he will receive a chip. The protagonist puts his hand to the gaming table and says that this game is really simple. He adds that he is ready to play right now. He moves his gold chips forward and says that he will bet everything on 7 to start. The employee of the establishment takes one of the chips and with concern on his face asks if all these chips are gold. He calls the main character brave and then announces the start of the game. The roulette ball begins to spin. One of the observers asks if this man really bet everything. Another person calls the main character crazy. Another person says that it seems the protagonist has decided to lose everything. The ball stops at the number seven. One of the observers asks if the ball really stopped at seven. The main character clenches his hand into a fist and says that he is lucky today. The establishment employee congratulates the protagonist and moves the one chips to him, and then asks if he wants to play again. The protagonist says that he will play again, but this time he will bet everything on a seven. The employee of the establishment smiles and mentally calls the main character a fool. One of the people watching asks if the main character is sane. Another person shouts that it's just beginner's luck. The third person shouts that if this guy decided to cheat, he could just give the chip to him. The ball stops again at the number seven. People watching with joyful faces shout that it is seven again. The main character, with a smug expression on his face, exclaims that today he is incredibly lucky. The employee of the establishment is trembling and thought that the ball was rolling at full speed towards the seven, 
and then adds that this scoundrel was clearly using some kind of trick. He asks the main character to wait, and then adds that the amount is large, so he needs to write him a check. The man behind the protagonist congratulates him on his victory. Another man puts his hand on the main character's shoulder, after which he asks him to keep his hands away. One of the people nearby asks the main character what family he is from. The main character grabs his chips. He throws them on the floor, after which people begin to push and actively pull their hands towards them. The protagonist looks at his hand and tells the spirit that he is not bad. A jelly-like transparent creature with round eyes appears on the protagonist's hand. The main character thought that this was a synthesized spirit that he got in the Dreit's basement, and even though it was still weak, it was still created using ancient magic and was not affected by most magical tools or magic detection devices. The establishment employee hands the protagonist a check and tells him that he sincerely congratulates him. The main character takes the check and says that he was surprised that they actually brought him a check because the amount was impressive, so he was a little worried. The employee of the establishment says that such an amount is a mere trifle for them, so he has nothing to worry about. A gray-haired man stands next to him. The protagonist asks him if he really called such a sum a trifle. The gray-haired man whispers to the protagonist that in reality, they have a separate equip space for visitors like him, and if he doesn't mind, they can take him there. Dayeen smiles and says that he is curious to see this special space. They climb the dark stairs. The protagonist asks what those screams are. The gray-haired man replies that people who come here like things that make you nervous. He adds that often things are at stake, not money. He adds that depending on the person's choice, body parts can also be used as bets. The main character became wary and thought that he felt it without even expanding the range of his senses. He adds that the lower they go, the more distinct the smell of blood and the sounds of screams become. Fourth floor of Great Florence. The protagonist and the people accompanying him are in the corridor in front of the double doors. The gray-haired man says that they are here. The gray-haired man tells the protagonist that he seems to like the number seven, so they prepared a room with a similar number. A man in a brown robe sitting at a table looks at the protagonist and asks if this is a newcomer. The long-haired man asks the protagonist whether he will join right away or watch a couple of games first. The main character goes to the table and asks the people behind him what they are playing. The gray-haired man, looking at the protagonist, thought that he had already been told that he had used some kind of trick. He adds that he should just try the same trick here. He thought that even if the protagonist gave everything he had, it would not be enough to pay for using his hands. A man in a brown robe points to the dice and says that you need to roll three dice, and the one with the highest number wins. He adds that when all the same numbers come up, it is better than the sum of different numbers, and it is best if it comes up 1-1-1. One, one, one. The main character puts all his gold chips on the table and says that he likes that the rules are simple, and then adds that they should start. The man in the robe says that he will throw the dice first. He slammed his fist on the table when he saw three fours on the table, and then said that this time he would take everything for himself. The protagonist asks if it's his turn now, and then rolls the dice with a serious expression on his face. The dice roll up three ones. A man in a robe with concern on his face says that at first everyone is lucky. A long-haired man with an eye patch says that we need to continue. The main character rolls the dice again and replies that he will be happy to continue, because today luck is clearly on his side. The other two players are shaking and gritting their teeth. The short-haired man in a robe thought that this scoundrel had rolled only once for the fourth time in a row, so he was clearly using a trick, but the question is which one. He adds that there are no problems with the magic circle for detecting magic. The protagonist with three bags of chips behind him says that his luck is so good today that it has already become an unbearable burden for him, and then asks the other players if they should stop, given that they are out of chips. The protagonist leaves six gold chips on the table, after which he says that this is a consolation prize, and then adds that he had a lot of fun. A gray-haired man tells the protagonist with a bag behind his back to stop. He moves his hand to the side and tells the protagonist that he knows very well that he used some kind of trick. He pulls out a hidden sword from his cane and tells the protagonist that the jokes are over. He adds that it is better for him to quietly put this bag on the floor. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, asks him what he is saying and whether he is evidence. He adds that without evidence it is wrong to label people as fraudsters. The gray-haired man takes the sword to the side and tells the protagonist that even if there is no evidence, you can just slowly extract the whole truth from him. The short-haired and long-haired men standing behind the protagonist draw weapons. A man with an eye patch runs towards the protagonist with a sword at the ready and calls him a scoundrel, and then asks him how he dared to deceive them. He adds that he won't get away with it. 
The main character takes the weapon from the man with the headband and strikes the short-haired man. A gray-haired man runs at the protagonist from behind and calls him a scoundrel. The main character strikes the enemy's sword with a dagger, after which it breaks into two parts. The gray-haired man looks at the dagger, shrouded in white energy, and asks if it is an aura blade. He asks what did the sword master forget in this place. The protagonist with a menacing look says that the person who manages the organization's finances has too poor eyesight. The gray-haired man opens his eyes wide and asks the protagonist who he is. Blue energy swirls around a purple ball with a pattern in the protagonist's hand. The protagonist thought that the pattern that appears when mana is combined according to a prescribed formula is a symbol of the secret organization pandemonium. He adds that as the goblin said, he should have used this to communicate with members of the organization. But there is one thing. The protagonist wonders what he should answer if they ask about him and whether he should tell it like it is. He remembers the red goblin saying that they won't ask anything, so he needs to keep his mouth shut. The main character puts a mask on his face and thought that these words finally convinced him that for an organization of this size, even simply providing contact information to outsiders would be a serious crime. He wonders how about making a big play? A gray-haired man looks at the protagonist in a red goblin mask and shouts that he is the red goblin. He wonders why one of the priests to whom that person gave the monster mask is here. A gray-haired man with concern on his face tells the protagonist that he heard that he is chasing the child of fire and then asks him what brought him here. The main character asks him if he still doesn't understand. He gets angry and says that this is a sudden inspection. He adds that he will now inspect this place, and he will accompany him. The gray-haired man shows the protagonist a room with chests on shelves and a red book on the table, and then says that this is a cash storage facility. He adds that the gambling establishment's revenue management is thorough and transparent. The protagonist thought that he had made a guess based on the meeting location and the inside of the organization's financial system, and it turned out to be correct. The main character opens the book, and the gray-haired man tells him that it is an account book and asks him to check it carefully. Dayin thought that this money was moving all over the continent, and then wondered why an organization of this magnitude was not discovered in his previous life. There are boxes and chests on the table, and in the corner of the room, there are many spiritual stones. The gray-haired man says that this is a storage room with treasures, and among the things taken as collateral from the gambling house, only things of the highest quality were collected here. The main character took a closer look at the spiritual stones and thought that it would be nice to use one to power the clock, and the other on the way back. The gray-haired man presses a button, after which the wall moves to the side. He asks the protagonist to allow him to show him the works they have worked on with great effort over several years. He shows the protagonist a cage in which the creature is trembling and says that this side is defective. He adds that successful lots, which are not embarrassing to show, are located a little further. The angry main character opens his eyes wide and does not express sincere surprise. The protagonist and the gray-haired man approach another great. The attendant reports that these guys are successful lots. There are two dark-haired children sitting in a cage. The gray-haired man says that although on the outside they look like ordinary people, but if you put them under stress, everyone's ugly nature will immediately appear. He tells the protagonist that right now he will show him the true appearance of these kids. The children were scared after his words. Blood is pouring onto the ground. Children develop fur on their skin. The children have turned into menacing werewolves who roar loudly. The main character thought that his original plan was to pose as the Red Goblin to gain information about the organization. He adds that on the way back, he could also grab a couple of spiritual stones and artifacts. He thought that something like that would be more than enough to cause problems for the Red Goblin. The gray-haired man smiles and asks the main character what he thinks about it. He holds a whip in his hand and says that there are still some problems, but once they can be resolved, they can organize mass production. One of the werewolves is enveloped in an electric discharge and falls to the floor. The werewolf turned back into a human and the gray-haired man tells the protagonist that now he will show him the other children too. He names the girl Hannah and asks her to come to him. The girl made a frightened expression on her face. She got angry and in a trembling voice told the gray-haired man that she had already shown what was required. The gray-haired man tells the girl to be silent because an important guest has come to them, so she should fully demonstrate her usefulness. The protagonist takes the whip from the man and says that he should try it once too, and he agrees. The girl has her arms crossed and is shaking. The protagonist approached her and thought what it meant. The baby was also in a similar place. He clutches the whip tightly and says that he has changed his mind. He destroys the collar around her neck. A gray-haired man with concern on his face tells the protagonist that if he takes off the collar, 
problems will arise. The protagonist replies that it can be used without this thing. He tells the boy that he will also remove the collar, after which he immediately frees his neck. The gray-haired man tells the protagonist to stop, because if he continues in the same spirit, then later it will be difficult to catch and rein in all of them. The main character pulls the whip and tells the gray-haired man to be silent. He twisted the whip around his neck. He moves the whip to the side, after which the head of the villain flies off his shoulders. Day in with a serious expression on his face, says that he understands that his actions will cause him a lot of trouble. Near the protagonist, two human figures form from the purple fog. One of them tells the protagonist, T.H., that she will give him the opportunity to explain himself. The main character asks him if he is curious about the reason. He makes a whip attack and tells them that he didn't like them all. That's all. The blow hits a masked man in a cloak who screams in pain. The second masked man attacks the main character with his weapon and shouts asking him, if he is a traitor. The protagonist knocked the weapon out of his hands. He took the enemy's sword in his hand. He strikes with his sword at the enemy and goes behind his back. He lifts the enemy into the air with his whip, and then, when they almost fall to the floor, slashes at them with his sword. The children watch what is happening with concern on their faces. The main character stands among defeated enemies. He turns to the children and tells them that they are leaving here. He hits the bars of the cage and cuts them. The boy asks the main character why he is helping them. The protagonist got out of the cage and tells the children that if they want to stay here, then let them stay. He then tells them that, however, they should know that he won't be able to take care of them because he will have to fight. The gray-haired boy tells the protagonist that he is leaving and then adds that he wants to see his mother. Hannah says she wants to see her mom too. The protagonist sighs and tells the children that then they need to stop talking and should quickly leave here. The main character makes several hits on the wall and cuts out a diamond in it. The main character with four children behind him stopped because enemies appeared in front of him. The gray-haired man asks the protagonist to surrender. The protagonist's hand is covered with armor, and he says that although he does not like to ignorantly break through the ranks of enemies with the help of force, it seems that now he should use this particular method. The masked man puts his hand forward, after which he commands to attack. His subordinates take fighting stances. The protagonist is enveloped in blue energy, after which he moves at lightning speed. He swings his fist, which emits crackling energy, at one of his enemies. He throws a punch, causing a wave of energy to push the red-haired man away. Two enemy magicians use the fireball and ice spear skills, after which ice spikes and flames are directed at the main character. The protagonist uses the shield skill, after which a blue barrier is formed in front of him, blocking enemy spells. The protagonist's barrier was cracked, and he thought that there were too many magical spells, and he could not constantly use the shield. The gray-haired scoundrel with an angry expression on his face shouts that only one person is opposing them, and he needs to be driven into a corner. One of the enemies attacks the protagonist and cuts his hand. Green steam emanates from the cut. The main character wonders if it is poison. He quickly moves forward and strikes two enemies. He thought with a worried expression about the fog and paralysis. He adds that curses that restrict movement are a problem. There are double doors in the dark corridor. The protagonist thought that the longer the battle lasts, the more disadvantageous he finds himself, and he is still very far from being released. He punches the door and shouts that he is heading to the treasure vault, then tells the children to follow him. A man with his hair tied in a ponytail jumped on the main character from behind. The protagonist gritted his teeth and thought that it was a pity that he did not take Salad with him. He turns back and sees the werewolf biting the hand of the scoundrel. He exclaims that it was done masterfully. He opens the double doors and shouts to the children to come inside quickly. The main character enters the treasury and shouts to the children that they must use everything that is inside, be it weapons or armor. He adds that he will not be able to withstand their onslaught for long. The children run away in different directions. He points to the spiritual stones with his hand and asks one of the children to bring those red stones lying at the very top. The boy gives the main character spiritual stones. He says that everything is fine and then squeezes the spiritual stones in his hand, after which light seeps through his fingers. He unclenches his hand, after which it begins to tremble. The main character asks what's wrong again. One of the enemies commands the others to use all attacks at the same time. Dayin is alert and is about to use the shield skill, but does not have time. The main character is hit by a powerful flame, after which he falls to the ground. He leans on his arm and coughs. He thought that it was difficult for him to get up because of those curses. A white-haired man standing behind the protagonist tells him that it's all over and calls him the Red Goblin. 
the main character thought about whether he should just go back. He thought that he was quite capable of getting out alone. The white-haired man commands his subordinates to arrest only successful lots, and the rest can be killed. The main character began to think about what would happen if he did this, but the noise stopped him. The ceiling begins to crumble, and a lot of debris falls to the floor. Lily appears, exclaiming that she found the uncle. She is accompanied by Mordria. The main character, with concern on his face, asks Lily how she found out about this place. She clenches her hand into a fist and shows the protagonist the bracelet, and then tells him that there is a function for finding a lost child. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, tells her that she should have just washed her feet and gone to bed. One of the villains asks what else this is. He thought that in any case, it came in very handy. Another of the masked men asks if this is an elf and a golem. Their commander commands one of his subordinates to find out what is happening above. Lily, with an alarmed expression on her face, asks the main character if he is injured. The main character replies that no, he is not injured. His hand is enveloped in blue energy and he asks if this thing has changed again. The chandelier is shaking a lot. Someone asks what's going on. One of the visitors standing among the chairs shouts that it is an earthquake. A girl in a red dress fell to the ground near the fire and screams. One of the visitors shouts that the building is collapsing. Florence is broken into several parts. The man in the gray hat swore and then exclaimed that he ran out, throwing all the chips inside, and as a result there was a lot of money left there. A woman in a blue dress runs behind him. A powerful stream of blue energy bursts out of the building. One of the villains shouts that they should not be allowed to escape and that they need to aim at successful specimens. Young Shin peeks out from a hole in the building. Mordria shoots with a bow, and the main character and Lily use their magic. Dain smiles maliciously and points his hand forward. Blue energy oozes from his palm. A long-haired man on a horse shouts and asks what is going on here. The brown-haired man calls the long-haired man commander with a worried look on his face. He tells him that the building suddenly caught fire and collapsed. Light is periodically visible, and loud sounds continue to be heard from inside. The commander with a dissatisfied expression on his face tells his subordinate that it turns out that he knows nothing. He adds that the fire needs to be put out. He glanced warily and thought that he had arrived having received a message that the Red Goblin had betrayed them. He looks at the burning building and thought that until recently he did not believe that he could betray the organization. The protagonist on a carriage flies through a ring of fire. He has a serene expression on his face. The commander with an angry expression on his face thought that it was the Red Goblin which means that he was told the truth. He wants to ask the Red Goblin why he betrayed them, but does not have time, because the carriage is quickly moving away. The protagonist points his hand at the captain and wonders if that scoundrel is also a member of the organization. A powerful stream of energy is directed at the commander and disintegrates half of his body. A warrior carries a bucket of water among burning ruins. Someone shouts that the commander was attacked and the attackers run away. The other warrior made a worried expression. The next day, the news about the traitor, who not only stole the precious treasures of Magna Florence, but also burned the building itself, quickly spread everywhere. Leaflets were scattered along the street. A man and a woman read their contents. The kingdom wanted the culprit to compensate for the astronomical losses, and the nickname of the culprit revealed in the newspapers was the Red Goblin. A man in a green goblin mask clutches a leaflet in his hand. He looks at the purple ball and tells the Red Goblin to return to headquarters. The Red Goblin asks his interlocutor if he really thinks that he is a traitor. He adds that Scoundrel is a fake because he is not in the kingdom at all. The Green Goblin crossed his arms and said that he knew, but that Scoundrel had their information and even knew how to establish a connection. He adds that this means that there is a traitor in their ranks. He reports that they plan to stop all outside activities and focus on finding traitors within the system. The Red Goblin is surprised and thought that since there is a traitor among them, then we are really talking about Ansel. He grits his teeth in anger and wonders if he even knows how hard it was to get the mask again. He adds that if he finds himself under investigation, he may never be able to come out again. He informs his interlocutor that he will continue to search for the child of fire. The Green Goblin gets angry and asks his subordinate if he is going to disobey the order and then tells him to go back now. The Red Goblin touches the purple ball and says that he is on the trail of the child of fire. He adds that he will return back as soon as he finds her. The Green Goblin began to tell his subordinate what would happen if he did not go back this very second, but the connection was interrupted because the Red Goblin put his hand to the ball. With an angry expression on his face, he says that he will find the child of fire and kill him. 
tearing that fake into pieces. He opens the door, a wooden door with metal elements. He walks along the wooden floor and says that it is quiet here. He goes down the stairs and looks at the many corpses and then tells them that a little earlier, however, they were chatting incessantly about the fake. He holds red hair in his hand and thought that he searched the burned Great Florence and found red hair that clearly belonged to that girl. He throws his hair and says it's good. He thought, what does it mean she is there? The gray-haired boy with a serious expression thought that having taken them, it was unknown what he intended to do. He adds that he cannot believe him. She puts her hand forward and asks the other children if they don't all notice anything strange about that guy. The dark-haired boy replies that he buys them a lot of all sorts of goodies and seems like a good person. The gray-haired girl tells the protagonist that her leg hurts. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, asks her why she only told him about this now. He adds that he has a lot of potions, and they should immediately tell them if something hurts. Orange energy envelopes the girl's leg, after which the wound disappears, and the girl notices that her leg now doesn't hurt at all. The two children behind her are surprised by what is happening. The main character tells three children in a wooden bathtub that they smell bad, so they need to wash themselves thoroughly. He adds that he also bought clothes for everyone, so they should choose what they like. One girl dressed in black and white clothes, and the gray-haired boy tied his hair in a ponytail and dressed in black clothes. She thought with concern on her face that she was sure he clearly had something evil on his mind. She adds that there is a reason he wants them to open their hearts. She puts her hand to the window and hears the boy calling his mother, and she calls him by name John. A woman standing next to her son tells the protagonist that she is grateful to him for finding her son. The protagonist closes her eyes and replies that it's not worth it, because if someone in the future asks where her child is, there may be problems. He adds that in general, this is how the organization can come to find him. He tells the woman that he will write her a letter of recommendation, so she should go to the elven forest and better set off as soon as possible. The woman thanks the main character. The gray-haired boy watches what is happening through the window and wonders if he really took and returned everyone back to their families without harming anyone. Joyful Lily asks her if she suspects the uncle. The gray-haired boy replies that, of course, and then asks her how anyone can trust adults. Lily says that you can trust the uncle because doing good deeds is his hobby. She imagines the protagonist in a chitin with a halo and angel wings. A gray-haired boy with a skeptical expression on his face tells the red-haired girl that after her words he began to look even more suspicious. She looks down and says what she thinks, you can trust him a little. A crescent moon rises in the sky. The protagonist invites the children to set up camp today. Children agree with the main character. Dayin with a stern look tells the gray-haired boy that the baby will reach her village tomorrow, and he has the last two left. He asks them if they really don't intend to return home. Hannah, with a worried expression on her face, wants to say something about their family, but the boy interrupts her and says that they are not going to return. The protagonist with a serene look thought that perhaps not all families would be happy to have children on the doorstep. He asks the children if he can give them a ride to the elven forest. The kids enthusiastically accepted the protagonist's offer. The main character takes something out from under his robe and says that he will now prepare dinner and they will eat. Young Shin asks him if he will cook and then says that he doesn't want to. Lily asks the protagonist not to cook anything. The gray-haired boy raises his hand and screams asking to be allowed to cook dinner for him and then adds that he really wants to start cooking. Lily clenches her hand into a fist and says that Zeke said that he wants to cook. The protagonist asks her if it's not that she just hates eating his cooking and then asks Zeke to cook something. The boy with gray hair sighs. He thought that at first it seemed to him that he was eating poison, although this turned out not to be the case. He adds that this guy cannot be allowed to cook. The main character asks the boy if he has finished the dish and he asks to wait a little longer. There is a meat dish with vegetables in the pan. Lily, with an appetite on her face, asks Zeke if she can try it. The boy, with concern on his face, tells her that when taking a sample, she is trying the whole pan, so it's better to play with Hannah. Young Shin is beside himself with worry. Zeke closes the pan and thought it would be great if the meat was stewed properly. He adds that it seems that just before the carriage stopped, he saw a laurel tree. He tells the others that he will be back quickly, so they should not open the lid. Otherwise, all the aroma will disappear. He found the plan he needed. Someone appeared behind him when he said that he needed to come back quickly. Someone put a hand to her face. An unknown person tells Zeke that it is commendable that he left the camp alone. It was the Red Goblin. He clenches his hand into a fist and tells the boy that there is one job for him. Zeke thought that his case was not moving, 
and then wondered who the person behind him was. He thought that day Ian was wearing that mask, and then he notices that now he has a real enemy in front of him. Lily raises her hands and asks Zeke why he was so late, and then asks him to finish cooking quickly. He throws herds into the pan and thought that his hand was moving on its own. He mentally wants to inform the other members of the group that this is a trap. He stands with a tense expression on his face. He sees both the protagonist, Young Shin, and Lily fainted. Zeke wants this to stop. The Red Goblin hits the back of the boy's head and tells him that it was a great job. He approaches Lily and says that he has finally found her. He extends his hand to her and says that all he has to do is bring her back and he can return everything. The angry protagonist punches him in the face. The Red Goblin falls to the ground. The protagonist stands next to him and asks him what she was doing while she was wandering around somewhere. He grabs the enemy by the clothes and tells him that he was waiting for him, and then informs him that first he will give him a good thrashing. He remembers how he and his group were riding on a carriage, and then thought that everywhere from the border wall to Magna Florence, he had created a fuss, so he had no doubt that the Red Goblin would follow them. He remembers the crumbling Great Florence from which people fled. He remembered how he returned the child to his mother and thought that he was even deliberately stalling for time, taking the children home. He remembers looking out the window, pretending he didn't know anything, but in fact he was watching the Red Goblin's steps. He thought that since he had caused a real massacre in the gambling house, he would undoubtedly try to get closer as carefully as possible. He adds that the goal is to strike with precision and lightning speed. The transparent protagonist remembers watching the Red Goblin handing pills to Zeke and thinking that he was really not trying to harm the boy, but passing something on. The main character tries the dish prepared by the boy and then thought that it was a simple sleeping pill, which is even better. He adds that no one should see what will happen next. He moves his hand a little, causing the Red Goblin's head to move from side to side. He asks him to open his eyes because they have a lot to talk about. The Red Goblin's eyes glow a bright red color as he used the mind control skill. The main character opens his eyes wide in surprise and is enveloped in blue energy. He makes a blow to the enemy's head and shouts that this roguish trick will not work on him. He sees the Red Goblin leaning on his hands and thought that he was going to knock him out a little, but he turned out to be stronger than expected. The scoundrel with an angry expression on his face calls the protagonist Ansel and shouts that this is all his doing. He adds that the main character is to blame for both the theft of the Child of Fire and the fire in the gambling house. The main character puts his hands together and asks the villain what kind of theft he is talking about, and then adds that he needs to express himself correctly. The protagonist hit the Red Goblin on the head, and in a stern voice tells him that the baby is not an object. He hits him on the head one more time, after which he is pushed far back. The protagonist cancels concealment, after which Mordria, standing nearby, can now be seen. He asked her to stay there to protect the children and send a signal if anything happens. Mordria listens to the protagonist with a serene expression on her face. She leaves, and the protagonist thought that judging by the fact that Scoundrel did not react to his blows, his fighting skills were terrible. Green barriers envelop. The Red Goblin's body. The protagonist thought that the very fact that he could withstand them calmly indicated that his body was unusual, but it did not seem that it was enhanced by mana. The protagonist, looking at the Red Goblin rising from the floor, thought that even now he did not see a single scratch on him. He says that he understood everything. He sees the stitches on the Red Goblin's chest and asks him if he was also a test subject or if he became one a little later. The scoundrel clenched his teeth in anger. He jumps on the protagonist with a flame in his hand and shouts at him to shut up. The protagonist thought that his fire was similar to that of the little girl, but his skills in controlling the flames were a cut above. He dodges the enemy's attack and clenches his hand into a fist and then tells him that he does not know what kind of machinations have been performed on his body, but he doubts that he needs to control his strength. With a fist shrouded in blue energy, the protagonist hits the enemy's hand, after which its flame disappears. He then punches him in the face. The Red Goblin is pushed away after being hit by the protagonist. He forms ice in his hand and calls the main character a geek. Day In quickly moves towards the villain. He went behind him and raised his fist. Black birds fly against the background of the night sky. Lying on the ground, the Red Goblin thought that he was helplessly taking one blow after another. He wonders why this happened. He thought that after numerous baptisms, this body easily breaks stones, and he can calmly control the power of fire and ice without spells. He shouts to the main character that he is fundamentally different from him. The protagonist pours the potion on his face and tells him to be silent, and then informs him that with such a body, he doesn't even know how to really fight. 
The protagonist with a stern look invites the Red Goblin to chat, because he has a lot of questions. The villain asks the protagonist how he is connected with the Child of Fire, because the family and relatives of this child were insignificant people. Dain tells him to answer the questions. He says that he will now ask the first question and then ask the Red Goblin what the purpose of their pandemonium is. The villain, with a malicious smile, replies that he doesn't even know and then informs the protagonist that he will not receive any information from him. The main character crunches his fingers and tells the Red Goblin that in this case, only he will be worse off. The villain asks the main character if he is really going to torture him. The Red Goblin lifts his torso from the ground and shouts to the protagonist to try this because he is the one who has endured all the pain that exists in this world. The protagonist raises the index and middle finger on his hand, after which he tells the villain to shut up. The Red Goblin feels pain in six places at once. The main character tells him that since he says that he has suffered all the pain of this world, then how about trying the torture method of another dimension on himself? The skin on the scoundrel's torso curls, causing him to grit his teeth in pain. The main character grabs the trembling villain by the hand and tells him that this is the so-called art of twisting joints. He adds that after he mastered this technique, none of his tortures failed. The joints on the Red Goblin's hand are twisted, after which the protagonist says that although there were people who could not bear it and died, he is persistent. The villain screams loudly due to pain. The main character drags the Red Goblin by the hood to the carriage. He asks Mordria if she carried the children into the carriage. He stands next to the open door to the carriage next to Mordria and thought that he did not give her such an order. So, did she really make the decision on her own? He asked the girl to continue to keep an eye on them. He put his hand shrouded in blue energy to Lily's head and thought that all he could do was get rid of the sleeping pills. He asked the girl to stand up for a while. Sleepy Lily wipes her eyes and asks the main character when she fell asleep. The main character says that he needs to show her something and then asks her to follow him. Lily sees the tied up red goblin and is surprised. She asks who it is, and the masked man sits silently. He opens his eyes wide when he sees the girl, and then says that this is the child of fire. He says that this is the same daring, impudent girl who has run away well until now. Lily made a frightened expression on her face. The red goblin with an evil smile tells the girl that now that she has an ally strong enough to capture him, she must be living happily ever after, but she shouldn't think that it will all end there. An imaginary cage appears around Lily. The villain tells her that he will haunt her even after death. The main character sees Lily trembling. Dane put his hand to the girl's head. He thought that if he destroyed this scoundrel, the little girl would remain in the dark until the very end. He made a stern look and thought that, however, then she would not be able to get rid of the nightmare in which he was haunting her. He made a skeptical expression on his face and tells Lily to look at the red goblin carefully and then asks if there is anything fearful in his appearance, because he is tied hand and foot, so he cannot cause her any harm. Lily remembers how the red goblin in a mask was holding a whip in his hands, and the protagonist is burning for her to do whatever she wanted to do with him. He adds that she can get even with either a word or an action, because it's been hard for her so far. Lily remembers how the red goblin grabbed her friend, while another member of the organization restrained her. The main character tells her that as soon as she figures everything out, they will have a hearty breakfast. Lily lowered her gaze and then agreed with the protagonist. She passes through an imaginary grate. She approaches the Red Goblin. She clutches her hand tightly. She hits the villain on the head. The Red Goblin clenched his teeth in anger and asked the girl how she dared to hit him. Lily formed three fireballs above herself and then shouted to the enemy that now she is not at all afraid of him. She shouts that Wendy's enemy will pay. She sets the Red Goblin on fire with her magic. The scoundrel opened his eyes wide. Lily rises into the air and forms a huge fireball above herself. The Red Goblin wonders how she was able to master such a powerful force. The flame sets him on fire, and he thought that the child who escaped from the test chamber was showing much more colossal growth than other children in the organization. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, asks Lily not to kill this man. The girl clenches her hands in a fist and asks the main character why she can't do this. The main character replies that he still has questions for him. Lily looked at the scorched masked man and then agreed with the main character. The protagonist approaches the Red Goblin and thought that he was unable to extract information about Pandemonium from him. He adds that he assumed that he could hold out until now, but in the end it is a matter of time for him to endure. He pours the potion on the Red Goblin's head and then says that they will stop there first. The main character smiles and says that they will have breakfast and return, 
and then offers to talk together. Behind a stone fence with cracks, there are many wooden houses. The next day, Lily's home village. Local residents look at the bag tied to the carriage. One of them asks what kind of carriage this is. The second one asks if it's possible that they should know this. The third one asks what brought them to such a wilderness. The fourth asks why they travel, dragging a dirty bag behind them. The protagonist sits on a chair in a carriage with his arms crossed and looks out the window. He asks Lily if this is the place, and the joyful girl replies that this is definitely it. They just need to continue driving down the street. Lily turns to young Shin and asks what she should say first when she meets her mother. She then asks if her mother recognizes her. Young Shin replies what he thinks she will know right away. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, thought that to be honest, he was not sure that the baby's mother was still alive. He adds that the baby escaped from the organization. So, as an option, her mother is being held as a hostage. A wooden house with cracked walls is illuminated by the sun's rays. Lily says that this is her house where she lived as a child. She knocks on the door. She and the rest of the group are silent for a while, but only silence greets them in response. Zeke, with concern on his face, asks if there is anyone there. The protagonist, Mordria and Young Shin silently look at the door. From the back of the door, someone asks who is there. Lily opened her eyes wide and then exclaimed that it was her and said her name. The blonde opens the wooden door. With a surprised look, she asks her daughter if this is it. She touches Lily's cheeks and tells her that she has grown a lot. The girl with a smile on her face asks her mother if she recognizes her. Mom replies that of course and asks how it could be otherwise. He hugs his daughter and she tells her mom that she missed her. That day a meat party was held in the village. Meat, mushrooms, and vegetables are fried on the grill. The protagonist stands next to a man grateful for the food with a plate in his hands and thought that they laid out all the meat reserves. There was enough for every villager, but since she is happy, then sometimes you can make such sacrifices. A mustachioed man with a receding hairline tells Lily's mother that he heard her daughter is back and then congratulates her. He tells the girl that she is the spitting image of her mother, and the woman thanks him for these words. Lily told her mom how she met Dayin. Mom, with concern on her face, tells her that it looks like big trouble almost happened to her. Young Shin puts a toy chicken on the table and tells the blonde woman that it is a gift. Lily looks at the toy with admiration on her face. The blonde thanks the boy and then tells him that she heard that he is Lily's friend. The boy replies that this is true and then introduces himself by his name. Lily, with a joyful expression on her face, thought that her brother could do anything and then added that she also had a similar toy. The main character asks if the baby fell asleep. Lily lies in bed with her eyes closed. The blonde answers the main character that yes, she sleeps like the dead. The protagonist closes the door to the bedroom and tells the blonde that in this case, they need to go out for a while. He adds that he has something to say. He says that perhaps today was an unforgettable day for the baby because she ate too much of her favorite meat and chatted with her mother about everything. The protagonist closes his eyes and says that this will remain a good memory for her. The blonde smiles and says that it was a happy day for her too. She wants to say what will happen in the future thanks to the protagonist. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, tells the woman not to make him laugh. He brings his gaze closer to the blonde's face and tells her that she is a fake. The blonde is perplexed by the protagonist's words. The girl moves away from the protagonist and asks him why he suddenly behaves this way. The main character tells her that she plays well because he even almost believed it, but there were several suspicious nuances. The protagonist takes out his sword and tells the woman that a lot of time has passed since the little girl escaped from the organization. He adds that it means that the attackers must have wandered here and there in search of the loss and first of all they would have found her parents. But she who called herself her mother looked as if she didn't know anything. The blonde with anxiety on her face presses her hands to her chest. The main character tells her that there is not a single hint that she was threatened. He asks the woman where she hid her real mother. The blonde is silent with her mouth slightly open. She smiles maliciously and asks him if he can give him a hint, and then asks where he thinks she got that face from. She throws a punch at the main character, but misses. Dayin runs away from the dark purple energy. He quickly turns his head. He notices how the girl ran up to him from the side and is preparing to attack him with knives in her hand. The main character swings his weapon at the blonde and says that he is also seasoned in such battles, so he sees her every step. He pierces the blonde with his sword, and she laughs. She drops her knives. With a smile on her face, she tells the main character not to let his guard down, and then adds that they will take the child of fire again. The protagonist takes out a sword from it and says that he has already checked the entire village. 
He adds that there is no one here who can compete with him. A bright red glow appears behind him. Black and red energy emanates from several magic circles. The main character thought that it was a multi-layered magic circle. The protagonist runs towards the circle while streams of black and red energy rush past him. He thought that he didn't know much about magic circles, but he could recognize a few of the most famous ones. He adds that this is clearly a barrier that seals mana, a spell to summon demons, and also a spell to transfer an object. A bright glow from the magic circle is directed into the wooden house. The main character thought that it was heading towards the baby's house. He hears a scream from the window and wonders if a demon has appeared inside the house. The main character sees a screaming flying demon and a crawling demon on the roofs. He thought that these were demons who were summoned to sacrifice the villagers. He adds that he could not notice this spell because such magic is activated at a certain time. Many demons appeared on the streets of the settlement. Dayin cuts the wing of one of the demons and says that they only choose methods that spoil the mood. The protagonist's hand is covered with armor. He cuts down one demon after another and tells them that he doesn't have time to fight, so they should get lost. He sees one of the children attacking the demon and asks them if they are okay. Zeke, in the guise of a werewolf, addresses the protagonist. Young Shin, who is in the robot, tells the protagonist that something is wrong with Lily. A column of light is directed at Lily, causing her to float in the air. Young Shin shouts that no matter how much they wake her up, she does not wake up, and even if she is moved, the pillar of light follows her. The protagonist approaches her and tells her that a seal has been placed on her. Lily has a round red mark on her forehead. The protagonist thought that he knew something like this would happen. He adds that this is a sign indicating who is the object of the transfer spell. He touched Lily's shoulder and told her to wake up. The girl opens her eyes and tells the protagonist that she is cold. The main character sees black smoke coming from it and thought that pandemonium should clearly be the destination. He adds that activation time varies depending on size and distance, but he thinks they still have about five minutes to spare. The protagonist turns his head back and tells young Shin to follow him as they will go to where they left their luggage. He adds that the other two should also follow him. He imagines a purple stone, a key, a scroll, a mirror, and a pocket watch, and then he thinks that in five minutes he needs to get out of the village and find a way to dispel the spell. He sees a fireball rushing towards him and hears the red goblin asking the protagonist if he really thinks that they will silently watch them run away. The protagonist with Lily in his hands dodges the fire and sees the enemy standing on the roof. The red goblin points his finger at the protagonist and shouts to the main character that this place will become his grave. Dayin thought that he had really escaped, taking advantage of the turmoil. The protagonist with a malicious smile asks for a second and then says that he has found a way. The red goblin points his hand towards the protagonist, after which he commands the demon to kill that fool. Demons jump from the roof towards the protagonist. The main character makes a dash, leaving Lily behind and tells the children to try to hold on a little. Orange energy emanates from the magic circle. The protagonist raises his arms with his sword and armor up and is enveloped in blue energy. He thought that although he was within the range of the barrier that sealed mana, he did not have time so he would have to act to the limit of his strength. An image of a sword appears against a background of blue energy. The protagonist used the first technique of the heaven-destroying divine sword, heavenly demonic cut. A wave of blue energy is sent towards the demons. The red goblin jumps from roof to roof and shouts that he is using block, after which a red magic circle appears in the sky. Blood pours from the protagonist's mouth, and a bright blue glow is visible in his hand. A huge amount of blue energy is sent towards the surprised red goblin. The enemy slides off the roof, and the main character quickly gets to him. The protagonist grabs the red goblin by the clothes and jumps high. He throws the enemy with all his strength onto a hard surface. The protagonist turns his head back. He shouts to everyone to duck down. Mordria and the children became wary. The main character points his hand forward, and blue energy appears in it. A stream of blue energy struck several demons around at once. Dayin starts running and exclaims that he needs to hold on a little longer and then adds that he will finish quickly. He takes out his equipment from the carriage and thinks that even if he himself cannot use magic, he has the opportunity to use the artifacts he has obtained over all this time. He adds that he will first use the double mask he grabbed from the Thieves' Guild. He took the mask and came to the unconscious Lily and the Red Goblin. He thought that even though this mask is disposable, it is still capable of copying the desired appearance for about five minutes. The main character thought that it was enough to simply put it on the baby first, and then on the scoundrel. 
The Red Goblin has reincarnated as Lily. The mirror held by the protagonist reflects the face of the reincarnated Red Goblin. Dayin thought that using the spell thief mirror given by Count Golkin, which is mainly used to capture crime scenes where magic was used. He adds that in combination with a writing pen taken from a gambling house, he will be able to copy the mark. The Red Goblin has a mark on its forehead. The protagonist holds a leaf from a tree in his hand and says that for this you need to find the right moment. He placed the leaf of the sacred tree on Lily's forehead. He thought that in this way, he would remove all magical effects from the body of the chain. The glow around Lily disappears. The protagonist thought the connection was broken. The black-red energy returns back to the magic circle. Dayin thought that if he dispelled the magic without taking any additional measures, the connection would be restored again. The glow is directed at the red goblin disguised as Lily. The main character says that, fortunately, he has a very useful bait in his hands. The red goblin, his mouth taped shut, opens his eyes. His hands are tied with a chain, and on them lies a bag with a timer inside. The main character holds an explosive with a timer in his hand and asks the red goblin if he has come to his senses, and then adds that he needs to add a few more touches. Lily behind him made a worried expression on her face. Dayin puts the dynamite in the bag and says that everything is ready, and then tells the Red Goblin to remember to share the gift with his friends. The protagonist holds a mirror in his hand on which the magic circle is reflected and in a stern voice tells the villain that if he survives, they will see each other again, because next time he will visit him himself. The Red Goblin opens his eyes wide out of fear. A magic circle appears on the ground in the middle of which a bright glow appears. Someone shouts that the Child of Fire is finally here. A man in a green goblin mask spreads his arms to the sides and tells the girl to humbly bow her head, because otherwise she will be the only one with problems. The Red Goblin tries to say something but cannot because his mouth is covered with tape. Green Goblin says that they haven't seen each other for a long time, so she must have a lot to say. He asks the girl to let him hear her voice after such a long time, after which he removes the tape from her face. The Red Goblin shouts that it's a trap. He closes his eyes and shouts to everyone to run, because this is an enemy trap. He shouts that he is the Red Goblin. The Green Goblin laughs and shouts that it was a good lie. He sees a bright glow in front of him and shouts to the girl that although she must have diligently invented it. A powerful explosion occurs due to the activation of explosives. Ash floats in the air. The explosion that day killed hundreds of elite soldiers and five pandemonium leaders lost many experimental materials and research results, and delayed plans. Many wooden buildings are on fire. The main one looks towards the flame and Lily, and then thought that moreover, it was about a village where demons were summoned, so if nothing is done, the undead will appear here. He adds that it is impossible to describe what was going on in the soul of the little girl who was forced to burn her native village. Lily asks the main character if her mother was fake. The main character, with a serious expression on his face, asks the girl if she knew. The shadow of the hair covers Lily's face. She tells the protagonist that she guessed, and her mother must be dead. The main character, near whom the ashes are flying, tells her that until the corpse is found, it is impossible to answer this question. He says who knows, maybe she is wandering around the continent in search of her daughter. Lily turns to the main character, with a joyful expression on her face. She invites the protagonist to go looking for her again later and visit another country next time. She adds that it is quite possible that she even moved into another dimension, just as she herself did. The main character agrees with the girl, and then tells her that first they must return to their friends. Children talk to each other in the carriage. The protagonist thought that the purpose of arriving on the Guy Continent had been achieved, and now he needed to immediately return back. But first there was one last thing that should be done. He says that he has dealt with his affairs, and all that remains is to return back. Mordria stares at the main character and he asks her how long she intends to just watch. The main character approaches the girl, calls her Mordria, and then corrects himself and calls her Abraxas. The girl's hair and eyes become light. She says with a smile on her face that she thought she played the role of the doll perfectly. She asks the main character when he noticed the catch. The protagonist got excited and answers that his intuition told him. He thought that he couldn't say that he had filmed how she looked at the carriage. The blonde approaches the main character and tells him not to evade the answer and tell him everything in more detail. She adds that it has been a long time since she met such an interesting person as him. With an admiring expression on her face, she asks the main character if he came from another world and if this carriage is from there. He then asks the protagonist if he knows how it works, how he got this demonic sword and why he wanted to see her. 
The protagonist with a worried look thought that since Abraxas has extensive knowledge, she is always in search of the unknown. He adds that she is clearly very curious. The protagonist puts his hand forward and tells the girl that he wants to buy her wisdom. Abraxas asks him if he really wants to buy and not borrow. She then asks if that means she can charge whatever price she wants. She points her finger at the protagonist and tells him to keep in mind that she is not interested in money or jewelry. She adds that if he can't pay the price with his powers, then he will have to do something. A yellow magic circle appears in front of her eye. She tells the main character that he will have to bear responsibility for this. The protagonist's face is covered in shadow. Above her appears a golden image of a face with a large nose. She tells the main character that if he cannot adequately repay her for his request, she will still take what is owed to her. The protagonist, in whose face there are streams of golden energy, answers the girl that he will not disappoint her. Abraxas crosses her arms and tells the protagonist that she likes his confidence, so she will look forward to it. Lily approaches them and asks if they will finish soon. The blonde looked at the girl. Lily opens her eyes wide in surprise. She calls out to the protagonist with a frightened expression on her face and then tells him that this is not Mordria. She adds that this woman is very scary. She hides behind the protagonist with a worried expression on her face and then exclaims that it is someone else. Abraxas, with a small smile on her face, thought that this was a completely natural reaction. She snaps her fingers, causing small streams of green energy to emanate from them. She tells the protagonist and the girl that they were so tense in vain because it was she, Mordria, who traveled with them. She adds that if this is the case, then she invites everyone to her place. Near the seashore, there is a palace with high spears. Young Shin asks how they ended up here with concern on his face. Surprised, Lily asks if this is the sea. Abraxas says that he lives here and the last time he had guessed was 500 years ago. The main character turns his head to the side and thought that they say that many travelers between dimensions met Abraxas before returning, but no one said that they visited her, which means they were the first. The main character sees a golden liquid flowing through the fountain and asks if it is a magic elixir. He sees a tree with golden apples and asks if they are really golden. He spots a unicorn and exclaims about it. He sees plants walking on two legs and asks if they are mandrakes, then calls them strange. Abraxas tells the protagonist that if he likes something, he can take it for himself. The protagonist, with a satisfied expression on his face, asks her if she is serious and then exclaims that the first word is more valuable than the second. The girl closes her eyes and smiles, and then replies that she is serious because no one has visited her for a long time. She snaps her fingers and asks if they can eat first. Members of the protagonist group suddenly find themselves at a long table with many dishes. Lily eats and exclaims that it is her first time trying such a delicious thing. Young Shin looks at the happy girl. Abraxas tells guests not to be shy about asking for more. She asks the protagonist to tell him about the world they came from. The protagonist eats with a fork and replies that they don't have time for everything, but it's worth starting with the most ancient civilizations. Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt, ancient India, and ancient China. All that was left on the plate from the dish was the remnants of the sauce. Abraxas asks the main character what he wants to know. There is wine in a bucket on the table, and next to it are two glasses and a plate of food. The sorceress pours wine into a glass and asks the main character if he wants to know whether he wants to become immortal, become the best sword master, or how he can destroy the world. The main character puts his watch on the table and tells the girl that he wants to know all this. He adds that he wants to know how to use this thing. The clock sparkles because of the light. The main character says that all he knows is that this watch consumes a huge amount of magic. He adds that the clock hands move each time a certain amount of magic is consumed and each hand moves according to how much energy is absorbed. The protagonist, with a serious look, thought about what would happen if all five arrows were moved at once. Abraxas uses green energy to bring the watch closer to him and make it float. She says that this thing is interesting, and she immediately noticed it. She adds that she will now see what is there. Green energy is directed to the clock. The girl says that there is a protective barrier on them, so she will need time to figure everything out. The main character asks the girl how long it will take. She replies that she doesn't know. The protagonist, whose bangs cover one eye, asks her what will happen if she doesn't succeed. Abraxas replies that this is impossible and she just needs time. The protagonist replies that there is always such a possibility. The sorceress gazes at the protagonist with a clock hovering above her palm and then tells him that it's okay. It will be as he wants. She adds that if she fails to figure out his watch, she will fulfill any of his wishes. 
The protagonist agrees with a small smile on his face and then asks Abraxas what she wants in return. The girl closes her eyes and puts her hand forward and then asks the protagonist to surprise her. She adds that he has time before she finishes with the clock and she doesn't limit him. Many streams of energy swirl. They head towards her hand, after which Abraxas, with a creepy look, tells the protagonist that if he fails to surprise her, he will take her soul. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, agrees with the girl. Abraxas, with a misunderstanding on her face, thought that he really wasn't afraid of anything. The protagonist gets up from his chair and tells the sorceress that in order not to delay all this, he will surprise her right now. Abraxas asks the main character if he can do it so quickly. The protagonist responds by asking for a couple of minutes. The sorceress with a stern look asks the protagonist if he really decided to surprise her with this. Abraxas sees a sound system with many speakers in front of it. She wonders if the main character really wants to attack her with weapons from his world. The protagonist presses the space bar on the laptop keyboard and says that they will begin now. He thought that before the time travel, he had heard that Abraxas liked to listen to stories about the Earth from the Awakened, but people became greedy and began to ask her for too much, and her patience ran out. He imagines a golden dragon standing opposite a long-haired girl. The protagonist thought that Abraxas' condition remained the same every time. Imaginary images are obscured by brown paint, and the protagonist thought that, however, many awakened ones could not fulfill it. True, there were those who managed to surprise her. He thought that some awakened Englishman had come up with something. Abraxas, with a surprised look, asks the protagonist if this is music from the earth. When a melody is played, streams of staves swirl. The girl calls this melody wonderful. She adds that she has never heard such instruments before, in this song too. The main character, with a smile on his face, thought that he didn't even have to use either force or cunning. The next day, Abraxas puts her palm to her chest and asks the protagonist to take her with him. He gets worried and tells her that she knows he can't. The protagonist thought that if such a dangerous creature as a dragon passed through the gate, then the world would end, because he had already seen this in a past life. Red Dragon of the Apocalypse The main character imagines a red dragon sitting on a mountain, near which lightning strikes. He thought that this dragon had somehow entered the earth. The climate on the planet almost came to an end. It was possible to save the planet only when he was caught and killed. Dayin imagines Abraxas in a burning city, looking out of a portal and waving his hand as a farewell, and then telling people that there is nothing interesting on this land of theirs. The protagonist closes his eyes with an anxious expression on his face and thought that Abraxas is even stronger than the red dragon, so she definitely won't cause trouble. The blonde with a smile on her face tells the main character that it will be dangerous if her dragon body crosses the gate, but as long as the power is sealed and it is in human form, then there should be no problems. The main character wants to object to her, but she says in a stern voice that her dragon power is securely sealed. Hi, with dissatisfaction on his face, tells the girl that later she can remove this seal herself. Abraxas, with reddened cheeks, asks the protagonist what he is saying, and then adds that in this body, she poses no threat at all. She provided the protagonist with golden apples, a chest of gold, scrolls, gems, and a necklace. Saliva flows from the protagonist's mouth. With admiration on his face, he tells the girl that every time before doing anything, she must ask him. The blonde raises her fists in the air and, with a happy expression on her face, tells the protagonist that she will do so, and then exclaims that she will finally fall to the ground. From the speaker on the pole, someone can be heard saying that a new gate has opened, so all citizens of the Mapo 4, 5, and 6 area need to evacuate to the nearest shelters. White and black monsters with sharp spikes instead of hands are walking along the road. This is a humanoid monster, a ghost with a blade. Dae Hong, with a fur shoulder pad, shouts Gu Ho's name. The tank's body is enveloped in golden energy. He gets into a fighting stance. Someone shouts that this is a golden giant. The brown-haired girl raises her hand into a fist and looking at Gu Ho exclaims that he will save them all now. With dissatisfaction on his face, he thought that he was still unusual in hearing this nickname. He struck the monster. He grabbed one of the monsters by the face. They shouted him to knock them down. Guho takes his left leg back and throws a lot of punches at the monsters. The beaten monster falls on its back and opens its mouth. Someone from the guild says that the area is clear and they need to regroup. Another guild member asks if any more monsters have been found nearby. Another guild member exclaims that he thinks it was the last one. Someone calls for help and Guho immediately sharpens his gaze. The tank begins to run quickly 
and the brown-haired man shouts and asks him where he ran and calls him a fool. The white building collapses. Someone says that the building collapsed. Another person exclaims that a golden giant has entered there. Gu Ho is standing on the road. He is holding a brown-haired girl in his arms. One of the observers shouts that this is a golden giant, their savior. The brown-haired girl gets to her feet and thanks the tank. He replies that it's nothing and then gives her a potion and tells her to heal the wound on her leg. Dae Hong made an angry expression on his face. He hit Gu Ho in the face. He screams and asks him if he's not a tank and then asks what would happen if a team member got hurt because of him. Gu Ho stands quietly and apologizes, then reports that he heard someone calling for help. Dae Hong points his finger at him and shouts asking him if he really thinks he's a hero, since people talk about him like that, and then tells him that let him imagine himself as anyone, but he can't expose the whole team. Gu Ho apologizes with a dissatisfied expression, and then says that he will be more careful in the future. He thought that everything was fine, he just needed to be patient a little. A girl with gray hair stands next to Gu Ho with a magazine in her hand and tells him that he is just something and they even wrote about him in the magazine, for which she congratulates him. He thanks her with an anxious smile on his face and then apologizes and says that he is in a hurry. He stands in the elevator and looks down and sighs and then says that it's difficult. He looks at the magazine where his photograph is printed as part of an article with the top five tanks. He exclaims that he cannot believe that he entered the top five tanks of Seoul and then thought that before he really wanted to become famous, but now life has become more difficult due to the close attention of the people. With a thoughtful look, he thought that he was always offered to join different guilds, although he refused them every time. Gu Ho remembers how a blonde man and woman talked to him. He thought that he was offered a higher rate and did not understand why they would not leave him alone. He adds that they even said that the leader of the seventh team must have already died, but this is definitely not the case. Guild White House, seventh team office. Yoon Hvai, with a pity on his face, tells Gu Ho that he knows everything, because she was already told that the leader of Dae Hong hit him. Gu Ho with a smile on his face tells the girl that he made a mistake. Yoon Hvai sighs and asks him why he didn't stand up for himself then, and then tells him that he's too kind to people. Gu Ho says that he still can't understand why manager Dae Hong hates him so much, and then says that other managers are kind to him. Yoon Hvai tells him that it is because he is jealous. A joyful Gu Ho stands in the spotlight while Dae Hong stands in the shadows behind him. Yoon Vi tells him that they are both tanks, but Gu Ho has been much more successful. She tells the guy that now everyone is talking about him, even if he's younger than him. Gu Ho approaches the girl and replies that she can't believe that she has achieved so much, but everything came to life only thanks to the help of her leader. Yoon Vi, with an upset expression on his face, asks where he is and whether he really doesn't show up because he got involved in another adventure. She adds that when he returns, he will get the fullest from her. She touches Gu Ho's muscular arm and tells him to cheer up because he's doing just fine without it. The guy thanks the girl in return. He remembers how the protagonist told him to listen carefully because he is responsible for the seventh team in his absence. He adds that if he gives up, then everyone else will give up. Gu Ho stands quietly and wonders if he's doing a good job. He approaches a lot of people who have gathered around something and thought that today's battle should be sorted out during training. One of the people asks if he is alive. Another person says that the seventh team is apparently having a really hard time. Gu Ho asks the people in front of him why they are all crowded together. The dark-skinned man in front of him stutters as he tries to answer. Min Jae is lying on the floor. Gu Ho's expression became angry. Dae Hong with a bloody sword in his hand stands next to the wounded Min Jae. He asks him if all he can do is be aggressive. Two of his subordinates stand next to him. Gu Ho is silent and dark particles fly near him. He put his foot forward. He took a loud step. He goes to Dae Hong, who turns to him as soon as he notices. The scoundrel with concern. On his face tells Gu Ho to listen to everything first, and then exclaims that this scoundrel started at first because he was the first to rush at him. Gu Ho sees Min Jae's severed hand and thought that even his potions won't help. He adds that they will probably get away with it. At most they will get away with compensation because Min Jae is an intern for them. He thought that it was all his fault and called himself a weakling. He approaches Dae Hong and his body is enveloped in golden energy. He tells him that he is lying and then adds that he will do the same to him so that he will feel the same pain. The scoundrel clenched his teeth and said that this fool was talking to him, the senior in rank. He shouts to Gu Ho that he is slow as a turtle and only knows how to threaten, after which he instantly moves. Dae Hong shouts that now he will teach a lesson. He walked behind the guy. 
Guho turns around sharply and swings his fist, which is already turned to stone. The enemy is pushed back straight into the grate and then hits it. Daehong gets to his feet and leans on the bars and wonders why this guy is so fast. Gu Ho, with a gloomy expression on his face, moves towards the enemy and extends his hand towards him. He grabbed Dae Hong's face and slammed him into the wall. He brings his hands together and swings. He hit him, after which he immediately falls to the ground. The black-haired man is surprised by what is happening. A man with burgundy hair says that the manager didn't even have time to do anything. Gu Ho shouts and asks them why they're standing there. He clenches his hand into a fist. He turns his head a little in their direction and tells them that they are all the same. An announcement comes from the speakers that all guild members need to immediately gather in the lobby. He adds that a new gate has opened. Two guys run away. The brown-haired guy exclaims that he will definitely report everything. Guho approaches Min Jae and addresses him. He took him in his arms and says that this will not happen again in the future, and yet he will do everything to take proper revenge on them. A purple portal appears in the middle of the road. The dispatcher reports that there has never been a gate with such a high rating before, and now they have been assigned an S-Class, but they can give it even higher, and then shouts to everyone to take combat readiness. Chan Sung, with a serious expression on his face, says that such a powerful gate opened in the very center of Seoul. Dae Woon asks if another dragon will come out with a smile on his face. Dae Jin says it's better not to even think about it. Gu Ho approaches Chan Sung and tells him that the seventh team of the White House Guild has arrived. The head of the guild turns to him and says that he has already been informed about everything. Guho says that in the future he will definitely try to take into account his mistakes, but now it will be better to focus on the upcoming battle. They Jean and they Woon are surprised after these words. Guho, with a confident expression on his face, thought that from now on he would no longer seem weak. Chan Sung shouts that the gate's rating is increasing and he needs to prepare for an attack. A carriage appears from the portal with many carts behind it. Chan Sung wonders if a carriage just left there. The last cart left the portal. They wouldn't ask if the gate was open just for this. Chan Sung orders not to let down his guard because they don't yet know who is in these carriages. The main character gets out of the carriage and asks if everyone has really gathered here to meet them. Chan Sung with a smile on his face asks if this is his manager. Gu Ho, standing behind him, is surprised. He cries and turns to the manager. San Wook asks the protagonist group, if they have been missing on the guy continent all this time. At the table in front of him sit Abraxas, the protagonist, Lily, and Young Shin. The protagonist thought that he had not been in the interrogation room for a long time. He sighs and replies that he came out of the gate right in front of everyone. San Wook with a serious expression on his face replies that this is true, but there is one thing. Dayin says that everything was going like clockwork and he was enjoying his vacation, when suddenly a gate opened right under the carriages and they were sucked in. He imagines a purple portal appearing under the carriage. Then he says that they could not immediately return back. They traveled around that world, earning their living as mercenaries. He reports that they ended up in the elven forest where there were terrible people. San Wook became wary and thought that some of what was being told roughly coincided with what Aximus was telling, but such an unusual story is, in principle, hard to believe. The main character says that then he accidentally met the great sage Aximus, and he showed them the way back. San Wook is shocked and then asks the protagonist what he just said and if he saw him. A look of confusion can be seen on Abraxas's face. The main character replies that yes, he kind of guessed that he was from the Earth. And he also said that in a couple of months the gates between the Earth and the Guy Continent will connect. He imagines a wooden staff and tells San Wook that Abraxas gave him the wooden staff and will show it to him a little later. A man in glasses with admiration on his face replies that they just took and presented an object with such strong magical energy. The protagonist puts his hand forward and with a smile on his face, says that he said that in appearance the staff is no different from their own. He adds that in his opinion, this is an ordinary piece of wood and he will gladly give it away if they need it. San Wook thanks the protagonist and then tells him that they will exhibit it in the National Museum. He opens the door and says that he thinks it's better to tell his story to the president right away and then asks the protagonist to wait a little. Abraxas crosses her arms and asks the protagonist who the great sage Aximus is, and then adds that she has never heard of such a thing. The protagonist replies that he will tell her later, and then asks her if she has already learned their language. Abraxas answers that if you analyze the structure of the language, then you can communicate in it without any problems. She adds that she needs to go to the concert of that group and listen to their songs live. The protagonist replies that he heard that the group broke up, and then someone opens the door. 
The food delivery man puts pizza, chicken, burgers, and potatoes on their table, and then says that's all they ordered, and then wishes them bon appetit. Lily admires because of the amount of food. She eats chicken and exclaims that she is very hungry. Young Shin eats a piece of pizza. Abraxas covers his mouth and then says that both the texture and the flavor all come together beautifully. Lily asks her if she liked it and then adds that it will taste better if she also drinks it with cola. The main character points his finger at her and asks her if she really only eats chicken legs and then who will eat the rest. The girl turns away from the protagonist with a dissatisfied expression on her face. Young Shin, with a happy expression on his face, offers Lily to take his chicken leg. Three days later, the sun's rays illuminate houses with wooden roofs. The main character says that they will be in touch. San Wook extends his hand to the protagonist's hand and tells him that they will definitely contact him. They shake hands. The protagonist says that he will look forward to their next meeting. Dayin thought that these three days he told everything about the guy's Suho continent and eventually decided that when Korea and Guy unite in a couple of months, he will become a guide. The main character, with a malicious smile on his face, imagines a map of the continent Guy and a lot of paper money. He thought that while everyone was busy studying Guy, he would return back to Earth and work on other gates that would open either in the USA or in Europe. The protagonist driver opens the car door and tells the main character that they haven't seen each other for a long time. The protagonist approaches him and asks how he was doing. Lily runs up and raises her hand in greeting. The driver laughs a little and replies that everything is fine, and the young lady has not been seen for a long time either. He tells the main character that he will take him and all his guests to the guild. They are approached by young Shin and Abraxas, who has been given tourist status from the Guy Continent. A black car is driving down the road. Abraxas asks if everything inside is almost the same as that of the carriage. He adds that only this thing is more complicated. Abraxas licked her lips with an admiring expression on her face and asked why the door did not open. Lily, with concern on her face, asks the sorceress not to touch it and finally buckle up. The driver tells Abraxas to judge for itself, because opening the car doors while driving is dangerous. The protagonist, sitting to the right of the driver, asks him what happened to Yun Vi, and then reports that he thought that neither of them would meet him. The driver replies that it looks like things have accumulated at the guild. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, wondered if she was really so busy that she couldn't even find time to meet him. He adds that he was ready to hear her words that he had been gone for too long. Many high-rise buildings tower over the city streets. The protagonist thought about what he had heard, that thanks to the White House potions, people are quickly recovering from a disaster. He adds that all the destroyed buildings were restored within a few months. In his opinion, at this rate, they will become an awakened civilization much earlier. Guild Headquarters WHI Tea House A black car drove up to the building. Young Shin's mom calls out to her son as he gets out of the car. The brown-haired woman runs to her son. She hugs her son and says that she is so glad that everything is fine with him. The main character tells the woman that they had some business to attend to, so they had to stay late. He apologizes to her for making her worry. Young Shin's mother turns her head to the protagonist and says that she is incredibly grateful to him for returning her son safe and sound. The protagonist, with a serene expression on his face, tells everyone that they can go to their rooms and finally relax, and then asks Lily to explain to Abraxas how everything works here. The girl agrees and runs to the sorceress. Yun Hvai addresses the protagonist, after which he immediately turns his head towards the voice. Dayin comes up to her and says that he heard that she has a lot of work right now. She leans on her knees and breathes heavily, then calls out Gu Ho's name. The protagonist asks what happened to him. Yoon Hvai has a worried expression on his face. She says that Gu Ho attacked the sixth team, causing the leader Dae Hong to fall into a coma. Gu Ho stands in front of the defeated members of the sixth team. Yoon Hvai says that the rest of the team is in intensive care. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, asks her if Gu Ho really got rid of the entire sixth team. Yun Vi replies that this is true. The protagonist says that it is unthinkable that Gu Ho would attack people, so there must be a good reason for it. Yun Vi stands in high-heeled shoes and says that in the past he and the six team had conflicts more than once. She tells everything to the protagonist. A shadow covers the protagonist's face and he remains silent for some time after the story. Gu Ho, dressed in gray clothes, sits in a prison cell. Yun Vi says that Gu Ho is now in custody in the guild prison and the disciplinary statement will be issued after the tribunal. The main character leaves the girl and says that everything is fine. Univai put her hands on her belt 
and asks the main character if he is serious now. The protagonist replies that yes, no one will make noise under your ear. Yun Vi says that because of this, not only could he be expelled from the guild, he could lose his awakened status. She remembers standing behind Gu Ho with a magazine in her hand. She asks the main character if he even knows how desperately Gu Ho fought all this time. She adds that he did everything so that no one would dare to say that a team of one person is not a team at all. Dayin replies that he knows and knew it as soon as he saw him. Gu Ho jumps towards the protagonist with tear-stained eyes. The main character hits him in the face with his palm and tells him to put aside his calf affections. A mark was left on the protagonist's hand, and he thought that his strength was growing faster than he expected. Gu Ho, with a joyful expression on his face, tells the protagonist that he knew that he would definitely return safe and sound. The main character with a smile on his face asks him not to worry, because he will figure everything out. He adds that they will go to the tribunal together. Dae Woon reveals that nine members of the White House Guild denounced Gu Ho. Yoon Hwai enters the room. She tells the protagonist to come and sit next to the guild leader. The protagonist thought that it seemed like it had already begun. Dae Woon says the association conducted an investigation into the case within two days. He speaks into the microphone that as a result of this investigation, Mr. Gu Ho has been found guilty, and today a preventive measure will be chosen for him. Dae Woon, Iron Wall Guild. The head of the Black Dog Guild smiles smugly. They Jean, Black Dog Guild. Representatives of many guilds gathered here, from medium guilds to the largest. The main character smiles and thought that all the big shots were assembled and they were definitely not here for the sake of the attack case. He adds that this is a wonderful occasion, that's all. Chan Sung crosses his arms and asks the protagonist if he has finally shown up. The main character replies that they have not seen each other for a long time and then adds that he heard that he was appointed president of the Association of the Awakened. Chan Sung closes his eyes and with concern on his face, says that he really didn't want this position. He thought that there was no real power in this place. Only problems. Many orange portals appear in the sky. Birds fly around the city. Night of the Seven Moons. Even in that life, after that disaster, people realized that they needed to unite. They decided to finally begin to properly manage the Association of the Awakened, Previously, they created only the appearance of work there. The head of the guild was seen in the place of the president for two reasons. Firstly, he is the first awakened one, and secondly, it is the White House guild that supplies the potions. There are many people sitting on the pulpit chairs. The brown-haired man raises his hand and asks for a minute, and then asks if a stranger can be in the meeting. They Jean closes his eyes and says he thinks he can do it. He opens his eyes and with a smile on his face says that the defendant is on the seventh team for which the newcomer is responsible, so let him listen. He adds that one can say that he is also involved in this. The main character sits down at one of the seats and with a smile on his face says that he thanks those present. They Woon says that then they will continue and remember the circumstances of the case again. Standing at the podium, he says that three days ago, the awakened Gu Ho attacked his guild mate Dae Hong, as a result of which the latter ended up in a coma. He adds that nine other team members were seriously harmed. Univai puts his hand forward and says that they did not mention why the defendant committed this act. Someone shouts back at her. Is there any reason that justifies such a brutal attack? The bandaged man shouts that nothing justifies cruelty. Vice leader of the sixth team of the White House Guild, Hyun Sik. The main character crosses his arms and says that he would have been healed long ago by drinking the potion, and then asks if they have really run out of potions in the guild. He asks him if he didn't get treatment on purpose to show how badly he beat him. Hyuk Sik asks the protagonist what he just said with a worried look on his face. A woman in a red shirt is looking at him. He pressed his palm to his chest and shouted that they were attacked by a fellow guild member whom they trusted, and he is still hurt from this, both physically and mentally. The woman in the red coat says that her son fell into a coma and he may never wake up again. She tells the head of the guild, Chan Sung, that he, the father, should understand her feelings. The head, with concern on his face, replies that he is really very sorry that this happened to the head of Dae Hong. The woman replies that this is not the first time she has heard this, and then asks how he will answer for the fate of her son. Again and again, they repeated their accusations. Then the members of the sixth team and Dae Hong's mother began to criticize the guild, for index fingers pointing at the White House guild symbol. Most of the crowd watched the show. They Jean, with an angry expression on his face, points his finger at Chan Sung and shouts at him that he cannot serve as the president of the association in this matter. He adds that one must remember that he is a role model for the entire guild. 
Daewon puts his hand forward and says that the offense committed by Gu Ho is obvious and should be judged by the association of awakened ones. A nervous Chan Sung closes his eyes and replies that it's okay. He'll take that into account. The protagonist's eyes were wary because he realized what was going on. He imagines the symbol of a shield with a lion on it, falls into a trap, and then thinks that their real target is the White House. He imagines they Jean, who raised his hands at shoulder level and thought that previously the Black Furnace Guild was the largest. He remembers how they Jean took off Lily's mask and thought that the Iron Wall was considered the strongest. He remembers Chan Sung during training when he was bare-chested. He thought that after the disaster, the White House had greatly overtaken the other guilds. It wasn't just about money, power, and fame. They have knowledge of a higher level. Dayin imagines the images of Aegean and they wound and thought that at this rate the gap between the guilds will only grow and it can no longer be ignored. He imagines Chan Sung and Gu Ho standing near the purple portal. He thought that he needed to keep the White House in line and then asks if Gu Ho was causing trouble again and then adds that this is great. Daejin sits at a table with documents and asks the three men in front of him if they would like to sign a contract with them for double the rate, but in return they must inform on Gu Ho Association. They wound with a serene expression on his face, says that the law also applies to the awakened ones, and they must follow the letter of the law even more carefully and be an example for citizens, so they cannot turn a blind eye to attacks, especially from their own guildmates. The protagonist thought that other guilds most likely also want to keep the White House in check. They wound reports that Gu Ho should be stripped of his awakened status. The protagonist's face is covered in shadow. Someone from the audience asks if the White House Guild should take responsibility, since a strong awakened one is in a coma. They wound raises his palm and asks everyone to calm down, and then offers to take away the defendant's awakened status for a year. He asks why immediately expel him from the guild. They Jean closes his eyes and lowers his head a little and then says what he thinks is an appropriate preventive measure. He opens his eyes, and with a small smile on his face, he thought that Gu Ho was originally a member of the Black Dog Guild. They Woon smiles and thought that since the Awakened One is a tank, he will want to join a guild where there are mostly people like him. He adds that in a year, Gu Ho, who will have nowhere to go, will find himself at the threshold of his guild. Next to the protagonist, there is a stand with a microphone. He thought that this was a cute conspiracy that could not be compared with what they would do in the future. He adds that they just ran into the wrong people. The protagonist with a smile on his face says that he has something to say as the leader of the seventh team, of which Gu Ho is a member. He thought that he would make them regret today's decision for the rest of their days. An angry Hyun Sik asks the protagonist what he is offering and does he really want to absolve himself of responsibility. They Jean smile smugly and thought that this must be their last push. He invites the others to at least listen to the protagonist. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, says that provided they withdraw the complaint, they will pay them $5 billion as compensation. The brown-haired and gray-haired guys from the sixth team look at each other. They both thought that the protagonist was offering a lot, but considering how much they were offered in Black Dog, they would earn the same amount there in a couple of years. Dane asks how about $10 billion with a malicious smile. Hyun Sik thought that this should be enough. Streams of dark energy emanate from Daejin. Hyuk Sik noticed him and thought that Daejin was also sitting in the hall. Daejin names the amount as 20 billion, after which Daewoon is surprised and wonders why he keeps increasing the number. Hyuk Sik, with a surprised expression on his face, thought that for the sake of 20 billion, an ordinary awakened person needs to work 10 years to earn that much. He adds that the protagonist really has that much money. The main character says that this is his last offer, and then puts his hand forward and says that he will give $30 billion to everyone. He adds that he will also pay the penalty for leaving the guild. Univai became worried after the protagonist's words. Chan Sung opened his eyes wide. People around the podium are discussing what is happening. One of them asks if he will also pay the penalty. Another person asks if the total is about $50 billion. The brown-haired guy raises his hand and says he's withdrawing the complaint. Hyun Sik raises his right hand and exclaims that he too is withdrawing the complaint. The guy in the brown shirt behind him says that he too is withdrawing the complaint against Gu Ho. The protagonist says that then everything is decided. Dae Jean slams his palm on the table and shouts, asking the members of the sixth team what they allow themselves. With an angry expression on his face, he shouts and asks if money really decides everything. He reports that the leader of Dae Hong is now in a coma and then asks the protagonist if they really think they can pay him off, considering that they ruined a man's life. He thought that the drama lover had finally woken up. Daewoon is alarmed 
and tells they Jean that he is right. The main victim is now unconscious. He adds that it doesn't matter how much they offer until the leader wakes up. The main character replies that then they will make sure that the head of Day Hong wakes up and then they will talk to him. He points his palm towards the victim's mother and tells her that if she withdraws the complaint, he will make sure that their son is put back on his feet. A woman in a red coat with an upset expression on her face says that money is not important and the main thing is that her child is healthy again. She wants to say something about how low it is to regulate things with money, but the protagonist interrupts her and calls the amount $100 billion. The woman asks the protagonist to repeat his words with concern on her face. The main character says that this is the maximum amount he can pay her. He adds that when her son wakes up, let her talk to him. A woman with a joyful expression on her face puts her hands together and says that she is not worried, and then adds that she will definitely talk to Dae Hong. All the remaining members of the six team exclaim that they too are withdrawing the complaint against Gu Ho. Angry, they Jean and they Woon leave the room. The protagonist thought that since the association no longer had any reason to discipline Gu Ho, the meeting had come to an end. Dae In and Yoon Vi are behind them. They Jean and they Woon gritted their teeth in anger and thought what nonsense this is because he will spend hundreds of billions of dollars on compensation. They add that he is definitely crazy because in this way he will be left with nothing. The main character smiles and thought that he hadn't even started yet. Yoon Havai stands next to the protagonist in the elevator and asks him if he will really pay them the promised compensation. Dane put his hand on his belt and tells the girl that if she wants the dog to obey, she needs to give her a treat. Yoon Havai, with a worried expression on his face, asks the main character if he remembers that she is in charge of his finances. She adds that no matter how well they sell potions, they don't have that amount yet. She closes her eyes and tells Day In that they must pay compensation within a few days, and then asks him where they will get so much money. The protagonist sighs and tells her that she doesn't have to worry about this. With a gloomy look, he says that it's up to them to offer, and then asks who is to blame if they suddenly refuse. The main character enters the room. He hears Abraxas say that the longer he watches this TV, the more he is amazed. She adds that it doesn't look like they're magic glass balls at all, and then asks if it shows other dimensions. Lily eats the chips and tells her that it's true, and then says that if she doesn't finish her chicken, then let her give it to her. The sorceress lies on the sofa and eats breaded chicken. Abraxas replies that she won't give up the chicken, and she's just saving it for later. Dane inhales with a displeased expression on his face. He turns off the TV, after which Abraxas asks him what he is doing. Angry Abraxas screamingly asks the main character why it was necessary to interfere with them right now, and then adds that he turned it off at the most interesting part. Lily forms a flame around herself and screams for the protagonist to play their Kororo for them, and then asks him to let them watch it in peace. The protagonist with an angry expression on his face shouts at them that they will look at their Kororo later, but now they have work to do. Abraxas took a bite of a chicken leg with a dissatisfied expression on her face and asked the protagonist what business they have and why on earth he gave up orders. The protagonist asks how her tongue turned. With a smile on his face, he tells the sorceress that she eats and sleeps in his house for free, so let her at least work for food. Desperate Abraxas stands on all fours in front of the protagonist's clock. Dayin thought that Abraxas, the wisest of dragons, could not solve the mystery of the clock. The blonde with a dissatisfied expression on her face asks the protagonist not to talk nonsense. She just hasn't fully figured out something yet. The main character looks at his watch and tells the girl that it's good that he made her promise him a wish if suddenly she doesn't succeed. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, thought that he didn't suggest that she really wouldn't succeed. He adds that now the only thing he wants is to understand how the clock works. Abraxas replies that he can't help it and then asks him to say his wish. She adds that she has already said that nothing is impossible for her. The protagonist replies that, to be honest, he doesn't even know what to ask for because he didn't think that she wouldn't be able to study the watch. A text cloud pokes Abraxas in the head. The protagonist asks the girl if she will go with them anyway. He adds that she should continue to try to study them. The protagonist remembers how in the world of Guy Abraxas, with a smile on his face, he asks the protagonist if he is joking now and then informs him that she was going with him anyway. The protagonist clenched his teeth and replied that of course he was not joking. The main character puts his hand forward with a malicious smile while a bright glow appears behind him. He tells her that she must also repay, separately, everything he gives her on earth. Abraxas, with a fake smile, wonders if he is trying to ruin her. 
Dehun reads the document in his hand with a shocked expression and asks in all seriousness if it is about a hundred million dollars. He thought that they told him about what happened, but he didn't think that when he woke up, he would feel good, plus they would pay that kind of money. The main character standing next to him apologizes and then says that it will not be possible to pay such a sum at once. He asks if it is possible to transfer them a billion every month. Dehun wants to answer that it's okay. His mother in a red coat exclaims that at first the main character said something completely different, and if he lied to them the first time, then he will lie to them the second time. She adds that since this is the case, he should pay them even more. Dehun squeezed the document and thought that mom was talking business. The protagonist takes out a blue-purple potion and says that he personally brought this miraculous potion from the continent of Guy. He adds that the tincture is priceless and can cure any disease. The protagonist, with a frustrated expression on his face, says that he barely managed to get two vials and he already used one to get their son back on his feet. Dae Hoon, with a smile on his face, tells the protagonist what difference it makes to him and then asks whether it was his subordinate's fault that he fell into a coma. His mother tells the protagonist that if he wants them to agree to his terms, he needs to pay them another 10 billion. The main character closes his eyes with a dissatisfied expression and agrees. In the end, they signed and certified an agreement worth $110 billion. The protagonist leaves and closes the door behind him. Dae Hong wishes the protagonist well and then tells him to try not to fall behind on his monthly payments. His mother tells the protagonist that she hopes they never see him again. Dae Hoon, with a smug smile on his face, moves his hand to the side and asks his mother if she saw the face of that fool when they signed the papers. Mom replies that of course she saw and then says that now he is their slave for the rest of his life. She adds that he will now have to pay them back with what he earned for the rest of his life. A portal appears in front of them, from which crackling energy emanates. Surprised, Dae Hong asks if this is a gate. A monster comes out of the portal, and Dae Hong tells the mother behind him to move away. He thought that his luck would have it. He had nothing with him. A fat orc and an orc with his hair tied in a ponytail came out of the portal. Dae Hong sighs with a smile on his face and asks if these are two unfinished orcs, and then exclaims that he can handle them with his bare hands. The orc hits him. Dae Hoon coughs up blood. His mother covers her face and exclaims her son's name. Lily, disguised as an orc, tells the disguised Abraxas that he seemed to say not to kill him. The blonde tells the girl that she shouldn't be afraid because she hit carefully. Then she invites Lily to go eat chicken. The villain's mother sits on the floor and touches her son and then screams for help. She calls the doctor and shouts that they have a wounded person here. Soon, news quickly spread that Dae Hong, who had barely recovered from his coma, was attacked by a monster and infected him with an incurable disease. The doctor tells the scoundrel that there are diseases that even their potions cannot cure. Blisters appeared on Dae Hong's hands. The doctor tells him that it is most likely a disease from another dimension and then asks him to give them a couple of samples. Dae Hong throws furniture at the doctor and yells at him to get away. With a bandaged face, he asks the doctor if they really perceive him as a laboratory rat, and then adds that he needs either a potion or a miracle potion. Dae Hong comes to Team Seven's office and asks for his help. He sat down on his knees and screamingly asks the protagonist to heal him again with that miracle potion. He adds that every day, he is becoming more and more crazy from pain. The main character covers his mouth with his hand and apologizes and then says that he only has one bottle left. Dae Hong shouts that he is sorry and will pay whatever he wants. The protagonist with a smile on his face asks if he really just said that he will pay whatever he wants. The scoundrel replies that yes, if he is cured. The protagonist demanded $150 billion. Dae Hong is shocked by this amount. The protagonist replies that this potion is the only one of its kind, so it is too cheap for him. He hands the scoundrel a document and asks him to pay him $200 billion. There is a document on the table where Dae Hong left his signature. The protagonist hands him a bottle of potion. Dae Hong tremblingly extends his hand and thanks the protagonist. He drinks the potion and thought that the protagonist had set the price too high, but a little more and he would go crazy with pain. The protagonist sighs and is indignant because he used up all the miracle potions that he could barely get. Dae Hong sees his blisters dissolving with a joyful expression on his face. He sees many templates of the same document on the protagonist's desktop. The main character, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, asks him why he got up and then asks him to come back and get down to business. Dae Hong agrees with him and thought that this cannot be. He leaves with his eyes wide open and wonders if he could have planned this all.
The main character smiles and thought that in this way they dealt with all the members of the sixth team. He adds that he promises that they will now live well in the White House Guild. Gu Ho bows deeply to the protagonist and apologizes to him. The main character crosses his arms and asks him what exactly he is apologizing for now. Gu Ho says with a downcast look that he should have led the team better. He adds that while the protagonist was away, he behaved like a snotty fool. Gu Ho says that when other teams looked down on them, he didn't pay attention and even when they were treated unfairly, he didn't make a scene. The main character puts his palm forward. Gu Ho says that if the other team asked them to abandon the task, he didn't dare say a word against it. Behind him stands Ayel Nong. Dayin crosses his arms and sighs, then says that it was quite obvious. Gu Ho clenches his hand into a fist and says that if he had reacted differently back then, nothing would have happened to Min Jae. The main character with a serene expression on his face says that he heard about Min Jae and then asks if it is true that they say that he was left without his right hand. Guho replies that it is true. Dayin crossed his arms and with a dissatisfied expression on his face, tells his subordinate that he should have released his anger slowly and not accumulated it until it all burst out. He asks Guho if he knows that if it weren't for him, he would have been thrown out of here. Tank thought that, to be honest, he couldn't even imagine that they would do such a thing. He sees how the protagonist smiles and thought that he always believed that he could cope with everything, but now he just proved that one can cope with an entire team. Guho puts his hands together and with a confident expression on his face says that he has completely lost his head and then apologizes. After this, he tells the protagonist that he heard that he had to pay huge compensation. He adds that he will even pay the protagonist everything, even if it takes him his whole life. The main character thought that he would earn twice as much as that amount. The protagonist points his hand towards Guho, after which he twitched in fear. The tank became alarmed and closed his eyes and then thought that he deserved this. The protagonist puts his hand on his shoulder and calls him well done. He tells him what he heard, he worked hard and showed himself to be a good leader. He adds that he did a great job. Gu Ho, with a surprised expression on his face, asks the main character if he is not going to beat him. The main character clenches his hand into a fist and asks his subordinate if he really wants this. Gu Ho replies that it's not like he wanted it. Dayin tells him that he knows that he had a hard time without it and then asks why he should beat him. He then tells him that they are having a welcome party, so he needs to go change. Guho replies with a happy expression that this is good. The main character comes behind him with lightning speed. He hit his subordinate on the back with his palm. Guho stands on all fours and tells the protagonist that he just said that he would not beat him. The protagonist with a smile on his face tells Guho that it wouldn't hurt to hit him so that he would be more careful later. He points his finger at him with a stern look and says what he thinks. This time he will get away with additional training and from now on he must always be on guard. Gu Ho, with a joyful expression on his face, replies that he understood everything, and the protagonist tells him that since he understood everything, he needs to get ready. Gu Ho remembers how the protagonist fought a monster with a huge shell, and thought that the leader taught him how to use his abilities correctly. He adds that back then he didn't know how to do anything at all, and the protagonist even taught him to fight. He remembers the protagonist's training, where he stood behind him and stuck two fingers forward. He thought that the main character was always kind to him, even when he caused him a lot of problems. Guho's cheeks are red and he smiles. He thought that he knew that the leader would never abandon his team. That evening a party was held to welcome the returning members of Team 7. There is a luxurious golden chandelier on the ceiling. Inam exclaims that the leader has finally appeared. The protagonist is wearing a gray jacket and trousers. With a smile on his face, he replies that he hasn't seen them for a long time, and then asks them how they got on without him. Inam, with a smile on his face, asks the main character if it is true that he was on the Guy continent. Sola asks the main character how it is, and then begs him to tell him. The main character replies that so many things have happened that he couldn't tell them everything in a day. Lily tells Abraxas to try something, after which the protagonist shifts his gaze in their direction. Abraxas eats his meal with chopsticks in his hands and tells Lily that the food they have here is kind of wonderful. Lily, with crumbs of food on her cheek, points at one of the dishes and says that it's just something, and then shows another dish that she thinks is delicious. The main character, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, wonders if they do the same amount of lounging and eating on Guy. Behind him stands Gu Ho with a suitcase. The main character walks and at one point stops. He crosses his arms and apologizes. To everyone present for being so late, he asks if his vacation was too long, and then says that as they probably heard, he was in another dimension. He moves his hand to the side 
and with a smile on his face, says that he knows that everyone here has had a hard time without him. He adds that other teams looked down on them and treated them like a support group. Yoon Hvai, dressed in a pink dress, straightens her hair and replies that yes, it was really very difficult for them. Ayel Nam closes his eyes and says that he was so infuriated by this situation. Inam made an angry expression on his face and exclaimed that the guys from the sixth team turned out to be such scoundrels. Sola closes one eye and says with a smile on her face that to be honest, she was even happy when Guho beat them. The protagonist turned his gaze towards the blue-haired family and said that now he is here again and this will not happen again. He adds that other teams will no longer dare to underestimate them. Guho opens a suitcase containing a lot of stones and jewelry, and the protagonist tells everyone present that he brought them gifts from the guy continent. He adds that they can take whatever they want. Ayel Nam put a black bracelet on his hand. This is a bracelet that improves concentration. He thought that this was the thing when the operation was urgent. Inam put on a pendant with a blue stone. This is a pendant that reduces fatigue. He thought that now he could edit the video longer. Sola smiles and holds a purple ball in his hands. This is a magic crystal ball that helps you connect with several people at once. She thought that it was now more convenient to be in touch with him. Joyful Yoon Hvai puts a black and gold ring on the ring finger of her left hand. This is a ring that allows you to use protective magic twice a day. She asks the protagonist if she hasn't been out of his head all this time. The protagonist says that Yoon Hvai should choose another gift. Yoon Hvai turns away and replies that no, you can't take away what you've already given. The angry protagonist asks her to put the ring on her other finger now. The protagonist's subordinates thank him and then say that now they will try even harder because only they are given magical artifacts. Dain looks towards Sol, Ah, and Enam. He smiles and tells everyone to eat, drink, and be merry in good health. The waves of the staff twist sinuously and go around the disco ball. The protagonist exclaims that tomorrow the whole team has a day off. Young Shin, who is on the dance floor, covers his ears and asks Lily if this is a greeting in a guy language. Lily smiles and replies that this is true, and then greets the boy in her own language. The blonde covers her mouth and asks Young Shin how to say in his language that you like a person. Chan Sung appears, who tells the protagonist that he was late at work, and it seems that the fun is in full swing. The main character turns his head to him and says that finally the head of the guild himself has come. He asks why he doesn't have a drink with him, because when else will he have the opportunity to try drink from another dimension? Chan Sung says that's great. Dayin asks the guild leader if he was delayed because of the sixth team and what he decided about them. The protagonist pours a drink into a glass. Chan Sung replies that he has decided to take them back. The main character replies that this is nice, because this way there will not be a shortage of people. The glass is filled with red drink. Chan Sung replies that this is not what he is afraid of now. Chan Sung remembers how bright, golden energy emanated from him while the members of the 6th Division bowed to him. He tells the protagonist that at first he was really upset when he found out that the entire 6th team was leaving the guild, and then, when he was told that they wanted to return, he began to fear that this could happen again. The protagonist responds to the head of the guild that he may not be afraid, because they will not betray them again. He thought about how he told them that he would reduce the amount of debt if they returned to the guild. The protagonist, with a stern expression on his face, asks the head of the guild if he understands that the other guilds will be watching their every move. Chan Sung asks the main character how he can understand this because they acted openly. Chan Sung, who has one eye covered by a shadow, thanks the protagonist for sorting everything out. He adds that next time they won't fool him so easily. The protagonist, with a wary look, thought that similar situations could happen again. Although it will be very difficult to harm him, extra caution will not hurt. He remembers how Lily in white clothes lay among the roots of a tree and thought that it was unknown what else awaited them in the new version of the future. He adds that because Lily did not become a disaster, a new misfortune may appear that he does not know about. He holds a glass in his hands and thought that in order to prepare for any outcome, he needs to strengthen the entire guild, especially their team. The protagonist tells the head that he wants to ask him something. Chan Sung replies that of course he can ask for anything. The protagonist with a smile on his face says that he wants a promotion. Chan Sung stands with his mouth open in surprise. Then he asks the protagonist in a stern voice if he really wants a promotion. Bright light leaks through the window. The main character says that if he puts it here, it will glow and the inscription will not be visible. He asks Yun Vai if he should put it more to the right. Yun Vai, with an alarmed expression on his face, asks Day in what he is doing. The protagonist holds a sign in his hands with the name of the protagonist and his position, Vice President. 
He says he thinks there's a better place to put a new nameplate. Univi points his finger at the sign of the leader of Team 7 and asks why he needs this because his sign is over there. She then asks the protagonist who he is trying to fool. The main character strokes the sign and says that he is not fooling anyone because they have already agreed on everything. Univi, with a misunderstanding on his face, asks the main character when he was appointed vice president. He adds that his father did not promote him. The protagonist remembers Chan Sung asking the protagonist if he really wants a promotion. With a surprised look, he tells the protagonist that he joined their guild less than six months ago. Dae In remembers how he and Helen and her subordinates rode in a carriage. Chan Sung tells the main character that he also chilled in another dimension for three months, and now he has returned and is asking for appointment to the position of vice president. He asks the main character what other leaders will think about this. The main character looks down and replies that this is logical. He asks the head if this really means that he just needs to do something so that other leaders will take him into account. Chan Sung, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, replies that this is not the case, but if he really distinguishes himself, then the other leaders will have no choice but to recognize him. The protagonist smiles and says that then they will talk about promotion another time. The head of the guild turns his gaze to his daughter and tells the protagonist that he knows that he does not do anything for nothing, but still needs to think about it for now. Univai wonders if being a leader isn't enough for the main character. Dayin thought that if he became vice president, he would have more influence so that the entire guild would become stronger he needed to be at the helm. There is a sign on the table that says it belongs to Vice President Dayin. He thought that there was still a lot of time before the second catastrophe, and the association of awakened ones didn't seem to be up to anything suspicious. The protagonist says that while a promotion is not particularly promising, the main thing is that there is support from the outside. Sunlight falls on high-rise buildings. An announcement is heard in the city that a new gate has opened, so residents of areas 2, 3, and 4 should evacuate to the nearest shelters as soon as possible. A blue portal appears in the middle of the road. The protagonist and members of his team stand next to him. A huge cyclops came out of the portal with a wooden club on his shoulder. The protagonist, whose eyes are covered by the shadow of his hair, says that this is a one-eyed giant, the most persistent of all reptiles like him. He adds that you need to aim at his joints, because they are the easiest for him to hit. The main character asks Gu Ho and Min Jae if they understood everything. Gu Ho and Min Jae, armed with an axe, agree with the protagonist's order. Gu Ho dashes towards the enemy. The Cyclops swings his club at Gu Ho, who is enveloped in golden energy. He hits it. Gu Ho withstood the blow thanks to his petrified hands. Min Jae ran to the back of the monster's foot. He hit the monster's foot with an axe. Cyclops looks at the guy who hit him. He raised his leg and is going to crush the offender. Min Jae closes his eyes and thought that he was finished. The monster slams its foot, and the protagonist manages to save a member of his team. The main character shouts to Min Jae to wake up, and then tells him that if the attack fails, then he needs to retreat and attack again. Min Jae accepts the protagonist's order with a worried expression on her face, and then apologizes to him. Cyclops looks at the protagonist. The streams of golden energy emanating from Gu Ho intensify. He tells the monster that he forgot about him. The main character tells Min Jae to attack again, and he takes a fighting stance and replies that he understands. Lily, standing behind the protagonist, asks him what she should do. The main character closes his eyes and replies that today he is studying Min Jae, and she just needs to watch. The girl with an alarmed expression on her face says that he is no good, and then asks what will happen if he is seriously wounded. The protagonist, with a serious expression on his face, replies that this is why he must fight even more. Min Jae, lying in a hospital bed, smiles and notices that the protagonist has returned. White House Guild Hospital. The main character, standing next to him, asks him how he is here and whether he was busy while he was away. Min Jae replies that even in the protagonist's absence, he meditated every day as he taught. He put four fingers to his temple and says that about a month ago, he became awakened although he did not acquire any abilities. He became only a little stronger than an ordinary person. He adds that he thinks this is a punishment for past sins. The protagonist looked warily and thought that Yun Hvai was telling him something like that. He looks at Min Jae and thought that even though he meditated every day and ate food with a huge amount of mana, it was strange that he woke up without any abilities. He thought it was good that he personally came to check on him. The main character with a stern look asks his subordinate what he wants to do in the future. He thought that the most important thing now is that he has a will. Min Jae clenches his hands in a fist and tells the protagonist that the funny thing 
is that when he first brought him here, he thought that three years of his personal hell were beginning. He reports that passersby then began to thank him and he was very proud of his work and was happy to talk about it. He remembers how the girl with a joyful face held an envelope in her hand and thanked him for telling him where the shelter was. A joyful Min Jay says that's why he doesn't intend to give up. The protagonist smiles and says that this is great. Then from tomorrow, he should start working hard. He adds that he will show him what he is capable of. Loud sounds of impacts can be heard on the city streets. Min Jay falls to the ground. The protagonist exclaims her name. He gets up and with a confident expression on his face replies that everything is fine. He was not hurt. The Cyclops tried to crush the guy with his foot, but he dodges the attack. Min Jay jumped away from another Cyclops kick attack. He makes an attack with an axe and thought that if he could not fight with his right hand, he would do it with his left. He adds that now it is much more important to wound this monster. Lily sits in the trunk of a car and the protagonist stands nearby. The main character with a stern look wonders if Min Jay is not right-handed and then thinks that it looks like he has learned to control his body, which makes him happy. He adds that although he still has a lot to learn in order to fight properly with them, Abraxas comes here and asks the main character if he really has such a hobby. The protagonist sighs and tells her that this is just a regular training session and then asks her if she said that she is not interested in hunting monsters and why she came in the first place. The blonde moves her hand to the side and with a smile on her face says that she was bored, so she decided to take a walk. She tells the protagonist that the guy has an interesting ability and then asks him if he knows about it. The Cyclops is almost completely covered in stone, with only his hand and head protruding from it. Min Jay jumped away from the monster's fist. The protagonist tells the blonde that of course he knows. He says that most people with this ability don't even know about it. He sees purple energy in Min Jay and thought that people like him are very rare. He smiles and thought that his ability can be used in different ways. It all depends on how exactly it manifests itself. The fact that Min Jay is not much different from an ordinary person is one of the manifestations of this strength. The blonde asks the main character why he pretends not to know. There is bewilderment on Lily's face. The main character, with a dissatisfied expression on his face, replies that there is no point in telling him now. Abraxas, with a joyful expression on his face, tells the protagonist that if he needs help, he can just ask, it will be fun. The main character asks her if she is joking. The blonde closes her eyes and tells the protagonist that she is unlikely to help him, even if he asks. The main character sighs and asks then why it was necessary to start a conversation. Lily, with an indignant expression on her face, asks the two of them what they are talking about and then says that she also wants to know. The protagonist tells her that she wouldn't understand even if he told her everything. Red energy is visible in the sky behind the buildings. The red energy quickly moves and ends up near the main character, who is surprised. There is a huge amount of energy swirling around. The dispatcher informs the main character that an anomaly has been spotted in the sky. The dispatcher tells the main character that they don't know what it is yet, so it would be better to watch from the sidelines. He calls the manager, waiting for an answer. The main character got worried and thought that this couldn't be happening. Dane takes out his sword and thinks that the red clouds are one of the signs of the second disaster. He adds that as far as he remembers, it will come only in about six months. The Cyclops frees himself from the stone that bound him. The main character says that today's training is over. Guho opens his eyes wide. The protagonist approaches Min Jae and tells him to come back so he can be patched up. Min Jae accepts the main character's order. Dae-in commands Gu Ho and Lily to take their places. The protagonist stands between his subordinates and says that now it's time to get to work and commands them to get ready.